The Wonderful Adventures of Nils by Selma Lagerlof Narrated by Robin Nixon Chapter 1 The Boy Part 1 The Elf Sunday, March 20th Once there was a boy. He was, let us say, something like 14 years old. Long and loose-jointed and tow-headed. He wasn't good for much, that boy. His chief delight was to eat and sleep, and after that he liked best to make mischief. It was a Sunday morning, and the boy's parents were getting ready to go to church. The boy sat on the edge of the table in his shirt sleeves and thought how lucky it was that both father and mother were going away and the coast would be clear for a couple of hours. Good. Now I can take down Pop's gun and fire off a shot without anybody's meddling interference, he said to himself. But it was almost as if Father should have guessed the boy's thoughts, for just as he was on the threshold, ready to start, he stopped short and turned toward the boy. Since you won't come to church with Mother and me, he said, the least you can do is to read the service at home. Will you promise to do so? Yes, said the boy, uh, that I can do easy enough. And he thought, of course, that he wouldn't read any more than he felt like reading. The boy thought that never had he seen his mother so persistent. In a second she was over by the shelf near the fireplace and took down Luther's commentary and laid it on the table in front of the window, opened at the service for the day. She also opened the New Testament and placed it beside the commentary. Finally, she drew up the big armchair which was bought at the parish auction the year before, and which, as a rule, no one but father was permitted to occupy. The boy sat, thinking that his mother was giving herself altogether too much trouble with this spread, for he had no intention of reading more than a page or so. But now, for the second time, it was almost as if his father were able to see right through him. He walked up to the boy and said in a severe tone, Now, remember that you are ready to read carefully, for when we come back I shall question you thoroughly, and if you have skipped a single page, it will not go well with you. The service is fourteen and a half pages long, said his mother, just as if she wanted to heap up the measure of his misfortune. You'll have to sit down and begin the reading at once if you expect to get through with it. With that, they departed, and as the boy stood in the doorway watching them, he thought that he had been caught in a trap. There they go, congratulating themselves, I suppose, in the belief they've hit upon something so good that I'll be forced to sit and hang over the sermon the whole time that they're away, thought he. But his father and mother were certainly not congratulating themselves upon anything of the sort, but on the contrary, they were very much distressed. They were poor farmers, and their place was not much bigger than a garden plot. When they first moved there, the place couldn't feed more than one pig and a pair of chickens, but they were uncommonly industrious and capable folk, and now they had both cows and geese. Things had turned out very well for them, and they would have gone to church that beautiful morning, satisfied and happy, if they hadn't had their son to think of. A father complained that he was dull and lazy. He had not cared to learn anything at school, and he was such an all-round good-for-nothing that he could barely be made to tend geese. Mother did not deny that this was true, but she was most distressed because he was wild and bad, cruel to animals, and ill-willed toward human beings. "'May God soften his hard heart and give him a better disposition,' said the mother, or else he will be a misfortune both to himself and to us. The boy stood for a long time and pondered whether he should read the service or not. Finally, he came to the conclusion that this time it was best to be obedient. He seated himself in the easy chair and began to read. But when he'd been rattling away in an undertone for a little while, this mumbling seemed to have a soothing effect upon him, and he began to nod. It was the most beautiful weather outside. It was only the 20th of March, but the boy lived in west of Vemminghog Township, down in southern Skane, where the spring was already in full swing. It was not as yet green, but it was fresh and budding. There was water in all the trenches, and the colt's foot on the edge of the ditch was in bloom. All the weeds that grew in among the stones were brown and shiny. 
The beech woods in the distance seemed to swell and grow thicker with every second. The skies were high and a clear blue. The cottage door stood ajar and the lark's trill could be heard in the room. The hens and geese pattered about in the yard and the cows who felt the spring air away in their stalls lowed their approval every now and then. The boy read and nodded and fought against drowsiness. No, I don't want to fall asleep, thought he, for then I'll not get through with this thing the whole forenoon. But somehow he fell asleep. He did not know whether he had slept a short while or a long while, but he was awakened by hearing a slight noise back of him. On the window sill facing the boy stood a small looking glass, and almost the entire cottage could be seen in this. As the boy raised his head, he happened to look in the glass, and then he saw that the cover to his mother's chest had been opened. His mother owned a great heavy iron-bound oak chest, which she permitted no one but herself to open. Here she treasured all the things she'd inherited from her mother, and of these she was especially careful. Here lay a couple of old-time peasant dresses of red homespun cloth, with short bodice and plated shirt, and a pearl-bedecked breastpin. There were starched white linen headdresses and heavy silver ornaments and chains. Folks don't care to go about dressed like that in these days, and several times his mother had thought of getting rid of the old things. But somehow she hadn't had the heart to do it. And now the boy saw distinctly in the glass that the chest lid was open. He could not understand how this had happened, for his mother had closed the chest before she went away. She never would have left that precious chest open when he was at home alone. He became low-spirited and apprehensive. He was afraid that a thief had sneaked his way into the cottage. He didn't dare to move, but sat still and stared into the looking-glass. While he sat there and waited for the thief to make his appearance, he began to wonder what that dark shadow was which fell across the edge of the chest. He looked and looked and did not want to believe his eyes, but the thing which at first seemed shadowy became more and more clear to him, and soon he saw that it was something real. It was no less a thing than an elf who sat there astride the edge of the chest. And to be sure, the boy had heard stories about elves, but he had never dreamed that they were such tiny creatures. He was no taller than a hand's breadth, this one, who sat on the edge of the chest. He had an old, wrinkled and beardless face, and was dressed in a black frock coat, knee breeches, and a broad-brimmed black hat. He was very trim and smart, with his white laces about the throat and wristbands, his buckled shoes and the bows on his garters. He had taken from the chest an embroidered piece and sat and looked at the old-fashioned handiwork with such an air of veneration that he did not observe that the boy had awakened. The boy was somewhat surprised to see the elf, but on the other hand, he was not particularly frightened. It was impossible to be afraid of one who was so little, and since the elf was so absorbed in his own thoughts that he neither saw nor heard, the boy thought it would be great fun to play a trick on him, to push him over into the chest and shut the lid on him, or something of that kind. But the boy was not so courageous that he dared to touch the elf with his hands. Instead, he looked round the room for something to poke him with. He let his gaze wander from the sofa to the leaf table, from the leaf table to the fireplace. He looked to the kettles, then the coffee urn, which stood on a shelf near the fireplace on the water bucket near the door, and on the spoons and knives and forks and saucers and plates, which could be seen through the half-open cupboard door. He looked at his father's gun, which hung on the wall beside the portrait of the Danish royal family, and on the geraniums and fusias which blossomed in the window. And last he caught sight of an old butterfly snare that hung on the window frame. He had hardly set eyes on that butterfly snare, before he reached over and snatched it, and jumped up and swung it alongside the edge of the chest. He was himself astonished at the luck he had. He hardly knew how he'd managed it, but he had actually snared the elf. The poor little chap lay head downward in the bottom of the long snare, and could not free himself. At the first moment the boy hadn't the least idea what he should do with the prize. He was only particular 
to swing the snare backward and forward to prevent the elf from getting a foothold and clambering up. The elf began to speak and begged, oh, so pitifully for his freedom. He had brought them good luck these many years, he said, and deserved better treatment. Now, if the boy would set him free, he would give him an old coin, a silver spoon and a gold penny, as big as the case on his father's silver watch. The boy didn't think that this was much of an offer, but it so happened that after he had got the elf in his power, he was afraid of him. He felt that he had entered into an agreement with something weird and uncanny, something which did not belong to his world, and he was only too glad to get rid of the horrid thing. For this reason, he agreed at once to the bargain, and held the snare still so the elf could crawl out of it. But when the elf was almost out of the snare, the boy happened to think that he ought to have bargained for large estates and all sorts of things. He should at least have made this stipulation that the elf must conjure the sermon into his head. What a fool I was to let him go, thought he, and began to shake the snare violently so the elf would tumble down again. But the instant the boy did this, he received such a stinging box on the ear that he thought his head would fly in pieces. He was dashed first against one wall, then against the other. He sank to the floor and lay there senseless. When he awoke, he was alone in the cottage. The chest lid was down, and the butterfly snare hung in its usual place by the window. If he had not felt how the right cheek burned from that box on the ear, he would have been tempted to believe the whole thing had been a dream. At any rate, father and mother will be sure to insist that it was nothing else, thought he. They're not likely to make any allowances for that old sermon on account of the elf. It's best for me to get at that reading again, thought he. But as he walked towards the table, he noticed something remarkable. It couldn't be possible that the cottage had grown, but why was he obliged to take so many more steps than usual to get to the table, and what was the matter with the chair? It looked no bigger than it did a while ago, but now he had to step on the rung first and then clamber up in order to reach the seat. It was the same thing with the table. He could not look over the top without climbing to the arm of the chair. "'What in the world is this?' said the boy. "'I believe the elf has bewitched both the armchair and the table and the whole cottage.' The commentary lay on the table, and to all appearances it was not changed. But there must have been something queer about that, too, for he could not manage to read a single word of it without actually standing right in the book itself. He read a couple of lines, and then he chanced to look up. With that his glance fell on the looking-glass, and then he cried aloud, "'Look, there's another one!' For in the glass he saw plainly a little little creature who was dressed in a hood and leather breeches. "'Why is one dressed exactly like me?' said the boy, and clasped his hands in astonishment. But then he saw the thing in the mirror did the same thing. Then he began to pull his hair and pinch his arms and swing round, and instantly he did the same thing after him, he who was in the mirror. The boy ran around the glass several times to see if there wasn't a little man hidden behind it, but he found no one there. And then he began to shake with terror, for now he understood that the elf had bewitched him, and that the creature whose image he saw in the glass was he himself. Part 2. The Wild Geese The boy simply could not make himself believe that he had been transformed into an elf. It can't be anything but a dream, a queer fancy thought he. If I wait a few moments, I'll surely be turned back into a human being again. He placed himself before the glass and closed his eyes. He opened them again, and after a couple of minutes, and then expected to find that it had all passed over. But it hadn't. He was, and remained, just as little. In other respects, he was the same as before— the thin, straw-coloured hair, the freckles across his nose, the patches on his leather breeches, and the darns on his stockings were all like themselves, with this exception, that they had become diminished. No, it would do no good for him to stand still and wait. Of this he was certain he must try something else, and he thought the wisest thing that he could do was to try and find the elf and make his peace with him. And while he sought, 
He cried and prayed and promised everything he could think of. Never more would he break his word to anyone. Never again would he be naughty and never, never would he fall asleep again over the sermon. If he might only be a human being once more, he would be such a good and helpful and obedient boy. But no matter how much he promised, it did not help him the least little bit. Suddenly he remembered that he had heard his mother say all the tiny folk made their home in the cowsheds, and at once he concluded to go there and see if he couldn't find the elf. It was a lucky thing that the cottage door stood partly open, for he never could have reached the bolt and opened it, but now he slipped through without any difficulty. When he came out in the hallway, he looked around for his wooden shoes, for in the house, to be sure, he had gone about in his stocking feet. He wondered how he should manage with these big, clumsy wooden shoes, but just then he saw a pair of tiny shoes on the doorstep. When he observed that the elf had been so thoughtful that he had also bewitched the wooden shoes, he was even more troubled. It was evidently his intention that this affliction should last a long time. On the wooden boardwalk in front of the cottage hopped a grey sparrow. He had hardly set eyes on the boy before he called out, Titi, Titi, look at Nils, Goosey Boy, look at Thumbytot, look at Nils, Holgerson, Thumbytot. Chickens turned and stared at the boy, and then they set up a fearful cackling. cock crooed the roster. Good enough for him, cock he has pulled my comb. cock serves him right, cried the hens, and with that they kept up a continuous cackle. The geese got together in a tight group, stuck their heads together and asked, Who could have done this? Who can have done this? But the strangest thing of all was that the boy understood what they said. He was so astonished that he stood there as if rooted to the doorstep and listened. It must be because I, I am changed into an elf, said he. This is probably why I understand bird talk. He thought it was unbearable that the hens would not stop saying that it served him right. He threw a stone at them and shouted, Shut up, you pack! But it hadn't occurred to him before that he was no longer the sort of boy the hens need fear. The whole henyard made a rush for him and formed a ring around him. Then they all cried at once, Kaka kada served you right! Kaka kada served you right! The boy tried to get away, but... The chickens ran after him and screamed, until he thought he'd lose his hearing. It is more than likely that he never could have got away from them if the house cat hadn't come along just then. As soon as the chickens saw the cat, they quieted down and pretended to be thinking of nothing else than just to scratch the earth for worms. Immediately the boy ran up to the cat. "'You dear pussy!' said he. "'You must know all the corners and hiding places about here.' You be a good little kitty and tell me where I can find the elf. The cat uh, did not reply at once. He seated himself, curled his tail into a graceful ring around his paws, and stared at the boy. It was a large black cat with one white spot on his chest. His fur lay sleek and soft and shone in the sunlight. The claws were drawn in and the eyes were a dull grey with just a little narrow dark streak down the centre. The cat looked thoroughly good-natured and inoffensive. "'I know well enough where the elf lives,' he said in a soft voice. "'But that doesn't say that I'm going to tell you about it.' "'Dear pussy, you must tell me where the elf lives,' said the boy. "'Can't you see how he's bewitched me?' The cat opened his eyes a little, so that the green wickedness began to shine forth. He spun round and purred with satisfaction before he replied. "'Shall I, perhaps, help you, because you have so often grabbed me by the tail?' he said at the last. Then the boy was furious and forgot entirely how little and helpless he was now. "'Oh, I could pull your tail again, I, I can,' said he, and ran towards the cat. The next instant the cat was so changed that the boy could scarcely believe it was the same animal. Every separate hair on his body stood on end. The back was bent. The legs had become elongated. The claws scraped the ground. The tail had grown thick and short. The ears were laid back. 
The mouth was frothy and the eyes were wide open and glistened like sparks of red fire. The boy didn't want to let himself be scared by a cat and he took a step forward. Then the cat made one spring and landed right on the boy, knocked him down and stood over him, his forepaws on his chest and his jaws wide apart over his throat. The boy felt how the sharp claws sank through his vest and shirt and into his skin and how the sharp eye teeth tickled his throat. He shrieked for help as loudly as he could, but no one came. He thought, surely, that his last hour had come, and then he felt that the cat drew in his claws and let go the hold on his throat. There, he said, that will do now. I'll let you go this time for my mistress's sake. I only wanted you to know which one of us two has the power now. With that, the cat walked away, looking as smooth and pious as he did when he first appeared on the scene. The boy was so crestfallen that he didn't say a word, but only hurried to the cowhouse to look for the elf. There were not more than three cows, all told, but when the boy came in there was such a bellowing and such a kick-up that one might easily have believed that there were at least thirty. Moo, 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 bellowed Mayrose. It is well there is such a thing as justice in this mm, world. Moo, 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 sang the three of them in unison. He couldn't hear what they said, for each one tried to outbellow the others. The boy wanted to ask after the elf, but he couldn't make himself heard, because the cows were in full uproar. They carried on, as they used to do when he let a strange dog in on them. They kicked their hind legs, shook their necks, stretched their heads, and measured the distance with their horns. "'Come here, you,' said Mayrose, "'and you'll get a kick that you won't forget in a hurry.' "'Come here,' said Gold Lily, "'and you shall dance on my horns. "'Come here, and you shall taste how it felt "'when you threw your wooden shoes at me "'as you did last summer,' bawled Star. "'Come here, and you shall be repaid "'for that wasp you let loose in my ear,' "'growled Gold Lily. "'May Rose was the oldest and wisest of them, and she was the very maddest. Come here, said she, that I may pay you back for the many times that you have jerked the milk pail away from your mother, and for all the snares you laid for her when she came carrying the milk pails, and for all the tears when she has stood here and wept over you. <laughs> the boy wanted to tell them how he regretted that he had been unkind to them and that never, never, from now on, should he be anything but good if, if they would only tell him where the elf was. But the cows didn't listen to him. They made such a racket that he began to fear one of them would succeed in breaking loose, and he thought the best thing for him to do was to go quietly away from the cowhouse. When he came out, he was thoroughly disheartened. He could understand that no one on the place wanted to help him find the elf, and little good would it do him, probably, if the elf was found. He crawled up on the broad hedge which fenced in the farm, and which was overgrown with briars and lichen. There he sat down to think about how it would go with him if he never became a human being again. When father and mother came home from church, uh, there would be a surprise for them, yes, a surprise. It would be all over the land, and people would come flocking from East Veminghog, and from Torp, and from Skerup, and the whole Veminghog township would come and stare at him. Perhaps father and mother would take him with them and show him at the marketplace in Givik. No, that was too horrible to think about. He would rather that no human being should ever see him again. His unhappiness was simply frightful. No one in all the world was so unhappy as he. He was no longer a human being, but a freak. Little by little, he began to comprehend what it meant to be no longer human. He was separated from everything now. He could no longer play with other boys. He could not take charge of the farm after his parents were gone. And certainly no girl would think of marrying him. He sat and looked at his home. 
It was a little log house, which lay as if it had been crushed down to earth under the high, sloping roof. The outhouses were also small, and the patches of ground were so narrow that a horse could barely turn around on them. But, little and poor though the place was, it was much too good for him now. He couldn't ask for any better place than a hole under the stable floor. It was wondrously beautiful weather. It budded, and it rippled, and it murmured, and it twittered all around him. But he sat there with such a heavy sorrow. He should never be happy any more about anything. Never had he seen the skies as blue as they were today. Birds of passage came on their travels. They came from foreign lands, and had travelled over the East Sea by way of Smiggerhook, and were now on their way north. They were of many different kinds, but he was only familiar with the wild geese who came flying in two long rows which met at an angle. Several flocks of wild geese had already flown by. They flew very high. Still he could hear how they shrieked, To the hills! Now we're off to the hills! Then the wild geese saw the tame geese who walked about the farm. They sank near the earth and called, Come along! Come along! We're off to the hills! The tame geese could not resist the temptation to raise their heads and listen, but they answered very sensibly, We're pretty well off where we are, we're pretty well off where we are. It was, as we have said, an uncommonly fine day, with an atmosphere that it must have been a real delight to fly in, so light and bracing. And with each new wild geese flock that flew by, the tame geese became more and more unruly. A couple of times they flapped their wings as if they had half a mind to fly along, but then an old mother goose would always say to them, Now don't be silly, these creatures will have to suffer both hunger and cold. There was a young gander whom the wild geese had fired with a passion for adventure. If another flock comes this way, I'll follow them, said he. Then there came a new flock who shrieked like the others, and the young gander answered, "'Wait a minute! Wait a minute! I'm coming!' He spread his wings and raised himself into the air, but he was so unaccustomed to flying that he fell to the ground again. At any rate, the wild geese must have heard his call, for they turned and flew back slowly to see if he was coming. "'Wait, wait!' he cried, and made another attempt to fly. All this the boy heard, and where he lay on the hedge— it would be a great pity, thought he, if the big goosey gander should go away. It would be a big loss to father and mother if he was gone when they came home from church. And when he thought of this, once again, he entirely forgot that he was little and helpless. He took one leap right down into the goose flock and threw his arms around the neck of the goosey gander. Oh, no, you don't fly away this time, sir, cried he. But just about then, the gander was considering how he should go to work to raise himself from the ground. He couldn't stop to shake the boy off, hence he had to go along with him, up in the air. They bore on towards the heights so rapidly that the boy fairly gasped. Before he had time to think that he ought to let go his hold around the gander's neck, he was so high up that he would have been killed instantly if he had fallen to the ground. The only thing that he could do to make himself a little more comfortable was to try and get upon the gander's back and... There he wriggled himself forthwith, but not without considerable trouble, and it was not an easy matter either to hold himself secure on the slippery back between two swaying wings. He had to dig deep into the feathers and down with both hands to keep from tumbling to the ground. Part 3. The Big Checked Cloth The boy had grown so giddy that it was a long while before he came to himself the winds howled and beat against him, and the rustle of feathers and swaying of wings sounded like a whole storm. Thirteen geese flew around him, flapping their wings and honking. They danced before his eyes, and they buzzed in his ears. He didn't know whether they flew high or low, or in what direction they were travelling. After a bit, he regained just enough sense to understand that he ought to find out where the geese were taking him but this was not easy, for he didn't know how he should ever muster up courage enough to look down. He was sure he'd faint if he attempted it. The wild geese were not flying very high, because the new travelling companion could not breathe in the very thinnest of air. For his sake, they also flew a little slower than usual. 
At last, the boy just made himself cast one glance down to the earth. Then he thought that a great big rug lay spread beneath him, which was made up of an incredible number of large and small checks. Where in the world am I now? he wondered. He saw nothing but check upon check. Some were broad and ran crosswise, and some were long and narrow. All over there were angles and corners. Nothing was round, and nothing was crooked. What kind of a big checked cloth is that that I'm looking down on? said the boy to himself without expecting anyone to answer him. But instantly the wild geese who flew about him called out, Fields and meadows! Fields and meadows! Then he understood that the big checked cloth he was travelling over was the flat land of southern Sweden, and he began to comprehend why it looked so checked and multicoloured. The bright green checks he recognised first. They were rye fields uh, that had been sown in the fall and had kept themselves green under the winter snows. The yellowish-grey checks were stubble fields, the remains of the oak crop which had grown there the summer before. And the brownish ones were old clover meadows, and the black ones deserted grazing lands or ploughed-up fallow pastures. The brown checks with the yellow edges were undoubtedly beech tree forests, for in these you'll find the big trees which grow in the heart of the forest, naked in winter, while the little beech trees which grow along the borders keep their dry yellowed leaves way into the spring. There were also dark checks with grey centres. These were the large built-up estates encircled by the small cottages with their blackening straw roofs and their stone-divided land plots. And then there were checks, green in the middle, with brown borders. These were the orchards, where the grass carpets were already turning green, although the trees and bushes around them were still in their nude brown. bark. The boy could not keep from laughing when he saw how checked everything looked, but when the wild geese heard him laugh, they called out, kind of reprovingly, Fertile and good land! Fertile and good land! The boy had already become serious. To think that you can laugh, you who have met with the most terrible misfortune that could possibly happen to a human being, thought he. And for a moment he was pretty serious. But it wasn't long before he was laughing again. Now that he'd grown somewhat accustomed to the ride and the speed, so that he could think of something besides holding himself on the gander's back, he began to notice how full the air was of birds flying northward, and there was a shouting and a calling from flock to flock. "'So you came over today?' shrieked some. "'Yes,' answered the geese. "'How do you think the spring's getting on?' "'Not a leaf on the trees, and ice-cold water in the lakes,' came back the answer. When the geese flew over a place where they saw any tame, half-naked fowl, they shouted, "'What's the name of this place? What's the name of this place?' Then the roosters cocked their heads and answered, "'Its names will guard this year, the same as last year.' And most of the cottages were probably named after their owners, which is the custom in Skane. But instead of saying this per Matsons or Olobossons, the roosters sit upon the kind of names which, to their way of thinking, were more appropriate. Those who lived on small farms and belonged to poor cottages cried, this place is called Grinscars, and those who belonged to the poorest hut dwellers screamed, The name of this place is Little to Eat, Little to Eat, Little to Eat. The big, well cared for farms got high sounding names from the roosters, such as Lucky Meadows, Egg Burger, and Moneyville. But the roosters on the great landed estates were too high and mighty to condescend to anything like jesting. One of them crowed and called out with such gusto that it sounded as if he wanted to be heard clear up to the sun. This is Herr Dybeck's estate, the same this year as last year, this year as last year. A little further on strutted one rooster who crowed, This is Swanholm, surely all the world knows that. The boy observed that the geese did not fly straight forward, but zigzagged hither and thither over the whole south country, just as though they were glad to be in Skane again, and wanted to pay their respects to every separate place. They came to one place where there were a number of big, clumsy-looking buildings with great tall chimneys, and all around these were a lot of smaller houses. "'This is George Burger, sugar refinery!' cried the roosters. The boy shuddered as he sat there on the goose's back. He ought to have recognised this place, for it was not very far from his home. Here he had worked the year before as a watchboy, but to be sure, 
Nothing was exactly like itself when one saw it like that from up above. And think, just think, oh, so the goose girl and little Mats, who were his comrades last year. Indeed, the boy would have been glad to know if they still were anywhere about here. Fancy what they would have said had they suspected he was flying over their heads. Soon, George Berger was lost to sight, and they travelled towards Fidala and Scabba Lake, and back again over Goringe Cloister and Hackerberger. The boy saw more of Skein in this one day than he had ever seen before in all the years that he had lived. Whenever the wild geese happened across any tame geese, they had the best fun. They flew forward very slowly and called down, We're off to the hills. Are you coming along? Are you coming along? But the tame geese answered, It's still winter in this country. You're out too soon. Fly back, fly back. The wild geese lowered themselves so they might be heard a little better and called, Come along, we'll teach you how to fly and swim. Then the tame geese got mad and wouldn't answer them with a single honk. The wild geese sank themselves still lower until they almost touched the ground. Then, quick as lightning, they raised themselves just as if they'd been terribly frightened. Oh, 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 they exclaimed. These things were not geese. They were only sheep. They were only sheep. The ones on the ground were beside themselves with rage and shrieked. May you be shot. The whole lot of you. The whole lot of you. When the boy heard all this teasing, he laughed. Then he remembered how badly things had gone with him, and he cried. But the next second he was laughing again. Never before had he ridden so fast, and to ride fast and recklessly, that he had always liked. And, of course, he had never dreamed that it could be as fresh and bracing as it was up in the air, or that there rose from the earth such a fine scent of resin and soil. Nor had he ever dreamed what it could be like to ride so high above the earth. It was just like flying away from sorrow and trouble and annoyances of every kind that could be thought of. Chapter 2 Acker from Keb Nakes Part 1 Evening the big, tame goosey gander that had followed them up in the air felt very proud of being permitted to travel back and forth over the south country with the wild geese and crack jokes with the tame birds. But in spite of his keen delight, he began to tire as the afternoon wore on. He tried to take deeper breaths and quicker wing strokes, but even so, he remained several goose lengths behind the others. When the wild geese who flew last noticed that the tame one couldn't keep up with them, they began to call to the goose who rode in the centre of the angle and led the procession. Akko from Kebnekes! Akko from Kebnekes! What do you want of me? asked the leader. The white one will be left behind. The white one will be left behind. Tell him it's easier to fly fast than slow, called the leader and raced on as before. The goosey gander certainly tried to follow the advice and increase his speed, but then he became so exhausted that he sank away down to the drooping willows that bordered the fields and meadows. Aka, Aka, Aka from Kebnekes, cried those who flew last and saw what a hard time he was having. What do you want now? asked the leader, and she sounded awfully angry. The white one sinks to the earth, the white one sinks to the earth. "'Tell him it's easier to fly high than low,' shouted the leader, and she didn't slow up the least little bit, but raced on as before. The goosey gander tried also to follow this advice, but when he wanted to raise himself, he became so winded that he almost burst his breast. "'Aka! Aka!' again cried those who flew fast. "'Can't you let me fly in peace?' asked the leader, and she sounded even madder than before. "'The white one is ready to collapse!' Tell him that he, who has not the strength to fly with the flock, can go back home, cried the leader. She certainly had no idea of decreasing her speed, but raced on as before. Oh, is that the way the wind blows, thought the goosey gander. He understood at once that the wild geese had never intended to take him along up to Lapland. They had only lured him away from home in sport. He felt thoroughly exasperated to think that his strength should fail him now, so he wouldn't be able to show these tramps that even a tame goose was good for something. But the most provoking thing of all 
was that he had fallen in with Akka from Kebnekaise. Tame goose that he was, he had heard about a leader goose named Akka, who was more than a hundred years old. She had such a big name that the best wild geese in the world followed her. But no one looked for tame geese as Akka and her flock, and gladly would he have shown them that he was their equal. He flew slowly behind the rest, while he deliberated whether he should turn back or continue. Finally, the little creature that he carried on his back said, "'Dear Morton, Goosey Gander, you know well enough that it is simply impossible for you, who have never flown, to go with the wild geese all the way up to Lapland. Won't you turn back before you kill yourself?' But the farmer's lad was about the worst thing the goosey gander knew anything about, and as soon as it dawned on him that this puny creature actually believed that he couldn't make the trip, he decided to stick it out. "'If you say another word about this, I'll drop you into the first ditch we ride over,' said he, and at the same time his fury gave him so much strength that he began to fly almost as well as any of the others.' It isn't likely that he could have kept this pace up very long, neither was it necessary, for just then the sun sank quickly, and at sunset the geese flew down, and before the boy and the goosey gander knew what had happened, they stood on the shores of Vom Lake. They probably intend that we shall spend the night here, thought the boy, and jumped down from the goose's back. He stood on a narrow beach by a fair-sized lake, it was ugly to look upon, because it was almost entirely covered with an ice crust that was blackened and uneven, and full of cracks and holes, as spring ice generally is. The ice was already breaking up. It was loose and floating, and had a broad belt of dark, shiny water all around it. But there was still enough of it left to spread chill, and winter terror over the place. On the other side of the lake there appeared to be an open and light country, but where the geese had lighted there was a thick pine growth. It looked as if the forest of firs and pines had the power to bind the winter to itself. Everywhere else the ground was bare, but beneath the sharp pine branches lay snow that had been melting and freezing, melting and freezing, until it was hard as ice. The boy thought he had struck an arctic wilderness, and he was so miserable that he wanted to scream. He was hungry too. He hadn't eaten a bite the whole day. But where should he find any food? Nothing eatable grew on either ground or tree in the month of March. Yes, where was he to find food? And who would give him shelter? And who would fix his bed? And who would protect him from the wild beasts? For now, the sun was away and frost came from the lake, and darkness sank down from heaven, and terror stole forward on the twilight's trail, and in the forest it began to patter and rustle. Now, the good humour which the boy had felt when he was up in the air was gone, and in his misery he looked around for his travelling companions. He had no one but them to cling to now. Then he saw that the goosey gander was having even a worse time of it than he, he was lying prostrate on the spot where he delighted, and it looked as if he were ready to die. His neck lay flat against the ground, his eyes were closing, and his breathing sounded like a feeble hissing. "'Dear Morton Goosey Gander,' said the boy, "'try to get a swallow of water. It isn't two steps to the lake.' But the Goosey Gander didn't stir. The boy had certainly been cruel to all animals, and to the Goosey Gander in times gone by, but now— he felt that the goosey gander was the only comfort he had left, and he was dreadfully afraid of losing him. At once the boy began to push and drag him to get him into the water, but the goosey gander was big and heavy, and it was mighty hard work for the boy, but at last he succeeded. The goosey gander got in head first. For an instant he lay motionless in the slime, but soon he poked up his head, shook the water from his eyes, and sniffed. Then he swam proudly between reeds and seaweed. The wild geese were in the lake before him. They had not looked around for either the goosey gander or for his rider, but had made straight for the water. They had bathed and primped, and now they lay and gulped half-rotten pondweed and water clover. The white goosey gander had the good fortune to spy a perch. He grabbed it quickly, swam ashore with it, and laid it down 
in front of the boy. "'Here's a thank you for helping me into the water,' said he. It was the first time the boy had heard a friendly word that day. He was so happy that he wanted to throw his arms around the goosey gander's neck, but he refrained, and he was also thankful for the gift. At first he must have thought that it would be impossible to eat raw fish, and then he had a notion to try it. He felt to see if he still had his sheath knife with him, and sure enough there it hung on the back button of his trousers, although it was so diminished that it was hardly as long as a match. Well, at any rate, it served to scale and cleanse fish with, and it wasn't long before the perch was eaten. When the boy had satisfied his hunger, he felt a little ashamed because he had been able to eat a raw thing. It's evident that I'm not a human being any longer, but a real elf, thought he. While the boy ate, the goosey gander stood silently beside him, but when he had swallowed the last bite, he said in a low voice, it's a fact that we have run across a stuck-up goose folk who despise all tame birds. Yes, I've observed that, said the boy. What a triumph it would be for me if I could follow them clear up to Lapland and show them that even a tame goose can do things. Yes, said the boy, and drawled it out because he didn't believe the goosey gander could ever do it. Yet he didn't wish to contradict him. But I don't think I can get along all alone on such a journey, said the goosey gander. I'd like to ask if you couldn't come along and help me. The boy, of course, hadn't expected anything but to return to his home as soon as possible, and he was so surprised that he hardly knew what he should reply. I thought that we were enemies, you and I, said he, but this... The goosey gander seemed to have forgotten entirely. He only remembered that the boy had but just saved his life. "'I suppose I really ought to go home to father and mother,' said the boy. "'Oh, I'll get you back to them some time in the fall,' said the goosey gander. "'I shall not leave you until I put you down on your own doorstep.' The boy thought it might be just as well for him— if he escaped, showing himself before his parents for a while, he was not disinclined to favour the scheme, and was just on the point of saying that he agreed to it when they heard a loud rumbling behind them. It was the wild geese who had come up from their lake all at one time, and stood shaking the water from their backs. After they arranged themselves in a long row with the leader goose in the centre, and came toward them, as the white goosey gander sized up the wild geese, he felt uh, ill at ease. He had expected that they should be more like tame geese and that he should feel a closer kinship with them. They were much smaller than he, and none of them were white. They were all grey, with a sprinkling of brown. He was almost afraid of their eyes. They were yellow, and shone as if a fire had been kindled back of them. The goosey gander had always been taught that it was most fitting to move slowly and with a rolling motion. But these creatures did not walk, they half ran. He grew most alarmed, however, when he looked at their feet. They were large, and the soles were torn and ragged-looking. It was evident that the wild geese never questioned what they tramped upon. They took no bypaths. They were very neat and very well cared for in other respects, but one could see by their feet that they were poor wilderness folk. The goosey gander only had time to whisper to the boy, Speak up quickly for yourself, but don't tell them who you are, before the geese were upon them. When the wild geese had stopped in front of them, they cut it with their necks many times, and the goosey gander did likewise many more times. As soon as the ceremonies were over, the leader goose said, Now I presume we shall hear what kind of creatures you are. "'There isn't much to tell about me,' said the goosey gander. "'I was born in Scannell last spring. "'In the fall I was sold to Holger Nilsson of West Vemminghog, "'and there I have lived ever since.' "'You don't seem to have any pedigree to boast of,' said the leader goose. "'What is it, then, that makes you so high-minded "'that you wish to associate with wild geese? "'It may be because I want to show you, wild geese, "'that we tame ones may also be good for something.' said the goosey gander. 
"'Yes, it could be well, if you could show us that,' said the leader goose. "'We have already observed how much you know about flying, "'but you are more skilled, perhaps, in other sports. "'Possibly you are strong in a swimming match.' "'No, I can't boast that I am,' said the goosey gander. "'It seemed to him that the leader goose had already made up her mind to send him home, "'so he didn't care much how he answered.' "'I never swam any farther than across a mile ditch,' he continued. "'Then I presume you're a crack sprinter,' said the goose. "'I have never seen a tame goose run, nor have I ever done it myself,' said the goosey gander, and he made things appear much worse than they really were. The big white one was sure now that the leader goose would say that under no circumstances could they take him along. He was very much astonished when she said, "'You answer questions courageously, and he who has courage can become a good travelling companion, even if he is ignorant in the beginning. What do you say to store a couple of days until we can see what you are good for?' "'That suits me,' said the goosey gander, and he was thoroughly happy. And thereupon the leader goose pointed her bill and said, "'But who is that who you have with you?' "'I have never seen anything like him before.' "'That's my comrade,' said the goosey gander. "'He's been a goose tender all his life. "'He'll be useful all right to take with us on the trip.' "'Yes, he may be all right for a tame goose,' answered the wild one. "'What do you call him?' "'He has several names,' said the goosey gander, hesitantly, "'not knowing what he should hit upon in a hurry, "'for he didn't want to reveal the fact that the boy had a human name. "'Oh!' "'His name is Thumby Tot, he said at last. "'Does he belong to an elf family?' asked the leader goose. "'At what time do you wild geese usually retire?' said the goosey gander. "'Last question. My eyes close of their own accord about this time.' "'One could easily see that the goose who talked with the gander was very old. "'Her entire feather outfit was ice grey, without any dark streaks. "'The head was larger.' The legs coarser, and the feet were more worn than any of the others. The feathers were stiff, the shoulders knotty, the neck thin. All this was due to age. It was only upon the eyes that time had had no effect. They shone brighter, as if they were younger than any of the others. She turned very haughtily towards the goosey gander. "'Understand, Mr. Tame Goose, that I am Acker from Kebnekes.' and that the goose who flies nearest me to the right is Ixie from Vassijor, and the one to the left is Caxi from New Olja. Understand also that the second right-hand goose is Colmi from Sarajectico, and the second left is Nelja from Svapavara, and behind them fly Visi from Ovixfalen and Kusi from Stjangali, and know that these, as well as the six goslings who fly last, three to the right and three to the left, are all high mountain geese of the finest breed. You must not take us for landlubbers who strike up a chance acquaintance with any and every one, and you must not think that we permit any one to share our quarters. That will not tell us who his ancestors were. When Acker, the leader goose, talked in this way, the boy stepped briskly forward. It had distressed him that the goosey gander, who had spoken up so glibly for himself, should give such evasive answers when it concerned him. "'I don't care to make a secret of who I am,' said he. "'My name is Nils Holgersen. I'm a farmer's son, and until today I have been a human being. But this morning—' He got no further. As soon as he had said that he was a human, the leader goose staggered three steps backward, and the rest of them even farther back. They all extended their necks and hissed angrily at him. "'I have suspected this ever since I first saw you here on these shores,' said Ekka, "'and now you can clear out of here at once. "'We tolerate no human beings among us.' "'It is impossible,' said the goosey gander meditatively, "'that you wild geese can be afraid of anyone who is so tiny. "'By tomorrow, of course, he'll turn back home. "'You can surely let him stay with us overnight. "'None of us can afford to let such a poor little creature wander off by himself in the night among weasels and foxes. The wild goose came nearer, but it was evident that it was hard for her to master her fear. 
I have been taught to fear everything in human shape, be it big or little, said she, but if you will answer for this one and swear that he will not harm us, he can stay with us tonight. But I don't believe our night quarters are suitable either for him or you, for we intend to roost on the broken ice out here. She thought, of course, that the goosey gander would be doubtful when he heard this, but he never let on. She is pretty wise who knows how to choose such a safe bet, said he. You will be answerable for his return to his own tomorrow. Then I too will have to leave you, said the goosey gander. I have sworn that I would not forsake him. You are free to fly, whither you will, said the leader goose. Oh, with this, she raised her wings and flew out over the ice, and one after another the wild geese followed her. The boy was very sad to think that his trip to Lapland would not come off, and in the bargain he was afraid of the chilly night quarters. It will be worse and worse, said he. In the first place, we'll freeze to death on the ice. But the gander was in good humour. There's no danger, said he. Only make haste, I beg of you, and gather together as much grass and litter as you can well carry. When the boy had his arms full of dried grass, the goosey gander grabbed him by the shirt band, lifted him, and flew out on the ice where the wild geese were already fast asleep, with their bills tucked under their wings. Now spread out the grass on the ice so there'll be something to stand on to keep me from freezing fast. You help me and I'll help you said the goosey gander, and this the boy did, and when he had finished, the goosey gander picked him up once again by the shirt band and tucked him under his wing. I think you'll lie snug and warm there, said the goosey gander, as she covered him with his wing. The boy was so embedded in down that he couldn't answer, and he was nice and comfy. Oh, but he was tired, and in less than two winks he was fast asleep. Part 2. Night It is a fact that ice is always treacherous and not to be trusted. In the middle of the night, the loosened ice cake on Vom Lake moved about until one corner of it touched the shore. Now, it happened that Mr. Smur Fox, who lived at this time in Ovid Cloister Park on the east side of the lake, caught a glimpse of that one corner while he was out on his night chase. Smur had seen the wild geese early in the evening and hadn't dared to hope that he might get at one of them, but now he walked right out on the ice. When Smur was very near to the geese, his claws scraped the ice and the geese awoke, flapped their wings and prepared for flight. But Smur was too quick for them. He darted forward as though he'd been shot, grabbed a goose by the wing and ran toward land again. But this night... The wild geese were not alone on the ice, for they had a human being among them, a little as he was. The boy had awakened when the goosey gander spread his wings. He had tumbled down on the ice and was sitting there, dazed. He hadn't grasped the whys and wherefores of all this confusion until he caught sight of a little long-legged dog who ran over the ice with a goose in his mouth. In a minute, the boy was after that dog to try and take the goose away from him, he must have heard the goosey gander call to him, Have a care, Thumby Tot, have a care. But the boy thought that such a little runt of a dog was nothing to be afraid of, and he rushed ahead. The wild goose that Smurfox Fox tugged after him heard the clatter as the boy's wooden shoes beat against the ice, and she could hardly believe her ears. Does that infant think he can take me away from the fox? She wondered and in spite of her misery she began to cackle right merrily deep down in her windpipe. It was almost as if she had laughed. The first thing he knows, he'll fall through a crack in the ice, thought she. But, dark as the night was, the boy saw distinctly all the cracks and holes there were, and took daring leaps over them. This was because he had the elf's good eyesight now, and could see in the dark. He saw both lake and shore just as clearly as if it had been daylight. Smurfox left the ice where it touched the shore, and just as he was working his way up to the land edge, the boy shouted, Drop that goose, you sneak! Smur didn't know who was calling to him, and wasted no time in looking round, but increased his pace. 
The fox made straight for the forest and the boy followed him with never a thought of the danger he was running. All he thought about was the contemptuous way in which he had been received by the wild geese and he made up his mind to let them see that a human being was something higher than all else created. He shouted again and again to that dog to make him drop his game. What kind of dog are you who can steal a whole goose and not feel ashamed of yourself? Drop her at once or you'll see what a beating you'll get. Drop her, I say, or I'll tell your master how you behave. When Smurf Fox saw that he had been mistaken for a scary dog, he was so amused that he came near dropping the goose. Smurf was a great plunderer who wasn't satisfied with only hunting rats and pigeons in the fields, but he also ventured into the farmyards to steal chickens and geese. He knew that he was feared throughout the district, and anything as idiotic as this he had not heard since he was a baby. The boy ran so fast that the thick beech trees appeared to be running past him, backward, but he caught up with Smur. Finally, he was so close to him that he got a hold on his tail. "'Now I'll take the goose away from you anyway,' cried he, and held on as hard as ever he could, but he hadn't strength enough to stop Smur. The fox dragged him along until the dry foliage whirled around him. But now it began to dawn on Smur how harmless the thing was that pursued him. He stopped short, put the goose on the ground, and stood on her with his forepaws so that she couldn't fly away. He was just about to bite off her neck, but then he couldn't resist the desire to tease the boy a little. Hurry off and complain to the master, for now I'm going to bite the goose to death, said he. Certainly the one who was surprised when he saw what a pointed nose and heard what a hoarse and angry voice that dog which he was pursuing had was the boy. But now he was so enraged because the fox had made fun of him that he never thought of being frightened. He took a firmer hold on the tail, braced himself against a beech trunk, and just as the fox opened his jaws over the goose's throat, he pulled as hard as he could. Smo was so astonished that he let himself be pulled backward a couple of steps, and the wild goose got away. She fluttered upward feebly and heavily. One wing was so badly wounded that she could barely use it. In addition to this, she could not see in the night darkness of the forest, but was as helpless as the blind. Therefore, she could in no way help the boy. So she groped her way through the branches and flew down to the lake again. And then Smur made a dash for the boy. If I don't get the one, I shall certainly have the other, said he and you could tell by his voice how mad he was. "'Oh, don't you believe it?' said the boy, who was in the best of spirits because he had saved the goose. He held fast by the foxtail and swung with it to one side when the fox tried to catch him. There was such a dance in that forest that the dry beech leaves fairly flew. Smur swung round and round, but the tail swung too, while the boy kept a tight grip on it, so the fox could not grab him. The boy was so gay after his success that in the beginning he laughed and made fun of the fox. But Smur was persevering, as old hunters generally are, and the boy began to fear that he should be captured in the end. Then he caught sight of a little young beech tree that had shot up as slender as a rod, that it might soon reach the free air above the canopy of branches which the old beeches spread above it. Quick as a flash, he let go of the foxtail and climbed the beech tree. Smur Fox was so excited that he continued to dance around after his tail. Uh, "'Don't bother with the dance any longer,' said the boy. But Smur couldn't endure the humiliation of his failure to get the better of such a little tot, so he lay down under the tree that he might keep a close watch on him. The boy didn't have any too good a time of it where he sat astride a frail branch. The young beech did not as yet reach the high branch canopy, so the boy couldn't get over to another tree, and he didn't dare to come down again. He was so cold and numb that he almost lost his hold around the branch, and he was dreadfully sleepy, but he didn't dare fall asleep for fear of tumbling down. My, but it was dismal to sit in that way the whole night through out in the forest. He never before understood the real meaning of night. It was just as if the whole world had become petrified and never could come to life again. Then it commenced to dawn. 
The boy was glad that everything began to look like itself once more, although the chill was even sharper than it had been during the night. Finally, when the sun got up, it wasn't yellow but red. The boy thought it looked as though it were angry, and he wondered what it was angry about. Perhaps it was because the night had made it so cold and gloomy on earth while the sun was away. The sunbeams came down in great clusters to see what the night had been up to. It could be seen how everything blushed, as if they all had guilty consciences. The clouds in the skies, the satiny beech limbs, the little intertwined branches of the forest canopy, the hoar frost that covered the foliage on the ground. Everything grew flushed and red. More and more sunbeams came bursting through space, and soon the night's terrors were driven away, and such a marvellous lot of living things came forward. The black woodpecker with the red neck began to hammer with its bill on the branch. The squirrel glided from his nest with a nut and sat down on a branch and began to shell it. The starling came flying with a worm, and the bullfinch sang in the treetop. Then the boy understood that the sun had said to all his tiny creatures, Wake up now, and come out of your nests, I'm here. Now you need be afraid of nothing. The wild goose call was heard from the lake, as they were preparing for flight, and soon all fourteen geese came flying through the forest. The boy tried to call them, but they flew so high that his voice couldn't reach them. They probably believed the fox had eaten him up, and they didn't trouble themselves to look for him. The boy came near crying with regret, but the sun stood up there, orange-coloured and happy, and put courage into the whole world. It isn't worth while, Nils Holgerson, for you to be troubled about anything as long as I'm here, said the sun. Part 3. Goose Play Monday, March 21st Everything remained unchanged in the forest, about as long as it takes a goose to eat her breakfast. But just as the morning was verging on forenoon, a goose came flying all by herself under the thick tree canopy. She groped her way hesitatingly between the stems and branches and flew very slowly. As soon as Smurf Fox saw her, he left his place under the beech tree and sneaked up towards her. The wild goose didn't avoid the fox but flew very close to him. Smur made a high jump for her, but he missed her, and the goose went on her way down to the lake. It was not long before another goose came flying. She took the same route as the first one and flew still lower and slower. She too flew close to Smur Fox, and he made such a high spring for her that his ears brushed her feet, but she too got away from him unhurt, and went her way towards the lake, silent as a shadow. A little while passed, and then there came another wild goose. She flew still lower and lower, and it seemed even more difficult for her to find her way between the beech branches. And Smur made a powerful spring. He was within a hair's breadth of catching her, but that goose also managed to save herself. Just after she had disappeared came a fourth. She flew so slowly and so badly that Smurf Fox thought he could catch her without much effort at all, but he was afraid of failure now and concluded to let her fly past unmolested. She took the same direction the others had taken, and just as she was come right above Smur, she sank down so far that he was tempted to jump for her. He jumped so high that he touched her with his tail, but she flung herself quickly to one side and saved her life. Before Smur got through panting, three more geese came flying in a row. They flew just like the rest, and Smur made high springs for them all, but he did not succeed in catching any one of them. After that came five geese, but these flew better than the others, and although it seemed as if they wanted to lure Smur to jump, he withstood the temptation. After quite a long time came one single goose. It was the thirteenth. This one was so old that she was grey all over, without a dark speck anywhere on her body. She didn't appear to use one wing very well, but flew so wretchedly and crookedly that she almost touched the ground. Smur not only made a high leap for her, but he pursued her, running and jumping all the way down to the lake. But not even this time did he get anything for his trouble. When the fourteenth goose came along, it looked very pretty, because it was white and as its great wings swayed, it glistened like a light in the dark forest. 
When Smurf Fox saw this one, he mustered all his resources and jumped halfway up to the tree canopy, but the white one flew by unhurt like the rest. Now it was quiet for a moment under the beeches. It looked as if the whole wild goose flock had travelled past. Suddenly Smur remembered his prisoner and raised his eyes toward the young beech tree, and just as he might have expected, the boy had disappeared. But Smur didn't have much time to think about him, for now the first goose came back again from the lake and flew slowly under the canopy. In spite of all his ill luck, Smur was glad that she came back and darted after her with a high leap. But he had been in too much of a hurry and hadn't taken the time to calculate the distance, and he landed at one side of the goose. Then there came still another goose, then a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on, until the angle closed in with the old ice-grey one and the big white one. They all flew low and slow. Just as they swayed in the vicinity of Smur Fox, they sank down, kiting-like, for him to take them. Smur ran after them and made leaps a couple of fathoms high, but he couldn't manage to get hold of a single one of them. It was the most awful day that Smur Fox had ever experienced. The wild geese kept on travelling over his head. They came and went, came and went. Great, splendid geese, who had eaten themselves fat on the German heaths and grain fields, swayed all day through the woods and so close to him that he touched them many times. Yet he was not permitted to appease his hunger with a single one of them. The winter was hardly gone yet, and Smur recalled nights and days when he had been forced to tramp around in idleness with not so much as a hare to hunt when the rats hid themselves under the frozen earth, and when the chickens were all shut up. But all the winter's hunger had not been as hard to endure as this day's miscalculations. Smur was no young fox. He had had the dogs after him many a time, and he had heard the bullets whiz around his ears. He had lain in hiding, down in the lair, while the dachshunds crept into the crevices, and all but found him. But all the anguish that Smur Fox had been forced to suffer under this hot chase was not to be compared with what he suffered every time that he missed one of the wild geese. In the morning, when the play began, Smur Fox had looked so stunning that the geese were amazed when they saw him. Smur loved display. His coat was a brilliant red, his breast white, his nose black, and his tail was as bushy as a plume. But when the evening of this day was come, Smur's coat hung in loose folds. He was bathed in sweat. His eyes were without luster. His tongue hung far out from his gaping jaws, and froth oozed from his mouth. In the afternoon, Smur was so exhausted that he grew delirious. He saw nothing before his eyes but flying geese. He made leaps for sunspots which he saw on the ground, and for a poor little butterfly that had come out of his chrysalis too soon. The wild geese flew and flew unceasingly. All day long they continued to torment Smur. They were not moved to pity because Smur was done up, fevered and out of his head. They continued without a let-up, although they understood that he hardly saw them and that he jumped after their shadows. When Smur Fox sank down on a pile of dry leaves, weak and powerless and almost ready to give up the ghost, they stopped teasing him. Now you know, Mr. Fox, what happens to the one who dares to come near, Acker of Kebnekes, they shouted at his ear, and with that they left him in peace. Chapter 3 The Wonderful Journey of Nils Part 1 On the Farm Thursday, March 24th just at that time, a thing happened in Skein which created a good deal of discussion, and even got into the newspapers, but which many believed to be a fable, because they had not been able to explain it. It was about like this. A lady squirrel had been captured in the hazel brush that grew on the shores of Vom Lake, and was carried to a farmhouse close by. All the folk on the farm, both young and old, were delighted with the pretty creature with the bushy tail, the wise, inquisitive eyes, and the natty little feet. They intended to amuse themselves all summer by watching its nimble movements, its ingenious way of shelling nuts, and its droll play. They immediately put in order an old squirrel cage, with a little greenhouse and a wire cylinder wheel. The little house, which had both doors and windows, the lady squirrel was to use as a dining room and bedroom. 
For this reason, they placed therein a bed of leaves, a bowl of milk, and some nuts. The cylinder wheel, on the other hand, she was to use as a playhouse, where she could run and climb and swing around. The people believed that they had arranged things very comfortably for the lady squirrel, and they were astonished because she didn't seem to be contented, but instead she sat there, downcast and moody, in a corner of her room. Every now and then she would let out a shrill, agonised cry. She did not touch the food, and not once did she swing round on the wheel. "'It's probably because she's frightened,' said the farmer folk. "'Tomorrow, when she feels more at home, she will both eat and play.' Meanwhile, the women folk on the farm were making preparations for a feast, and just on that day when the lady squirrel had been captured, they were busy with an elaborate bake. They had had bad luck with something, either the dough wouldn't rise or else they had been dilatory, for they were obliged to work long after dark. Naturally, there was a great deal of excitement and bustle in the kitchen, and probably no one there took time to think about the squirrel, or to wonder how she was getting on. But there was an old grandma in the house who was too aged to take a hand in the baking. This she herself understood. But just the same, she did not relish the idea of being left out of the game. She felt rather downhearted, and for this reason she did not go to bed, but seated herself by the sitting-room window and looked out. They had opened the kitchen door on account of the heat, and through it a clear ray of light streamed out on the yard and it became so well lighted up there that the old woman could see all the cracks and holes in the plastering on the wall opposite. She also saw the squirrel cage which hung just where the light fell clearest, and she noticed how the squirrel ran from her room to the wheel, and from the wheel to her room, all night long, without stopping an instant. She thought it a strange sort of unrest that had come over the animal, but she believed, of course, that the strong light kept her awake. Between the cowhouse and the stable there was a broad, handsome carriage gate. This too came within the light radius. As the night wore on, the old grandma saw a tiny creature, no bigger than a hand's breadth, cautiously steal his way through the gate. He was dressed in leather breeches and wooden shoes like any other working man. The grandma knew at once that it was the elf, and she was not the least bit frightened. She had always heard that the elf kept himself somewhere about the place, although she had never seen him before, and an elf, to be sure, brought good luck wherever he appeared. As soon as the elf came into the stone-paved yard, he ran right up to the squirrel cage, and since it hung so high that he could not reach it, he went over to the storehouse after a rod, placed it against the cage and swung himself up, in the same way that a sailor climbs a rope. When he had reached the cage, he shook the door of the little greenhouse as if he wanted to open it, but the old grandma didn't move for she knew that the children had put a padlock on the door, as they feared that the boys on the neighbouring farms would try to steal the squirrel. The old woman saw that when the boy could not get the door open, the lady squirrel came out to the wire wheel. There they held a long conference together, and when the boy had listened to all that the imprisoned animal had to say to him, he slid down the rod to the ground and ran out through the carriage gate. The old woman didn't expect to see anything more of the elf that night. Nevertheless, she remained at the window, after a few moments had gone by, he returned. He was in such a hurry that it seemed to her as though his feet hardly touched the ground, and he rushed right up to the squirrel cage. The old woman, with her far-sighted eyes, saw him distinctly, and she also saw that he carried something in his hands, but what it was she couldn't imagine. The thing he carried in his left hand he laid down on the pavement, but that which he held in his right hand he took with him to the cage. He kicked so hard with his wooden shoes on the little window that the glass was broken. He poked in the thing which he held in his hand to the lady squirrel. Then he slid down again and took up that which he had laid upon the ground and climbed up the cage with that also. The next instant he ran off again with such haste that the old woman could hardly follow him with her eyes. But now it was the old grandma who could no longer sit still in the cottage, but who, very slowly, went out to the backyard and stationed herself in the shadow of the pump to await the elf's return. And there was one other who had also seen him and had been curious. This was the house cat. He crept along slyly and stopped close to the wall just two steps away from the stream of light. They both stood and waited long and patiently on that chilly March night. And the old woman was just beginning to think about going in again when she heard a clatter on the pavement and saw that the little mite of an elf came trotting along once more 
carrying a burden in each hand, as he had done before. That which he bore squealed and squirmed, and now a light dawned on the old grandma. She understood that the elf had hurried down to the hazel grove and brought back the lady squirrel's babies, and that he was carrying them to her so they shouldn't starve to death. The old grandma stood very still so as not to disturb them, and it did not look as if the elf had noticed her. He was just going to lay one of the babies on the ground so that he could swing himself up to the cage with the other one when he saw the house cat's green eyes glistening close beside him. He stood there, bewildered, with a young one in each hand. He turned around and looked in all directions. Then he became aware of the old grandma's presence. Then he did not hesitate long but walked forward, stretched his arms as high as he could reach for her to take one of the baby squirrels. The old grandma did not wish to prove herself unworthy of the confidence, so she bent down and took the baby squirrel and stood there and held it until the boy had swung himself up to the cage with the other one. Then he came back for the one he had entrusted to her care. The next morning, when the farm folk had gathered together for breakfast, it was impossible for the old woman to refrain from telling them of what she'd seen the night before. They all laughed at her, of course, and said that she'd been only dreaming. There were no baby squirrels this early in the year. But she was sure of her ground and begged them to take a look into the squirrel cage, and this they did. And there lay on the bed of leaves four tiny, half-naked, half-blind baby squirrels who were at least a couple of days old. When the farmer himself saw the young ones, he said, Be it as may with this, for one thing is certain, we on this farm have behaved in such a manner that we are shamed before both animals and human beings and therefore he took the mother squirrel and all her young ones from the cage and laid them in the old grandma's lap. "'Go thou out to the hazel grove with them,' said he, "'and let them have their freedom back again.' It was this event that was so much talked about, and which even got into the newspapers, but which the majority would not credit because they were not able to explain how anything like that could have happened. Part 2. Witzgold Saturday, March 26th. Two days later, another strange thing happened. A flock of wild geese came flying one morning and lit on a meadow down in eastern Skane, not very far from the Witzkoll Manor. In the flock were thirteen wild geese of the usual grey variety and one white goosey gander who carried on his back a tiny lad dressed in yellow leather breeches, green vest and a white woollen toboggan hood. They were now very near the eastern sea, and on the meadow where the geese had alighted, the soil was sandy, as it usually is on the sea coast. It looked as if, formerly, there had been flying sand in this vicinity, which had to be held down, for in several directions large planted pine woods. When the wild geese had been feeding a while, several children came along and walked on the edge of the meadow. The goose who was on guard at once raised herself into the air with noisy wing strokes, so the whole flock should hear that there was a danger on foot. All the wild geese flew upward, but the white one trotted along the ground, unconcerned. When he saw the others fly, he raised his head and called after them. "'You needn't fly away from these. They are only a couple of children.' The little creature, who had been riding on his back, sat down upon a knoll on the outskirts of the wood and picked a pine cone in pieces that he might get at the seats. The children were so close to him that he did not dare to run across the meadow to the white one. He concealed himself under a big dry thistle leaf and at the same time gave a warning cry. But the white one had evidently made up his mind not to let himself be scared. He walked along on the ground all the while and not once did he look to see in what direction they were going. Meanwhile, they turned from the path, walked across the field, getting nearer and nearer to the goosey gander. When he finally did look up, they were right upon him. He was so dumbfounded and became so confused, he forgot that he could fly and tried to get out of their reach by running. But the children followed, chasing him into a ditch where they caught him. The larger of the two stuck him under his arm and carried him off. When the boy who lay under the thistle leaf saw this, he sprang up, as if he wanted to take the goosey gander away from them. Then he must have remembered how little and powerless he was, for he threw himself on the knoll and beat upon the ground with his clenched fists. The goosey gander cried with all his might for his help. Thumbitot, come and help me! Oh, Thumbitot, come and help me! The boy began to laugh in the midst of his distress. 
Oh, yes, I'm just the right one to help anybody I am, said he. Anyway, he got up and followed the goosey gander. I can't help him, said he, but I shall at least find out where they're taking him. The children had a good start, but the boy had no difficulty in keeping them within sight until they came to a hollow where a brook gushed forth. But here he was obliged to run alongside of it for some little time before he could find a place narrow enough for him to jump over. When he came up from the hollow, the children had disappeared. He could see their footprints on a narrow path which led to the woods, and these he continued to follow. Soon he came to a crossroad. Here the children must have separated, for there were footprints in two directions. The boy looks now as if all hope had fled. Then he saw a little white down on a heather knoll, and he understood that the goosey gander had dropped this by the wayside to let him know in which direction he'd been carried, and therefore he continued his search. He followed the children through the entire wood. The goosey gander he did not see, but wherever he was likely to miss his way, lay a little white down to put him right. The boy continued faithfully to follow the bits of down. They led him out of the wood, across a couple of meadows, up on a road, and finally through the entrance of a broad alley. At the end of the alley there were gables and towers of red tiling, decorated with bright borders and other ornamentations that glittered and shone. When the boy saw that this was some great manor, he thought he knew what had become of the goosey gander. No doubt the children have carried the goosey gander to the manor and sold him there. By this time he's probably butchered, he said to himself. But he did not seem to be satisfied with anything less than proof positive, and with renewed courage he ran forward. He met no one in the alley, and that was well, for such as he are generally afraid of being seen by human beings. The mansion which he came to was a splendid old-time structure, with four great wings which enclosed a courtyard. On the east wing there was a high arch leading into the courtyard. This far the boy ran without hesitation, but when he got there he stopped. He dared not venture further, but stood still and pondered what he should do now. And there he stood, with his finger on his nose, thinking, when he heard footsteps behind him, and as he turned around he saw a whole company march up the alley. In haste he stole behind a water-barrel which stood near the arch, and hid himself. Those who came up were some twenty young men from a folk high school, out on a walking tour. They were accompanied by one of the instructors. When they were come as far as the arch, the teacher requested them to wait there a moment while he went in and asked if they might see the old castle of Witzkoll. The newcomers were warm and tired, as if they had been on a long tramp. One of them was so thirsty that he went over to the water barrel and stooped down to drink. He had a tin box, such as botanists use, hanging about his neck. He evidently thought that this was in his way, for he threw it down on the ground. With this, the lid flew open, and one could see that there were a few spring flowers in it. The botanist's box dropped just in front of the boy, and he must have thought that here was his opportunity to get into the castle and find out what had become of the goosey gander. He smuggled himself quickly into the box and concealed himself as well as he could under the anemones and coltsfoot. He was hardly hidden before the young man picked the box up, hung it around his neck, and slammed down the cover. Then the teacher came back and said that they'd be given permission to enter the castle. At first he conducted them no farther than the courtyard. There he stopped and began to talk to them about this ancient structure. He called their attention to the first human beings who had inhabited this country and who had been obliged to live in mountain grottoes and earth caves, in the dens of wild beasts and in the brushwood, and that a very long period had elapsed before they learned to build themselves huts from the trunks of trees. And afterward, how long had they not been forced to labour and struggle before they'd advanced from the log cabin with its single room to the building of a castle with a hundred rooms like Vitzkoll? It was about 350 years ago that the rich and powerful built such castles for themselves, he said. It was very evident that Vitzkoll had been erected at a time when wars and robbers made it unsafe in Skane. All around the castle was a deep trench filled with water, and across this there had been a bridge in bygone days that could be hoisted up. Over the gate arch there is, even to this day, a watchtower, and all along the sides of the castle ran sentry galleries, 
and in the corners stood towers with walls a metre thick. Yet the castle had not been erected in the most savage war time, for Jens Bray, who built it, had also studied to make of it a beautiful and decorative monument. If they could see the big, solid stone structure at Glyminge, which had been built only a generation earlier, they would readily see that Jans Holgersen Ufstand, the builder, hadn't figured upon anything else, only to build big and strong and secure, without bestowing a thought upon making it beautiful and comfortable. If they visited such castles as Marvin's home, Snogholm and Ovid's cloister, which were erected a hundred years or so later, they would find that the times became less warlike. The gentlemen who built these places had not furnished them with fortifications, but had only taken pains to provide themselves with great, splendid dwelling houses. The teacher talked at length and in detail, and the boy who lay shut up in the box was pretty impatient. But he must have lain very still, for the owner of the box hadn't the least suspicion that he was carrying him along. Finally, the company went into the castle. But if the boy had hoped for a chance to crawl out of that box, he was deceived, for the student carried it upon him all the while, and the boy was obliged to accompany him through all the rooms. It was a tedious trap. The teacher stopped every other minute to explain and instruct. In one room he found an old fireplace, and before this he stopped to talk about the different kinds of fireplaces that had been used in the course of time. The first indoors fireplace had been a big flat stone on the floor of a hut with an opening in the roof, which let in rain. The next had been a big stone hearth with no opening in the roof. This must have made the hut very warm, but it also filled it with soot and smoke. When Vidskoll was built, and the people had advanced far enough to open the fireplace, which at that time had a wide chimney for the smoke, but it almost took most of the warmth up in the air with it. If that boy had ever in his life been cross and impatient, he was given a good lesson in patience that day. It must have been a whole hour now that he had lain perfectly still. In the next room they came to, the teacher stopped before an old-time bed, with its high canopy and rich curtains. Immediately he began to talk about the beds and bedplaces of olden days. The teacher didn't hurry himself, but then he did not know, of course, that a poor little creature lay shut up in a botanist's box and only waited for him to get through. When they came to a room with gilded leather hangings, he talked to them about how the people had dressed their walls and ceilings ever since the beginning of time. And when he came to an old family portrait, he told them all about the different changes in dress and in the banquet halls he described ancient customs of celebrating weddings and funerals. Thereupon the teacher talked a little about the excellent men and women who had lived in the castle, about the old Brays and the old Barnacows, and of Christian Barnacow, who had given his horse to the king to help him escape, of Margareta Ashkeberg, who had been married to Kjell Barnacow, and who, when a widow, had managed the estates and the whole district for 53 years of banker Hagerman, a farmer's son from Witzkoll, who had grown so rich that he had bought the entire estate. About the Stjernsvards, who had given the people of Skane better ploughs, which enabled them to discard the ridiculous old wooden ploughs that three oxen were hardly able to drag. And during all this, the boy lay still. If he had ever been mischievous and shut the cellar door on his father or mother, he understood now how they had felt, for it was hours and hours before that teacher got through. At last the teacher went out into the courtyard again, and there he discoursed upon the tireless labour of mankind to procure for themselves tools and weapons, clothes and houses and ornaments. He said that such an old castle as Vitzkoll was a milepost on time's highway. Here one could see how far the people had advanced 350 years ago, and one could judge for oneself whether things had gone forward or backward since their time. But this dissertation the boy escaped hearing, for the student who carried him was thirsty again and stole into the kitchen to ask for a drink of water. When the boy was carried into the kitchen, he should have tried to look around for the goosey gander. He had begun to move, and as he did thus, he happened to press too hard against the lid, and it flew open. As botanists' box lids are always flying open, the student thought no more about the matter, but pressed it down again. Then the cook asked him if he had a snake in the box. 
"'No, I have only a few plants,' the student replied. "'It was certainly something that moved there,' insisted the cook. The student threw back the lid to show her that she was mistaken. "'See for yourself if—' But he got no further. For now the boy dared not stay in the box any longer, but with one bound he stood on the floor and out he rushed. The maids hardly had time to see what it was that ran, but they hurried after it nevertheless.' The teacher still stood and talked when he was interrupted by shrill cries. "'Catch him! Catch him!' shrieked those who'd come from the kitchen. And all the young men raced after the boy, who glided away faster than a rat. They tried to intercept him at the gate, but it was not so easy to get a hold on such a little creature. So, luckily, he got out in the open. The boy did not dare to run down towards the open alley, but turned in another direction. He rushed through the garden into the backyard. All the while, the people raced after him, shrieking and laughing. The poor little thing ran as hard as ever he could to get out of their way, but still it looked as though the people would catch up with him. As he rushed past a labourer's cottage, he heard a goose cackle and saw a white down laying on the doorstep. There at last was the goosey gander. He had been on the wrong track before. He thought no more of housemaids and men who were hounding him, but climbed up the steps and into the hallway. Father, he couldn't come, for the door was locked. He heard how the goosey gander cried and moaned inside, but he couldn't get the door open. The hunters that were pursuing him came nearer and nearer, and in the room the goosey gander cried more and more pitifully. In his direst of needs, the boy finally plucked up courage and pounded on the door with all his might. A child opened it, and the boy looked into the room. In the middle of the floor sat a woman who held the goosey gander tight to clip his quill feathers. It was her children who had found him, and she didn't want to do him any harm. It was her intention to let him in among her own geese, had she only succeeded in clipping his wings so he couldn't fly away. But a worse fate could hardly have happened to the goosey gander, and he shrieked and moaned with all his might. And a lucky thing it was that the woman hadn't started the clipping sooner. Now only two quills had fallen under the shears when the door was opened, and the boy stood on the door sill. But a creature like that the woman had never seen before. She couldn't believe anything else but that it was Gonis himself. And in her terror she dropped the shears, clasped her hands, and forgot to hold on to the goosey gander. As soon as he felt himself freed, he ran toward the door. He didn't give himself time to stop, but as he ran past him he grabbed the boy by the neckband and carried him along with him. On the stoop he spread his wings and flew up in the air and at the same time he made a graceful sweep with his neck and seated the boy on his smooth, downy back. And off they flew, while all Vitskull stood and stared after them. Part 3. In Ovid, Cloister Park All that day, when the wild geese played with the fox, the boy lay and slept in a deserted squirrel nest. When he awoke, along toward evening, he felt very uneasy. "'Well, now, I shall soon be sent home again. "'Then I'll have to exhibit myself before father and mother,' thought he. "'But when he looked up and saw the wild geese "'who lay and bathed in Vom Lake, "'not one of them said a word about his going. "'They probably think the white one is too tired "'to travel home with me tonight,' thought the boy. "'The next morning the geese were awake at daybreak, "'long before sunrise. "'Now the boy felt sure that he'd have to go home.' But, curiously enough, both he and the white goosey gander were permitted to follow the wild ones on their morning tour. The boy couldn't comprehend the reason for the delay, but he figured it out in this way, that the wild geese did not care to send the goosey gander on such a long journey until they had both eaten their fill. Come what might, he was only glad for every moment that should pass before he must face his parents. The wild geese travelled over Ovid's cloister estate, which was situated in a beautiful park east of the lake, and looked very imposing with its great castle, its well-planned court surrounded by low walls, and its pavilions, its fine old-time garden with covered arbours, streams and fountains, its wonderful trees, trimmed bushes, and its evenly mown lawns with their beds of beautiful spring flowers. When the wild geese rode over the estate in the early morning hour, there was no human being about. When they had carefully assured themselves of this, they lowered themselves toward the dog kennel and shouted, What kind of a little hut is this? What kind of a little hut is this? Instantly the dog came out of his kennel, furiously angry, and barked at the air. Do you call this a hut, you tramps? 
Can't you see that this is a great stone castle? Can't you see what fine terraces and what a lot of pretty walls and windows and great doors it has? <laughs> Don't you see the grounds? Can't you see the garden? Can't you see the conservatories? Can't you see the marble statues? You, you call this a hut, do you? Do huts have parks with beech groves and hazel bushes and trailing vines and oak trees and furs and hunting grounds filled with game? Do you call this a hut? Have you seen huts with so many outhouses around them that they look like a whole village? You must know a lot of huts that have their own church and their own parsonage. And that rule over the district and the peasant homes and the neighbouring farms and barracks. Do you call this a hut? To this hut belong the richest possessions in Skane. You beggars. You can't see a bit of land from where you hang in the clouds that does not obey commands from this hut. Woof, woof, woof. All this the dog managed to cry out in one breath, and the wild geese flew back and forth over the estate and listened to him until he was winded. But then they cried, What are you so mad about? We didn't ask about the castle. We only wanted to know about your kennel, stupid. When the boy heard this joke, he laughed. Then a thought stole in on him, which at once made him serious. Think how many of these amusing things you would hear if you could go with the wild geese through the whole country, all the way up to Lapland, he said to himself. And just now, when you're in such a bad fix, a trip like that would be the best thing you could hit upon. The wild geese travelled to one of the wide fields east of the estate to eat grass roots, and they kept this up for hours. In the meantime, the boy wandered in the great park which bordered the field. He hunted up a beechnut grove and began to look up at the bushes to see if a nut from last fall still hang there. But again and again the thought of the trip came over him as he walked in the park. He pictured to himself what a fine time he would have if he went with the wild geese to freeze and starve. That he believed he should have to do often enough, but as a recompense he would escape both work and study. As he walked there, the old grey leader goose came up to him and asked if he had found anything eatable. No, that he didn't, he replied, and then she tried to help him. She couldn't find any nuts either, but she discovered a couple of dried blossoms that hung on a briar bush. These the boy ate with a good relish, but he wondered what his mother would say if she knew that he had lived on raw fish and old winter-dried blossoms. When the wild geese had finally eaten themselves full, they bore off toward the lake again, where they amused themselves with games until almost dinner time. The wild geese challenged the white goosey gander to take part in all kinds of sports. They had swimming races, running races and flying races with him. The big tame one did his level best to hold his own, but the clever wild geese beat him every time. All the while, the boy sat on the goosey gander's back and encouraged him and had as much fun as the rest. They laughed and screamed and cackled, and it was remarkable that the people on the estate didn't hear them. When the wild geese were tired of play, they flew out on the ice and rested for a couple of hours. The afternoon they spent in pretty much the same way as the forenoon, first a couple of hours feeding, then bathing and play in the water near the ice edge until sunset, when they immediately arranged themselves for sleep. This is just the life that suits me, thought the boy, when he crept in under the gander's wing. But tomorrow, I suppose, I'll be sent home. Before he fell asleep, he lay and thought that if he might go along with the wild geese, he would escape all scoldings because he was lazy. Then he could cut loose every day and his only worry would be to get something to eat. But he needed so little nowadays and there would always be a way to get that. So he pictured the whole scene to himself what he should see, and all the adventures that he would be in on. Yes, it would be something different from the wear and tear at home. If I only could go with the wild geese on their travels, I shouldn't grieve because I'd be transformed, thought the boy. He wasn't afraid of anything except being sent home, but not even on Wednesday did the geese say anything to him about going. That day passed in the same way as Tuesday, and the boy grew more and more contented with the outdoor life. He thought that he had the lovely Ovid Cloister Park, which was as large as a forest, all to himself, and he wasn't anxious to go back to the stuffy cabin and the little patch of ground there at home. On Wednesday, he believed that the wild geese thought of keeping him with them. 
But on Thursday, he lost hope again. Thursday began just like the other days. The geese fed on the broad meadows, and the boy hunted for food in the park. After a while, Acker came to him and asked if he had found anything to eat. No, he had not. And then she looked up a dry caraway herb that had kept all its tiny seeds intact. When the boy had eaten, Acker said that she thought he ran around in the park altogether too recklessly. She wondered if he knew how many enemies he had to guard against, he who was so little. No, he didn't know anything at all about that. Then Acker began to enumerate them for him. Whenever he walked in the park, she said, he must look out for the fox and the marten. When he came to the shores of the lake, he must think of the otters. As he sat on the stone wall, he must not forget the weasels who would creep through the smallest holes. And if he wished to lie down and sleep on a pile of leaves, he must first find out if the adders were not sleeping their winter sleep in the same pile. As soon as he came out in the open fields, he should keep an eye out for hawks and buzzards, for eagles and falcons that soared in the air. In the bramble bush, he could be captured by the sparrow hawks. Magpies and crows were found everywhere, and in these he mustn't place any too much confidence. As soon as it was dusk, he must keep his ears open and listen for the big owls, who flew along with such soundless wing strokes that they could come right up to him before he was aware of their presence. When the boy heard that there were so many who were after his life, he thought that it would be simply impossible for him to escape. He was not particularly afraid to die, but he didn't like the idea of being eaten up. So he asked Akka what he should do to protect himself from the carnivorous animals. Akka answered at once that the boy should try to get on good terms with all the small animals in the woods and fields, with the squirrel folk and the hare family, with bullfinches and the titmice and woodpeckers and larks. If he made friends with them, they could warn him against dangers, find hiding places for him and protect him. But later in the day, when the boy tried to profit by this counsel and turned to Sul Squirrel to ask for his protection, it was evident that he did not care to help him. "'You surely can't expect anything from me or the rest of the small animals,' said Sul. "'Don't you think we know that you are Nils, the goose boy, who tore down the swallow's nest last year, crushed the starling's eggs, threw baby crows in the mild ditch, caught thrushes in snares, put squirrels in the cages?' You just help yourself as well you can, and you may be thankful that we do not form a league against you and drive you back to your own kind. This was just the sort of answer the boy would not have let go unpunished in the days when he was Nils, the goose boy. But now he was only fearful lest the wild geese, too, had found out how wicked he could be. He had been so anxious for fear he wouldn't be permitted to stay with the wild geese that he hadn't dared to get into the least little mischief since he joined their company. It was true that he didn't have the power to do much harm now, but little as he was, he could have destroyed many birds' nests and crushed many eggs, if he'd been in a mind to. Now he had been good. He hadn't pulled a feather from a goose wing or given anyone a rude answer, and every morning when he called upon Acker, he had always removed his cap and bowed. All day Thursday, he thought it was surely on account of his wickedness that the wild geese did not care to take him along up to Lapland, and in the evening, when he heard that Sarl Squirrel's wife had been stolen and her children were starving to death, he made up his mind to help them, and we have already been told how well he succeeded. When the boy came into the park on Friday, he heard the bullfinches sing in every bush of how Sol Squirrel's wife had been carried away from her children by cruel robbers, and how Nils, the goose boy, had risked his life among human beings and taken the little squirrel children to her. "'And who is so honoured in Ovid Cloister Park now as Thumbitot?' sang the bullfinch. "'He who more feared when he was Nils, the goose boy. Sol Squirrel will give him nuts, and the poor hares are going to play with him, the small wild animals will carry him on their backs and fly away with him when Smurf Fox approaches. The titmice are going to warn him against the hawk, and the finches and larks will sing of his valour. The boy was absolutely certain that both Acker and the wild geese had heard this, but still Friday passed and not one word did they say 
about his remaining with them. Until Saturday, the wild geese fed in the fields around Ovid, undisturbed by Smurfox. But on Saturday morning, when they came out in the meadows, he lay in wait for them and chased them from one field to another, and they were not allowed to eat in peace. When Acker understood that he didn't intend to leave them in peace, she came to a decision quickly, raised herself into the air, and flew with her flock several miles away over fast plains and Liderodson's hills. They did not stop before they had arrived in the district of Vitzkol. But at Vitzkol, the goosey gander was stolen, and how it happened has already been related. If the boy had not used all his powers to help him, he would never have been found. On Saturday evening, as the boy came back to Vom Lake with the goosey gander, he thought that he'd done a good day's work, and he speculated a good deal on what Acker and the wild geese would say to him. The wild geese were not at all sparing in their praises, but they did not say the word he was longing to hear. Then Sunday came again. A whole week had gone by since the boy had been bewitched, and he was still just as little. But he didn't appear to be giving himself any extra worry on account of this thing. On Sunday afternoon he sat huddled together in a big, fluffy osier bush down by the lake and blew on a reed pipe. All around him there sat as many finches and bullfinches and starlings as the bush could well hold, who sang songs which he tried to teach himself to play. But the boy was not at home in this art. He blew so false that the feathers raised themselves on the little music masters, and they shrieked and fluttered in their despair. The boy laughed so heartily at their excitement that he dropped the pipe. He began once again, and that went just as badly. Then all the little birds wailed. "'Today you play worse than usual, Thumbietot. You don't take one true note. Where are your thoughts, Thumbietot?' "'There elsewhere,' said the boy, and this was true. He sat there and pondered how long he would be allowed to remain with the wild geese, or if he should be sent home, perhaps today. Finally, the boy threw down his pipe and jumped from the bush. He had seen Acker and all the wild geese coming toward him in a long row. They walked so uncommonly slow and dignified-like that the boy immediately understood that now he should learn what they intended to do with him. When they stopped at last, Acker said, "'You may well have reason to wonder at me, Thumbietot, "'who have not said thanks to you for saving me from Smurf Fox, "'but I am one of those who would rather give thanks by deeds than words. "'I have sent word to the elf that bewitched you. "'At first he didn't want to hear anything about curing you, "'but I have sent message upon message to him "'and told him how well you have conducted yourself among us. "'He greets you and says that as soon as you turn back home, you shall be human again. But think of it, just as happy as the boy had been when the wild geese began to speak, just that miserable was he when they'd finished. He didn't say a word, but turned away and wept. What in all the world is this? said Acker. It looks as though you had expected more of me than I have offered you. But the boy was thinking of the carefree days and the banter, and of adventure and freedom and travel high above the earth that he should miss, and he actually bawled with grief. "'I don't want to be human,' said he. "'I want to go with you to Lapland.' "'I'll tell you something,' said Acker. "'That elf is very touchy, and I'm afraid that if you do not accept his offer now, it will be difficult for you to coax him another time.' It was a strange thing about that boy. As long as he had lived, he'd never cared for anyone. He'd not cared for his father or mother, nor for the school teacher, not for his schoolmates, nor for the boys in the neighbourhood. All that they'd wished to have him do, whether it had been work or play, he'd only thought tiresome. Therefore, there was no one whom he missed or longed for. The only ones that he had come anywhere near agreeing with were Osa, the goose girl, and little Mats, a couple of children who attended geese in the fields, like himself. But he didn't care particularly for them either. No, far from it. I don't want to be human, bawled the boy. I, I want to go with you to Lapland. That's why I've been good for a whole week. I don't want to forbid you to come along with us as far as you like, said Acker. 
But think first, if you wouldn't rather, go home again. A day may come when you will regret this. No, said the boy. There's nothing to regret. I have never been as well off as here with you. Well then, let it be as you wish, said Akka. Thanks, said the boy. And he felt so happy that he had to cry for very joy, just as he had cried before from sorrow. Chapter 4 Gliminge Castle Part 1 Black Rats and Grey Rats In south-eastern Skane, not far from the sea, there's an old castle called Gliminge. It is a big and substantial stone house and can be seen over the plains for miles around. It's not more than four stories high, but it is so ponderous that an ordinary farmhouse, which stands on the same estate, looks like a little children's playhouse in comparison. The big stone house has such thick ceilings and partitions that there's scarcely room in its interior for anything but the thick walls. The stairs are narrow, the entrance is small, and the rooms few. Though the walls might retain their strength, there are only the fewest number of windows in the upper stories, and none at all are found in the lower ones. In the old war times, the people were just as glad that they could shut themselves up in a strong and a massive house like this, as one is nowadays to be able to creep into furs in a snapping cold winter. But when the time of peace came, they did not care to live in the dark and cold stone halls of the old castle any longer. They have long since deserted the big Glimminge castle and moved into dwelling places where the light and air can penetrate. At the time when Nils Holgersen wandered around with the wild geese, there were no human beings in Glimminge Castle. But for all that, it was not without inhabitants. Every summer there lived a stork couple in a large nest on the roof. In a nest in the attic lived a pair of grey owls. In the secret passages hung bats. In the kitchen oven lived an old cat, and down in the cellar there were hundreds of old black rats. Rats are not held in very high esteem by other animals, but the black rats at Glimminge Castle were an exception. They were always mentioned with respect, because they had shown great valour in battle with their enemies, and much endurance under the great misfortunes which had befallen their kind. They nominally belong to a rat folk who at one time had been very numerous and powerful, but who were now dying out. During a long period of time, the black rats owned Skane and the whole country. They were found in every cellar, in every attic, in larders and cowhouses and barns, in breweries and flour mills, in churches and castles, in every man-constructed building. But now they were banished from all this and were almost exterminated. Only in one and another old and secluded place could one run across a few of them, and nowhere were they to be found in such large numbers as in Glimminge Castle. When an animal folk die out, it is generally the humankind who are the cause of it, but that was not the case in this instance. The people had certainly struggled with the black rats, but they had not been able to do them any harm worth mentioning. Those who had conquered them were an animal folk of their own kind, who were called the Grey Rats. These grey rats had not lived in the land since time immemorial like the black rats, but descended from a couple of poor immigrants who landed in Malmo from a Libyan sloop about a hundred years ago. They were homeless, starved-out wretches who stuck close to the harbour, swam among the piles under the bridges and ate refuse that was thrown in the water. They never ventured into the city, which was owned by the black rats. But gradually, as the grey rats increased in number, they grew bolder. At first they moved over to some waste spaces and condemned old houses which the black rats had abandoned. They hunted their food in gutters and dirt heaps, and made the most of all the rubbish that the black rats did not deign to take care of. They were hardy, contented, and fearless, and within a few years they had become so powerful that they undertook to drive the black rats out of Malmo. They took them from attics, cellars, and storerooms, starving them out, or bid them to death, for they were not at all afraid of fighting. When Malmo was captured, they marched forward in small and large companies to conquer the whole country. 
It is almost impossible to comprehend why the black rats did not muster themselves into a great united war expedition to exterminate the grey rats, while these were still few in numbers. But the black rats were so certain of their power that they could not believe it possible for them to lose it. They sat still on their estates, and in the meantime the grey rats took from them farm after farm, city after city. They were starved out, forced out, rooted out. In Skane they had not been able to maintain themselves in a single place except Glimminge Castle. The old castle had such secure walls and such few rat passages led through these that the black rats had managed to protect themselves and to prevent the grey rats from crowding in. Night after night, year after year, the struggle had continued between the aggressors and the defenders, but the black rats had kept faithful watch and had fought with the utmost contempt for death, and, thanks to the fine old house, they had always conquered. It will have to be acknowledged that as long as the black rats were in power, they were as much shunned by all other living creatures as the grey rats are in our day, and for just cause they had thrown themselves upon poor, fettered prisoners and tortured them. They had ravished the dead. They had stolen the last turnip from the cellars of the poor, bitten off the feet of sleeping geese, robbed eggs and chicks from the hens, and committed a thousand depredations. But since they had come to grief, all this seemed to have been forgotten, and no one could help but marvel at the last race that held out so long against its enemies. The grey rats that lived in the courtyard at Glimminge and in the vicinity kept up a continuous warfare and tried to watch out for every possible chance to capture the castle. One would fancy that they should have allowed the little company of black rats to occupy Glimminge Castle in peace, since they themselves had acquired all the rest of the country. But you may be sure this thought never occurred to them. They were wont to say that it was a point of honour with them to conquer the black rats at some time or other. But those who were acquainted with the grey rats must have known that it was because the humankind used Glimminge Castle as a grain storehouse that the grey ones could not rest before they had taken possession of the place. Part 2. The Stork. Monday, March 28th. Early one morning, the wild geese who stood and slept on the ice in Vom Lake were awakened by long calls from the air. Trear up, trear up, it sounded. Trear not the crane sends greetings to Acker the wild goose and her flock. Tomorrow will be the day of the great crane dance at Kullaberg. Acker raised her head and answered at once, Greetings and thanks, greetings and thanks. With that, the cranes flew farther, and the wild geese heard them for a long while, where they travelled and called out over every field and every wooded hill. Trianat sends greetings. Tomorrow will be the great day of the crane dance on Kullaberg. The wild geese were very happy over this invitation. You're in luck, they said to the white goosey gander, to be permitted to attend the great crane dance on Kullaberg. Is it then so remarkable to see cranes dance? asked the goosey gander. It is something that you have never even dreamed about, replied the wild geese. Now we must think out what we shall do with Thumbita tomorrow, so that no harm can come to him, while we run over to Kullaberg, said Akka. Thumbita shall not be left alone, said the goosey gander. If the cranes won't let him see their dance, then I'll stay with him. No human being has ever been permitted to attend the animals' congress at Kullaberg, said Akka, and I shouldn't dare to take Thumbitot along, but we'll discuss this more at length later in the day. Now we must first and foremost think about getting something to eat. With that, Akka gave the signal to adjourn. On this day she also sought her feeding place a good distance away on Smurf Fox's account, and she didn't alight until she came to the swampy meadows a little south of Glimminge Castle. All that day the boy sat on the shores of a little pond and blew on reed pipes. He was out of sorts because he shouldn't see the crane dance, and he just couldn't say a word either to the goosey gander or to any of the others. It was pretty hard that Akka should still doubt him. When a boy had given up being human just to travel around with a few wild geese, they surely ought to understand that he had no desire to betray them. 
then, too, they ought to understand that when he had renounced so much to follow them, it was their duty to let him see all the wonders they could show him. I'll have to speak my mind right out to them, thought he. But hour after hour passed, and still he hadn't come round to it. It may sound remarkable, but the boy had actually acquired a kind of respect for the old leader goose. He felt that it was not easy to pit his will against hers. On one side of the swampy meadow, where the wild geese fed, there was a broad stone hedge. Toward evening, when the boy finally raised his head to speak to Acker, his glance happened to rest on this hedge. He uttered a little cry of surprise, and all the wild geese instantly looked up and stared in the same direction. At first, both the geese and the boy thought that all round grey stones in the hedge had acquired legs and were starting on a run, but soon they saw that it was a company of rats who ran over it. They moved very rapidly and ran forward, tightly packed, line upon line, and were so numerous that for some time they covered the entire stone hedge. The boy had been afraid of rats, even when he was a big, strong human being. Then what must his feelings be now, when he was so tiny that two or three of them could overpower him? One shudder after another travelled down his spinal column as he stood and stared at them. But, strangely enough, the wild geese seemed to feel the same aversion towards the rats that he did. They did not speak to them, and when they were gone, they shook themselves as if their feathers had been mud-spattered. "'Such a lot of grey rats abroad,' said Ixie from Vassipur. "'That's not a good omen.' The boy intended to take advantage of this opportunity to say to Acker that he thought she ought to let him go with them to Kullerberg. But he was prevented anew, for all of a sudden a big bird came down in the midst of the geese. One could believe, when one looked at this bird, that he had borrowed body, neck and head from a little white goose. But in addition to this, he had procured for himself large black wings, long red legs and a thick bill, which was too large for the little head, and weighed it down until it gave him a sad and worried look. Acker at once straightened out the folds of her wings and cut it many times as she approached the stalk. She wasn't especially surprised to see him in skein so early in the spring because she knew that the male stalks are in the habit of coming in good season to take a look at the nest and see that it hasn't been damaged during the winter before the female stalks go to the trouble of flying over the East Sea. But she wondered very much what it might signify that he sought her out since storks prefer to associate with members of their own family. "'I can hardly believe there's anything wrong with your house, Herr Ermenric, said Acker. It was apparent now that it is true what they say, a stork can seldom open his bill without complaining. But what made the thing he said sound even more doleful was that it was difficult for him to speak out. He stood for a long time and only clattered with his bill, Afterwards he spoke in a hoarse and feeble voice. He complained about everything. The nest, which was situated at the very top of the roof tree at Glimminge Castle, had been totally destroyed by winter storms, and no food could he get any more in Skane. The people of Skane were appropriating all his possessions. They dug out his marshes and laid waste his swamps. He intended to move away from his country and never return to it again. While the stork grumbled, Akka, the wild goose, who had neither home nor protection, could not help thinking to herself, If I had things as comfortable as you have, Herr Emmenrich, I should be above complaining. You have remained a free and wild bird, and still you stand so well with human beings that no one will fire a shot at you or steal an egg from your nest. But all this she kept to herself. To the stork, she only remarked that she couldn't believe he would be willing to move from a house where storks had resided ever since it was built. Then the stork suddenly asked the geese if they had seen the grey rats who were marching toward Glimmage Castle. When Acker replied that she had seen the horrid creatures, he began to tell her about the brave black rats who, for years, had defended the castle. B -b 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 but this night G G Glimminge Castle will f fall into the G Grey Rat's p power, sighed the stork. And why just this night, Herr Ermenric? asked Acker. 
well, because nearly all the black rats went over to Cullerberg last night, said the stork, since they had counted on all the rest of the animals also hurrying there. But, but, but you see, the, the grey rats have stayed at home, and, and, and now they are mustering storm the ca castle tonight, when it will be defended by only a few old c creatures who are too feeble to, to go over to Cullerberg. They'll probably accomplish their p p purpose. Uh, but I have lived here in h harmony with the b black rats for so many years that it does not please me to live in a place I inhabited by their enemies. I understood now that the stork had become so enraged over the grey rat's mode of action that he had sought her out as an excuse to complain about them. But after the manner of storks, he certainly had done nothing to avert the disaster. "'Have you sent word to the black rats, Herr Ermenric? she asked. N n "'No,' replied the stork. The, that, that, "'That wouldn't be of any use. Uh, before they can get, get back, the, the castle will be taken.' "'You must be so sure of that, Herr Ermenric, said Akka. "'I know an old wild goose, I do, who will gladly prevent outrages of this kind.' When Akka said this, the stork raised his head and stared at her, and it was not surprising, for Akka had neither claws nor bill that were fit for fighting, and in the bargain she was a daybird, and as soon as it grew dark she fell helplessly asleep while the rats did their fighting at night. But Akka had evidently made up her mind to help the black rats. She called Ixie from Vazijor and ordered him to take the wild geese over to Vonnie Blake, and when the geese made excuses, she said authoritatively, I believe it will be best for us all that you obey me. I must fly over to the big stone house, and if you follow me, the people on the place will be sure to see us and shoot us down. The only one that I want to take with me on this trip is Thumbitot. He can be of great service to me because he has good eyes and can keep awake at night. The boy was in his most contrary mood that day. And when he heard what Akka said, he raised himself to his full height and stepped forward, his hands behind him and his nose in the air. And he intended to say that he most assuredly did not wish to take a hand in the fight with grey rats. She might look around for assistance elsewhere. But at the instant the boy was seen, the stork began to move. He had stood before, as storks generally stand, with head bent downwards, and Bill pressed against the neck, but now a gurgle was heard deep down in his windpipe, as though he would have laughed. Quick as a flash, he lowered the bill, grabbed the boy, and tossed him a couple of metres in the air. With his feet, he performed seven times, while the boy shrieked and the geese shouted, "'What are you trying to do, Herr Ermenric? That's not a frog. That's a human being, Herr Ermenric. Finally, the stork put the boy down, entirely unhurt. Thereupon he said to Akka, I'll, I'll fly back to Glibbage Castle now, uh, m m Mother Acker. Uh, all who lived there were very much worried when I uh, left. You may be sure they'll be f very glad when, uh, when I tell them that Acker, the wild goose, and Th Thumbi told the human elf are on their way to rescue them. With that, the stork craned his neck, raised his wings, and darted off like an arrow when it leaves a well-drawn bow. Acker understood that he was making fun of her, but she didn't let it bother her. She waited until the boy had found his wooden shoes, which the stork had shaken off. Then she put him on her back and followed the stork. On his own account, the boy made no objection and said not a word about not wanting to go along. He had become so furious with the stork that he actually sat and puffed. That long, red-legged thing believed he was of no account just because he was little, but he would show him what kind of a man Nils Holgersen from West Veminghog was. A couple of moments later, Acker stood in the stork's nest. It had a wheel for a foundation, and over this lay several grass mats and some twigs. The nest was so old that many shrubs and plants had taken root up there, and when the mother stork sat on her eggs in the round hole in the middle of the nest, she not only had the beautiful outlook over a goodly portion of skein to enjoy, but she also had the wild briar blossoms and house leeks to look upon. Both Acker and the boy 
saw immediately that something was going on here, which turned upside down at the most regular order. On the edge of the stork nest sat two grey owls, an old grey streaked cat, and a dozen old decrepit rats with protruding teeth and watery eyes. They were not exactly the sort of animals one usually finds living peaceably together. Not one of them turned around to look at Akka, or to bid her welcome. They thought of nothing except to sit and stare at some long grey lines which came into sight here and there on the winter naked meadows. All the black rats were silent. One could see that they were in deep despair, and probably knew that they could neither defend their own lives nor the castle. The two owls sat and rolled their big eyes, and twisted their great encircling eyebrows, and talked in hollow, ghost-like voices about the awful cruelty of the grey rats, and that they would have to move away from their nest, because they had heard it said of them that they spared neither eggs nor baby birds. The old grey streaked cat was positive that the grey rats would bite him to death, since they were coming into the castle in such great numbers, and he scolded the black rats incessantly. "'How could you be so idiotic as to let your best fighters go away?' said he. "'How could you trust the grey rats? It's absolutely unpardonable!' The twelve black rats did not say a word, but the stork, despite his misery, could not refrain from teasing the cat. D -d 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 don't worry so, m m m m Monsieur House Cat, said he. C can't you see that m m Mother Acker and, uh, and Thumbietot have come to save the ca ca castle? Uh, y you can be s s certain that uh, they'll su succeed. N n n n now I must s stand up to s sleep, and I, I, I do so with the, the, the utmost calm. T t tomorrow, when, uh, when I awaken, there won't be a s single grey rat in Glimmin' castle. The boy winked at Akka and made a sign, as the stork stood upon the very edge of the nest with one leg drawn up to sleep, that he wanted to push him down to the ground. But Akka restrained him. She did not seem to be the least bit angry. Instead, she said, in a confident tone of voice, it would be pretty poor business if one who is as old as I am could not manage to get out of worse difficulties than this. If only Mr. and Mrs. Owl, who can stay awake at night, will fly off with a couple of messages for me, I think that all will go well. Both owls were willing. Then Akka bade the gentleman owl that he should go and seek the black rats who had gone off, and counsel them to hurry home immediately. The lady owl she sent to Flamir, the steeple owl who lived in Lund Cathedral, with a commission which was so secret that Akka only dared to confide it to her in a whisper. Part 3 The Rat Charmer it was getting on toward midnight when the grey rats, after a diligent search, succeeded in finding an open air hole in the cellar. This was pretty high up upon the wall, but the rats got up on one another's shoulders, and it wasn't long before the most daring among them sat in the air hole, ready to force its way into Glimminge Castle, outside whose walls so many of its forebears had fallen. The grey rat sat still for a moment in the hole, and waited for an attack from within. The leader of the defenders was certainly away, but she assumed that the black rats who were still in the castle wouldn't surrender without a struggle. With thumping heart, she listened for the slightest sound, but everything remained quiet. Then the leader of the grey rats plucked up courage and jumped down in the black coal cellar. One after another of the grey rats followed by the leader, and they all kept very quiet, and all expected to be ambushed by the black rats. Not until so many of them had crowded into the cellar that the floor couldn't hold any more did they venture further. Although they had never before been inside the building, they had no difficulty in finding their way. They soon found the passages in the walls which the black rats had used to get to the upper floors. Before they began to clamber up these narrow and steep steps, they listened again with great attention. They felt more frightened because the black rats held themselves aloof in this way than if they had met them in open battle. They could hardly believe their luck when they reached the first story without any mishaps. Immediately upon their entrance the grey rats caught the scent of the grain, which was stored in great bins on the floor. 
but it was not as yet time for them to begin to enjoy their conquest. They searched first, with the utmost caution, through the sombre, empty rooms. They ran up in the fireplace, which stood on the floor in the old castle kitchen, and they almost tumbled into the well in the inner room. Not one of the narrow peepholes did they leave uninspected, but they found no black rats. When this floor was wholly in their possession, they began with the same. Then they had to venture on a bold and dangerous climb through the walls, while with breathless anxiety they awaited an assault from the enemy. And although they were tempted by the most delicious odour from the grain bins, they forced themselves most systematically to inspect the old-time warrior's pillar-propped kitchen, their stone table and fireplace. The deep window niches and the hole in the floor, which in olden time had been opened to pour down boiling pitch on the intruding enemy. All this time, the black rats were invisible. The grey ones groped their way to the third storey and into the lord of the castle's great banquet hall, which stood there cold and empty. Like all the other rooms in the old house, they even groped their way to the upper storey, which had but one big barren room. The only place they did not think of exploring was the big stork nest on the roof, where, just at this time, the Lady Owl awakened Acca and informed her that Flamir, the steeple owl, had granted her request and had sent her the thing she wished for. Since the grey rats had so conscientiously inspected the entire castle, they felt at ease. They took it for granted that the black rats had flown and didn't intend to offer any resistance, and with light hearts they ran up into the grain bins. But the grey rats had hardly swallowed the first wheat grains before the sound of a little shrill pipe was heard from the yard. The grey rats raised their heads, listened anxiously, ran a few steps as if they intended to leave the bin, then they turned back and began to eat once more. Again the pipe sounded a sharp and piercing tone, and now something wonderful happened. One rat, two rats, yes, a whole lot of rats left the grain, jumped from the bins and hurried down cellar by the shortest cut to get out of the house. Still, there were many grey rats left. These thought of all the toil and trouble it had cost them to win Glimmage Castle, and they did not want to leave it. But again, they caught the tones from the pipe and had to follow them. With wild excitement, they rushed up from the bins, slid down through the narrow holes in the walls, and tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get out. In the middle of the courtyard stood a tiny creature who blew upon a pipe. All around him he had a whole circle of rats who listened to him, astonished and fascinated, and every moment brought more. Once he took the pipe from his lips, only for a second, put his thumb to his nose and wiggled his fingers at the grey rats, and then it looked as if they wanted to throw themselves on him and bite him to death. But as soon as he blew on his pipe, they were in his power. When the tiny creature had played all the grey rats out of Glimmage Castle, he began to wander slowly from the courtyard out on the highway, and all the grey rats followed him, because the tones from that pipe sounded so sweet to their ears that they could not resist them. The tiny creature walked before them and charmed them along with him on the road to Valby. He led them into all sorts of crooks and turns and bends, on through hedges and down into ditches, and wherever he went they had to follow. He blew continuously on his pipe, which appeared to be made from an animal's horn, although the horn was so small that in our days there were no animals from whose foreheads it could have been broken, and no one knew either who had made it. A Flamir the steeple owl had found it in a niche in Lund Cathedral. She had shown it to Batiki the raven, and they had both figured out that this was the kind of horn that was used in former times by those who wished to gain power over rats and mice. But the raven was Acker's friend, and it was from him she had learned that Flamir owned a treasure like this, and it was true that the rats could not resist the pipe. The boy walked before them and played as long as the starlight lasted, and all the while they followed him. He played at daybreak, he played at sunrise, and the whole time the entire procession of grey rats followed him and were enticed farther and farther away 
from the big grain loft at Glimminge Castle. Chapter 5 The Great Crane Dance on Kullerberg Tuesday, March 29th Although there are many magnificent buildings in Skein, it must be acknowledged that there's not one among them that has such pretty walls as old Kullerberg. Kullerberg is low and rather long. It is not by any means a big or imposing mountain. On its broad summit you'll find woods and grain fields and one and another heather heath. Here and there round heather knolls and barren cliffs rise up. It is not especially pretty up there. It looks a good deal like all the other upland places in Skane. He who walks along the path which runs across the middle of the mountain can't help feeling a little disappointed. Then he happens perhaps to turn away from the path and wanders off toward the mountain sides and looks down over the bluffs. And then, all at once, he will discover so much that is worth seeing he hardly knows how he'll find time to take in the whole of it. For it happens that Kullerberg does not stand on the land with plains and valleys around it like other mountains, but it has plunged into the sea as far out as it could get. Not even the tiniest strip of land lies below the mountain to protect it against the breakers. But these reach all the way up to the mountain walls and can polish and mould them to suit themselves. This is why the walls stand there as richly ornamented as the sea and its helpmeet, the wind, have been able to effect. You'll find steep ravines that are deeply chiselled in the mountain sides and black cracks that have become smooth and shiny under the constant lashing of the winds. There are solitary rock columns that spring right up out of the water and dark grottoes with narrow entrances. There are barren perpendicular precipices and soft leaf-clad inclines. There are small points and small inlets and small rolling stones that are rattlingly washed up and down with every dashing breaker. There are majestic cliff arches that project over the water. There are sharp stones that are constantly sprayed by a white foam and others that mirror themselves in unchangeable dark green still water. There are giant troll caverns shaped in the rock and great crevices that lure the wanderer to venture into the mountain's depths all the way to Colman's Hollow. And over and around all these cliffs and rocks crawl entangled tendrils and weeds. Trees grow there also, but the wind's power is so great that trees have to transform themselves into clinging vines that they may get a firm hold on the steep precipices. The oaks creep along the ground, while their foliage hangs over them like a low ceiling, and long-limbed beeches stand in the ravines like great leaf tents. These remarkable mountain walls, with the blue sea beneath them and the clear, penetrating air above them, is what makes Kullerberg so dear to the people that great crowds of them haunt the place every day as long as the summer lasts. But it is more difficult to tell what it is that makes it so attractive to animals that every year they gather there for a big play meeting. This is a custom that has been observed since time immemorial and one should have been there when the first sea wave was dashed into foam against the shore to be able to explain just why Kullerberg was chosen as a rendezvous in preference to all other places. When the meeting is to take place, the stags and the roebucks and hares and foxes and all the other four-footers make the journey to Kullerberg the night before so as not to be observed by the human beings. Just before sunrise, they all march up to the playground, which is a heather heath on the left side of the road and not very far from the mountain's most extreme point. The playground is enclosed on all sides by round knolls which conceal it from any and all who do not happen to come right upon it. And in the month of March, it is not at all likely that any pedestrians will stray off up there. All the strangers who usually stroll around on the rocks and clamber up the mountain sides, the fall storms have driven away these many months past. And the lighthouse keeper out there on the point, the old fru on the mountain farm and the mountain peasant and his house folk go their accustomed ways and do not run about on the desolate heather fields. 
When the four-footers have arrived on the playground, they take their places on the round knolls. Each animal family keeps to itself, although it is understood that on a day like this, universal peace reigns and no one need fear attack. On this day, a little hare might wander over to the fox's hill without losing as much as one of his long ears. But still, the animals arrange themselves into separate groups. This is an old custom. After they've all taken their places, they begin to look around for the birds. It is always beautiful weather on this day. The cranes are good weather prophets and would not call the animals together if they expected rain. Although the air is clear and nothing obstructs the vision, the four-footers see no birds. This is strange. The sun stands high in the heavens and the birds should already be on their way. But what the animals, on the other hand, observe is one and another little dark cloud that comes slowly forward over the plain. And look, one of these clouds comes gradually along the coast of Orisund and up towards Kullerberg. When the cloud has come just over the playground, it stops, and simultaneously the entire cloud begins to ring and chirp, as if it was made of nothing but tone. It rises and sinks, rises and sinks, but all the while it rings and chirps. At last, the whole cloud falls down over a knoll all at once, and the next instant the knoll is entirely covered with grey larks, pretty red-white grey bullfinches, speckled starlings, and greenish-yellow titmice. Soon after that, another cloud comes over the plain. This stops over every bit of land, over peasant cottage and palace, over towns and cities, over farms and railway stations, over fishing hamlets and sugar refineries. Every time it stops, it draws to itself a little whirling column of grey dust grains from the ground. In this way, it grows and grows, and at last, when it is all gathered up and heads for Cullerberg, it is no longer a cloud, but a whole mist, which is so big that it throws a shadow on the ground all the way from Hoganas to Mull. When it stops over the playground, it hides the sun, and for a long while it had to rain grey sparrows on one of the knolls before those who had been flying in the innermost part of the mist could again catch a glimpse of the daylight. But still, the biggest of these bird clouds is the one which now appears. This has been formed of birds who have travelled from every direction to join it. It is dark, bluish-grey, and no sun ray can penetrate it. It is full of the ghastliest noises, the most frightful shrieks, the grimmest laughter, and most ill-luck boding, croaking. All on the playground are glad when it finally resolves itself into a storm of fluttering and croaking of crows and jackdaws and rooks and ravens. And thereupon, not only clouds are seen in the heavens, but a variety of stripes and figures. Then straight dotted lines appear in the east and northeast. These are forest birds from going districts, black grouse and wood grouse, who come flying in long lines a couple of metres apart. Swimming birds that live around Maclopan, just out of Falsterbro, now come floating over Orisund in many extraordinary figures, in triangular and long curves, in sharp hooks and semicircles. To the great reunion held the year that Nils Holgersen travelled around with the wild geese came Akka and her flock, later than all the others. And that was not to be wondered at, for Akka had to fly over the whole of Skane to get to Kullerberg. And beside, as soon as she awoke, she had been obliged to go out and hunt for Thumbitot, who for many hours had gone and played to the grey rats and lured them far away from Glimmind Castle. Mr Owl had returned with the news that the black rats would be at home immediately after sunrise, and there was no longer any danger of letting the steeple owl's pipe be hushed and to give the grey rats the liberty to go where they pleased. But it was not Acker who discovered the boy where he walked with his long following and quickly sank down over him and caught him with the bill and swung into the air with him, but it was Herr Ermenrich, the stork, for Herr Ermenrich had also gone out to look for him, and after he had borne him up to the stork nest, he begged his forgiveness for having treated him with disrespect the evening before. This pleased the boy immensely, and the stork and he became good friends. 
Aka too showed him that she felt very kindly towards him. She stroked her old head several times against his arms and commended him because he had helped those who were in trouble. But this one must say to the boy's credit, that he did not want to accept praise which he had not earned. No, Mother Aka, he said, you mustn't think that I lured the grey rats away to help the black ones. I only wanted to show Herr Ermenrich that I was of some consequence. He had hardly said this before Aka turned to the stork and asked if he thought it was advisable to take Thumbietot along to Kullerberg. I mean that we can rely on him as upon ourselves, said she. The stork at once advised most enthusiastically that Thumbietot be permitted to come along. Certainly you, you shall take Thumbietot along to K Kullerberg, Mother Acker, said he. It is f f fortunate for us that we, we can repay him f f for all that he, he has endured this night for us sakes. And since it still grieves me to think that I d d did not conduct my myself in a becoming manner towards him that, that other evening, it is I, I who will c carry him on my back all the way, way to the meeting p place. There isn't much that tastes better than to receive praise from those who are themselves wise and capable, and the boy had certainly never felt so happy as he did when the wild goose and the stork talked about him in this way. Thus, the boy made the trip to Cullerberg, riding Storkback. Although he knew that this was a great honour, it caused him much anxiety, for Herr Ermenrich was a master flyer, and started off at a very different pace from the wild geese. While Acker flew her straightway with even wing strokes, the stork amused himself by performing a lot of flying tricks. Now he lay still in an immeasurable height and floated in the air without moving his wings. Now he flung himself downward with such sudden haste that it seemed as though he would fall to the ground, helpless as a stone. Now he had lots of fun flying all around Acker in great and small circles, like a whirlwind. The boy had never been on a ride of this sort before, and although he sat there all the while in terror, he had to acknowledge himself that he had never before known what a good flight meant. Only a single pause was made during the journey, and that was at Vom Lake, when Akka joined her travelling companions and called to them that the grey rats had been vanquished. After that, the travellers flew straight to Kullerberg, and there they descended to the knoll reserved for the wild geese, and as the boy let his glance wander from knoll to knoll, he saw on one of them the many pointed antlers of the stacks, and on another the grey herons' neck crests. One knoll was red with foxes, one was grey with rats, one was covered with black ravens who shrieked continually, one with larks who simply couldn't keep still but kept on throwing themselves in the air and singing for very joy. Just as it has ever been the custom on Kullerberg, it was the crows who began the day's games and frolics with their flying dance. They divided themselves into two flocks that flew toward each other, met, turned and began all over again. This dance had many repetitions and appeared to the spectators who were not familiar with the dance as altogether too monotonous. The crows were very proud of their dance, but all the others were glad when it was over. It appeared to the animals about as gloomy and meaningless as the winter storms play with the snowflakes. It depressed them to watch it, and they waited eagerly for something that should give them a little pleasure. They did not have to wait in vain either, for as soon as the crows had finished, the hares came running. They dashed forward in a long row, without any apparent order. In some of the figures one single hare came, in others they ran three and four abreast. They had all raised themselves on two legs, and they rushed forward with such rapidity that their long ears swayed in all directions. As they ran, they spun round, made high leaps, and bent their forepaws against their hindpaws, so that they rattled. Some performed a long succession of somersaults. Others doubled themselves up and rolled over like wheels. One stood on one leg and swung around. One walked upon his forepaws. There was no regulation whatever, but there was much that was droll in the hare's play, and the many animals began to breathe faster. Now it was spring. Joy and rapture were advancing. Winter was over. Summer was coming. Soon it was only play to live. 
When the hares had rummed themselves out, it was the great forest bird's turn to perform. Hundreds of wood grouse in shining dark brown array, and with bright red eyebrows, flung themselves up into a great oak that stood in the centre of the playground. The one who sat upon the topmost branch fluffed up his feathers, lowered his wings, and lifted his tail so that the white covert feathers were seen. Thereupon he stretched his neck and sent forth a couple of deep notes from his thick throat. Tchik, tchik, tchik! It sounded more than this he could not utter. It only gurgled a few times, way down in his throat. Then he closed his eyes and whispered, "Sis, sis, sis! Yeah, how pretty, sis, sis!" At the same time, he fell into such an ecstasy that he no longer knew what was going on around him. While the first woodcrafts were sissing, the three nearest under him began to sing, and before they had finished their song, the ten who sat lower down joined in, and thus it continued from branch to branch until the entire hundred grouse sang and gurgled and sissed. They all fell into the same ecstasy during their song, and this affected the other animals like a contagious transport. Lately, the blood had flowed lightly and agreeably. Now it began to grow heavy and hot. Yes, this is surely spring," thought all the animal folk. "Winter chill has vanished. The fires of spring burn over the earth." When the black grouse saw that the brown grouse were having such success, they could no longer keep quiet. As there was no tree for them to light on, they rushed down on the playground where the heather stood so high that only their beautifully turned tail feathers and their thick bills were visible, and they began to sing, "Or, or, or." Just as the black grouse began to compete with the brown grouse, something unprecedented happened. While all the animals thought of nothing but the grouse game, a fox stole slowly over to the wild geese's knoll. He glided very cautiously and came way up on the knoll before anyone noticed him. Suddenly, a goose caught sight of him, and as she could not believe that a fox had sneaked in amongst the geese for any good purpose, she began to cry. Have a care, wild geese! Have a care! The fox struck her across the throat, mostly perhaps because he wanted to make her keep quiet. But the wild geese had already heard the cry, and they all raised themselves in the air. And when they had flown up, the animals saw Smur Fox standing on the wild geese's knoll, with as he must regret he had not been able to control his thirst for revenge, but had attempted to approach Akka and her flock in this manner. He was immediately surrounded by a crowd of foxes and doomed, in accordance with an old custom which demands that whosoever disturbs the peace on the great play day must go into exile. Not a fox wished to lighten the sentence, since they all knew that the instant they attempted anything of the sort, they would be driven from the playground and would never more be permitted to enter it. Banishment was pronounced upon Smur without opposition. He was. Forbidden to remain in Skane, he was banished from wife and kindred, from hunting grounds, home, resting places, and retreats which he had hitherto owned, and he must tempt fortune in foreign lands, so that all foxes in Skane should know that Smur was outlawed in the district. The oldest of the foxes bit off his right earlap. As soon as this was done, all the young foxes began to yowl from bloodthirst and threw themselves on Smur. For him, there was no alternative except to take flight, and with all the young foxes in hot pursuit, he rushed away from Kullaberg. All this happened while black grouse and brown grouse were going on with their games, but these birds lose themselves so completely in their song that they neither hear nor see, nor had they permitted themselves to be disturbed. The forest birds' contest was barely over. Before the stags from Hackerberger came forward to show their wrestling game, there were several pairs of stags who fought at the same time. They rushed at each other with tremendous force, struck their antlers dashingly together so that their points were entangled, and tried to force each other backward. The heather heaths were torn up beneath their hoofs. The breath came like smoke from their nostrils. Out of their throats strained hideous bellowings, and the froth oozed down on their shoulders. On the knolls round and about, there was breathless silence while the skilled stag wrestlers clinched. In all, the animals' new emotions were awakened. Each and all 
felt courageous and strong, enlivened by returning powers, born again with the spring, sprightly and ready for all kinds of adventures. They felt no enmity towards each other, although everywhere wings were lifted, neck feathers raised and claws sharpened. If the stags from Hackerberger had continued another instant, a wild struggle would have arisen on the knolls, for all had been gripped with a burning desire to show that they too were full of life, because the winter's impotence was over and strength surged through their bodies. But the stags stopped wrestling just at the right moment, and instantly a whisper went from knoll to knoll. The cranes are coming. And then came the grey, dusk-clad birds with plumes in their wings and red feather ornaments on their necks. The big birds with their tall legs, their slender throats, their small heads, came gliding down the knoll with an abandon that was full of mystery. As they glided forward, they swung round, half flying, half dancing. With wings gracefully lifted, they moved with an inconceivable rapidity. There was something marvellous and strange about their dance. It was as though grey shadows had played a game, which the eye could scarcely follow. It was as if they had learned it from the mists that hover over desolate morasses. There was witchcraft in it. All those who had never before been on Kullerberg understood why the whole meeting took its name from the crane's dance. There was wildness in it, but yet the feeling which it awakened was a delicious longing. No one thought any more about struggling. Instead, both the winged and those who had no wings all wanted to raise themselves eternally, lift themselves above the clouds, seek that which was hidden beyond them, leave the oppressive body that dragged them down to earth and soar away toward the infinite. Such longing after the unattainable, after the hidden mysteries back of this life, the animals felt only once a year, and this was on the day when they beheld the great crane dance. Chapter 6 In Rainy Weather Wednesday, March 30th It was the first rainy day of the trip. As long as the wild geese had remained in the vicinity of Vom Lake, they had had beautiful weather. But on the day when they set out to travel farther north, it began to rain, and for several hours the boy had to sit on the gooseback, soaking wet and shivering with the cold. In the morning when they started, it had been clear and mild. The wild geese had flown high up in the air, evenly and without haste, with Akka at the head maintaining strict discipline, and the rest in two oblique lines back of her. They had not taken the time to shout any witty sarcasms to the animals on the ground, but, as it was simply impossible for them to keep perfectly silent, they sang out continually, in rhythm with the wing strokes, their usual coaxing call, Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. They all took part in this persistent calling, and only stopped now and then to show the goosey gander the landmarks that they were travelling over. The places on this route included Linda Rudson's Dry Hills, Oversholm's Manor, Christian Stadt's Church Steeple, Bacchuscog's Royal Castle on the narrow isthmus between Oppmann's Lake and Ivo's Lake, and Reese Mountain's Steep Precipice. It had been a monotonous trip, and when the rain clouds made their appearance, the boy thought it was a real diversion. In the old days, when he had only seen a rain cloud from below, he'd imagined they were grey and disagreeable, but it was a very different thing to be up amongst them. And now he saw distinctly that the clouds were enormous carts, which drove through the heavens with sky-high loads. Some of them were piled up with huge grey sacks, some with barrels. Some were so large that they could hold a whole lake, and a few were filled with big utensils and bottles which were piled up to an immense height. And when so many of them had driven forward that they'd filled the whole sky, it appeared as though someone had given a signal, for all at once water commenced to pour down over the earth from utensils, barrels, bottles and sacks. Just as the first spring showers pattered against the ground, there arose such shouts of joy from all the small birds in groves and pastures that the whole air rang with them, and the boy leaped high where he sat. Now we'll have rain, 
Rain gives us spring. Spring gives us flowers and green leaves. Green leaves and flowers gives us worms and insects. Worms and insects gives us food. And plentiful and good food is the best thing there is sang the birds. The wild geese, too, were glad of the rain which came to awaken the growing things from their long sleep and to drive holes in the ice roofs on the lakes. They were not able to keep up that seriousness any longer, but began to send merry calls over the neighbourhood. When they flew over the big potato patches, which are so plentiful in the country around Christianstadt, and which still lay bare and black, they screamed, "'Wake up and be useful. Here comes something that will awaken you. You have idled long enough now.' When they saw people who hurried to get out of the rain, they reproved them, saying, Why are you in such a hurry about? Can't you see that it's raining rye loaves and cookies? It was a big, thick mist that moved northward briskly and followed close upon the geese. They seemed to think that they dragged the mist along with them, and just now, when they saw great orchards beneath them, they called out proudly, Here we come with anemones, here we come with roses, here we come with apple blossoms and cherry buds. Here we come with peas and beans and turnips and cabbages. He who wills can take them. He who wills can take them. Thus it had sounded while the first showers fell, and when all were still glad of the rain. But when it continued to fall the whole afternoon, the wild geese grew impatient and cried to the thirsty forests around Ivo's Lake, Haven't you got enough yet? Haven't you got enough yet? The heavens were still growing greyer and greyer, and the sun hid itself so well that one couldn't imagine where it was. The rain fell faster and faster, and beat harder and harder against the wings as it tried to find its way beneath the oily outside feathers into their skins. The earth was hidden by fogs, lakes, mountains and woods floated together in an indistinct maze, and the landmarks could not be distinguished. The flight became slower and slower, and the joyful cries were hushed, and the boy felt the cold more and more keenly. But still he had kept up his courage as long as he had ridden through the air, and in the afternoon, when they had lighted under a little stunted pine in the middle of a large morass where all was wet and all was cold, where some knolls were covered with snow and others stood up naked in a puddle of half-melted ice water, even then he had not felt discouraged, but ran about in fine spirits and hunted for cranberries and frozen wattleberries. But then came evening, and darkness sank down on them so close that not even such eyes as the boys could see through it, and all the wilderness became so strangely grim and awful. The boy lay tucked in under the goosey gander's wing, but could not sleep because he was cold and wet. He heard such a lot of rustling and rattling and stealthy steps and menacing voices that he was terror-stricken and didn't know where he should go. He must go somewhere where there was light and heat if he wasn't going to be entirely scared to death. If I should venture where there are human beings just for this night, thought the boy, only so I could sit by a fire for a moment and get a little food, I could go back to the wild geese before sunrise. He crept from under the wing and slid down to the ground. He didn't awaken either the goosey gander or any of the other geese, but stole silently and unobserved through the morass. He didn't know exactly where on earth he was, if he was in Skane or Smoland or in Blekinge, but just before he had gotten down on the morass he had caught a glimpse of a large village, and thither he directed his steps. It wasn't long either before he discovered a road, and soon he was on the village street which was long and had planted trees on both sides and was bordered with garden after garden. The boy had come to one of the big cathedral towns which are so common on the uplands, but can hardly be seen at all down in the plain. The houses were of wood and very prettily constructed. Most of them had gables and fronts, edged with carved mouldings and glass doors, with here and there a coloured pane opening on verandas. The walls were painted in light oil colours. The doors and window frames shone in blue and green, and even in red. While the boy walked about and viewed the houses, he could hear all the way out to the road how the people who sat in the warm cottages 
chatted and laughed. The words he could not distinguish, but he thought it was just lovely to hear human voices. I wonder what they would say if I knocked and begged to be let in, thought he. This was, of course, what he had intended to do all along, but now that he saw the lighted windows, his fear of the darkness was gone. Instead, he felt again the shyness which always came over him now when he was near human beings. I'll take a look around town for a while longer, thought he, before I ask anyone to take me in. On one house there was a balcony, and just as the boy walked by, the doors were thrown open, and a yellow light streamed through the fine, sheer curtains. Then a pretty young fru came out on the balcony and leaned over the railing. It's raining, now we shall soon have spring, said she. When the boy saw her, he felt a strange anxiety. It was as though he wanted to weep. For the first time he was a bit uneasy, because he had shut himself out from the humankind. Shortly after that he walked by a shop. Outside the shop stood a red corn drill. He stopped and looked at it, and finally crawled up to the driver's place and seated himself. When he had got there he smacked with his lips and pretended that he sat and drove. He thought what fun it would be to be permitted to drive such a pretty machine over a grain field. For a moment he forgot what he was like now. Then he remembered it and jumped down quickly from the machine. Then a greater unrest came over him. After all, human beings were very wonderful and clever. He walked by the post office, and then he thought of all the newspapers which came every day, with news from all the four corners of the earth. He saw the apothecary's shop and the doctor's home, and he thought about the power of human beings, which was so great that they were able to battle with sickness and death. He came to the church, then he thought how human beings had built it, that they might hear about another world than the one in which they lived, of God, and the resurrection and eternal life. And the longer he walked there, the better he liked human beings. It is so with children, that they never think any farther ahead than the length of their noses. That which lies nearest them they want promptly, without caring what it may cost them. Nils Holgersen had not understood what he was losing when he chose to remain an elf, but now he began to be dreadfully afraid that perhaps he should never again get back to his right form. Now, in all the world, should he go to work in order to become human? Ah, this he wanted so much to know. He crawled up on a doorstep and seated himself in the pouring rain and meditated. He sat there one whole hour, two whole hours, and he thought so hard that his forehead lay in furrows, but he was none the wiser. It seemed as though the thoughts only rolled round and round in his head. The longer he sat there, the more impossible it seemed to him to find any solution. This thing is certainly much too difficult for one who has learned as little as I have he thought at last. It will probably wind up by me having to go back among human beings after all. I must ask the minister and the doctor and the schoolmaster and others who are learned and may know a cure for such things. This he concluded that he would do at once and shook himself, for he was as wet as a dog that has been in a water pool. Just about then he saw that a big owl came flying along and alighted on one of the trees that bordered the village street. The next instant, a lady owl who sat under the cornice of the house began to call out, Give it, give it, are you at home again, Mr. Grey Owl? What kind of time did you have abroad? Thank you, Lady Brown Owl. I had a very comfortable time, said the Grey Owl. Has anything out of the ordinary happened here at home during my absence? Not here in Black Inge, Mr. Grey Owl, but in Skane a marvellous thing has happened. A boy has been transformed by an elf into a goblin no bigger than a squirrel, and since then he has gone to Lapland with a tame goose. That's a remarkable bit of news, a remarkable bit of news. Can he never be human again, Lady Brown Owl? Can he never be human again? That's a secret, Mr. Grey Owl, but you shall hear it just the same. The elf has said that if the boy watches over the goosey gander so that he comes home safe and sound and... What more, Lady Brown Owl? What more? What more? 
Fly with me up to the church tower, Mr. Grey Owl, and you shall hear this whole story. I fear there may be someone listening down here on the street. With that, the owls flew their way. But the boy flung his cap in the air and shouted, If I only watch over the goosey gander so that he gets back safe and sound, then I shall become a human being again. Hurrah! Hurrah! Then I shall become a human being again. He shouted hurrah until it was strange that they did not hear him in the houses, but they didn't. And he hurried back to the wild geese out in the wet morass as fast as his legs could carry him. Chapter 7 The Stairway with the Three Steps Thursday, March 31st The following day the wild geese intended to travel northward through Albo district in Smallland. They sent Ixie and Caxi to spy out the land, but when they returned they said that all the water was frozen and all the land was snow-covered. We may as well remain where we are, said the wild geese. We cannot travel over a country where there is neither water nor food. If we remain where we are, we may have to wait here until the next moon, said Akka. It is better to go eastward through Blekinch and see if we can't get a small land by way of Moor, which lies near the coast and has an early spring. Thus the boy came to ride over Blekinch the next day. Now that it was light again, he was in a merry mood once more and could not comprehend what had come over him the night before. He certainly didn't want to give up the journey and the outdoor life now. There lay a thick fog over Blekinge, and the boy couldn't see how it looked out there. I wonder if it's a good or a poor country that I'm riding over, thought he, and tried to search his memory for the things that he had heard about the country at school. But at the same time, he knew well enough that this was useless, as he'd never been in the habit of studying his lessons. At once, the boy saw the whole school before him. The children sat by the little desks and raised their hands. The teacher sat in the lectern and looked displeased, and he himself stood before the map and should answer some question about Blekinge. But he hadn't a word to say. The schoolmaster's face grew darker and darker for every second that passed, and the boy thought the teacher was more particular that they should know their geography than anything else. Now he came down from the lectern, took the pointer from the boy and sent him back to his seat. This won't end well, the boy thought then. But the schoolmaster had gone over to a window and had stood there for a moment and looked out, and then he had whistled to himself once. Then he had gone up into the lectern and said that he would tell them something about Blekinge, and that which he then talked about had been so amusing that the boy had listened. When he only stopped and thought for a moment, he remembered every word. A small land is a tall house with spruce trees on the roof, said the teacher, and leading up to it is a broad stairway with three big steps, and this stairway is called Blekinge. It is a stairway that is well constructed. It stretches 42 miles along the frontage of Smallland House, and anyone who wishes to go all the way down to the East Sea by way of the stairs has 24 miles to wander. A good time must have elapsed since the stairway was built. Both days and years have gone by since the steps were hewn from grey stones and laid down, evenly and smoothly, for a convenient track between Smallland and the East Sea. Since the stairway is so old, one can, of course, understand that it doesn't look just the same now as it did when it was new. I don't know how much they trout such matters at the time, but as big as it was, no broom could have kept it clean. After a couple of years, moss and lichen began to grow on it. In the autumn, dry leaves and dry grass blew down over it, and in the spring it was piled up with falling stones and gravel and as all these things were left there to mould, they finally gathered so much soil on the steps that not only herbs and grass, but even bushes and trees could take root there. But at the same time, a great disparity has arisen between the three steps. The topmost step, which lies nearest Smallland, is mostly covered with poor soil and small stones, and no trees except birches and bird cherry and spruce, which can stand the cold on the heights and are satisfied with little, can thrive up there. One understands best how poor and dry it is there 
when one sees how small the field pots are that are ploughed up from the forest lands and how many little cabins the people build for themselves and how far it is between the churches. But on the middle step there is better soil and it does not lie bound down under such severe cold either. This one can see at a glance since the trees are both higher and of finer quality. There you'll find maple and oak and linden and weeping birch and hazel trees growing, but no cone trees to speak of. And it is still more noticeable because of the amount of cultivated land that you will find there, and also because the people have built themselves great and beautiful houses. On the middle step there are many churches with large towns around them, and in every way it makes a better and finer appearance than the top step. But the very lowest step is the best of all. It is covered with good rich soil, and where it lies and bathes in the sea, it hasn't the slightest feeling of the small and chill. Beeches and chestnut and walnut trees thrive down there, and they grow so big that they tower above the church roofs. Here lie also the largest grain fields, but the people have not only timber and farming to live upon, but they are also occupied with fishing and trading and seafaring. For this reason, you will find the most costly residences and the prettiest churches here, and the parishes have developed into villages and cities. But this is not all that is said of the three steps, for one must realise that when it rains on the roof of the big Smolland house, or when the snow melts up there, the water has to go somewhere, and then naturally a lot of it is spilled over the big stairway. In the beginning, it probably oozed over the whole stairway, big as it was. Then cracks appeared in it, and gradually the water has accustomed itself to flow alongside of it in well-dug-out grooves. And water is water, whatever one does with it. It never has any rest. In one place it cuts and files away, and in another it adds to. Those grooves it has dug into vales, and the walls of the vales it has decked with soil, and bushes and trees and vines have clung to them ever since, so thick and in such profusion that they almost hide the stream of water that finds its way down there in the deep. But when the streams come to the landings between the steps, they throw themselves headlong over them. This is why the water comes with such a seething rush that it gathers strength with which to move mill wheels and machinery. These two have sprung up by every waterfall. But this does not tell all that is said of the land with the three steps. It must also be told that up in the big house in Smallland there lived once upon a time a giant who had grown very old, and it fatigued him in his extreme age to be forced to walk down that long stairway in order to catch salmon from the sea. To him it seemed much more suitable that the salmon should come up to him where he lived. Therefore he went up on the roof of his great house, and there he stood and threw stones down into the East Sea. He threw them with such force that they flew over the whole of Bleckinge and dropped into the sea. And when the stones came down, the salmon got so scared that they came up from the sea and fled toward the Bleckinge streams, ran through the rapids, flung themselves with high heaps over the waterfalls, and stopped. How true this is, one can see, by the number of islands and points that lie along the coast of Bleckinge, and which are nothing in the world but the big stones that the giant threw. One can also tell, because the salmon always go up in the Bleckinge streams and work their way up through rapids and still water all the way to Smallland. That giant is worthy of great thanks and for salmon in the streams and stone cutting on the island that means work which gives food to many of them, even to this day. Chapter 8 By Ronneby River Friday, April 1st Neither the wild geese nor Smur Fox had believed that they should ever run across each other after they had left Skane, but now it turned out so that the wild geese happened to take the route over Bleckinge, and thither Smur Fox had also gone. So far he had kept himself in the northern parts of the province, and since he had not as yet seen any manor parks or hunting grounds filled with game and dainty young deer, he was more disgruntled than he could say. One afternoon, when Smur tramped around in the desolate forest district of Mellon Bugden, not far from Monaby River, 
he saw a flock of wild geese fly through the air. Instantly, he observed that one of the geese was white, and then he knew, of course, with whom he had to deal. Smur began immediately to hunt the geese, just as much for the pleasure of getting a good square meal as for the desire to be avenged for all the humiliation that they had heaped upon him. He saw that they flew eastward until they came to Ronneby River. Then they changed their course and followed the river toward the south. He understood that they intended to seek a sleeping place along the river banks, and he thought that he should be able to get hold of a pair of them without much trouble. But when Smur finally discovered the place where the wild geese had taken refuge, he observed they had chosen such a well-protected spot that he couldn't get near. Ronneby River isn't any big or important body of water. Nevertheless, it is just as much talked of for the sake of its pretty shores. At several points, it forces its way forward between steep mountain walls that stand upright out of the water and are entirely overgrown with honeysuckle and bird cherry, mountain ash and osier, and there isn't much that can be more delightful than to row out on the little dark river on a pleasant summer day and look upward on all the soft green that fastens itself to the rugged mountain skies. But now, when the wild geese and smur came to the river, it was cold and blustery spring winter. All the trees were nude, and there was probably no one who thought the least little bit about whether the shore was ugly or pretty. The wild geese thanked their good fortune that they had found a sand strip large enough for them to stand upon on a steep mountain wall. In front of them rushed the river, which was strong and violent in the snow-melting time, and behind them they had an impassable mountain rock wall, and overhanging branches screened them. They couldn't have it better. The geese were asleep instantly, but the boy couldn't get a wink of sleep. As soon as the sun had disappeared, he was seized with a fear of the darkness and a wilderness terror, and he longed for human beings. Where he lay, tucked in under the goose wing, he could see nothing and only hear a little, and he thought if any harm came to the goosey gander, he couldn't save him. Noises and rustlings were heard from all directions, and he grew so uneasy that he had to creep from under the wing and seat himself on the ground beside the goose. Long-sighted Smur stood on the mountain summit and looked down upon the wild geese. "'You may as well give this pursuit up first as last,' he said to himself. "'You can't climb such a steep mountain. You can't swim in such a wild torrent.' and there isn't the tiniest strip of land below the mountain which leads to the sleeping place. Those geese are too wise for you, and don't ever bother yourself again to hunt them. But Smur, like all foxes, had found it hard to give up an undertaking already begun, and so he lay down on the extremest point of the mountain edge and did not take his eyes off the wild geese. While he lay and watched them, he thought of all the harm they had done him. Yes, it was their fault that he had been driven from Skane and had been obliged to move to poverty-stricken Breckinge. He worked himself up to such a pitch as he lay there that he wished the wild geese were dead, even if he himself should not have the satisfaction of eating them. When Smur's resentment had reached this height, he heard rasping in a large pine that grew close to him, and saw a squirrel come down from the tree, hotly pursued by a marten. Neither of them noticed Smur, and he sat quietly and watched the chase, which went from tree to tree. He looked at the squirrel, which moved among the branches as lightly as though he'd been able to fly. He looked at the marten, who was not as skilled at climbing as the squirrel, but who still ran up and along the branches just as securely as if they'd even been paths in the forest. If I could only climb half as well as either of them, thought the fox, those things down there wouldn't sleep in peace very long. As soon as the squirrel had been captured and the chase was ended, Smur walked over to the marten, but stopped two steps away from him to signify that he did not wish to cheat him of his prey. He greeted the marten in a very friendly manner and wished him good luck with his catch. Smur chose his words well, as foxes always do. The marten, on the contrary, who, with his long and slender body and head, his soft skin and his light brown neck piece, 
looked like a little marvel of beauty, but in reality was nothing but a crude forest dweller, hardly answered him. "'It surprises me,' said Smur, "'that such a fine hunter as you are should be satisfied with chasing squirrels, when there is much better game within reach.' Here he paused, but when the martin only grinned impudently at him, he continued, "'Can it be possible that you haven't seen the wild geese that stand under the mountain wall, or are you not a good enough climber to get down to them?' This time he had no need to wait for an answer. The martin rushed up to him with back bent, and every separate hair on end. "'Have you seen wild geese?' he hissed. "'Where are they? Tell me instantly, or I'll bite your neck off.' "'No, you must remember that I'm twice your size, so be a little polite. I ask nothing better than to show you the wild geese.' The next instant the martin was on his way down the steep, and while Smur sat and watched how he swung his snake-like body from branch to branch, he thought, "'That pretty tree-hunter has the wickedest heart in all the forest.' I believe the wild geese will have me to thank for a bloody awakening. But just as Smur was waiting to hear the geese's death rattle, he saw the martin tumble from branch to branch and plump into the river so the water splashed high. Soon thereafter wings beat loudly and strongly, and all the geese went up in a hurried flight. Smur intended to hurry after the geese, but he was so curious to know how they had been saved that he sat there until the martin came clambering up. That poor thing was soaked in mud and stopped every now and then to rub his head with his forepaws. Now wasn't that just what I thought, that you were a booby and would go and tumble in the river, said Smur contemptuously. I haven't acted boobishly. You don't need to scold me, said the martin. I sat already on one of the lowest branches and thought how I should manage to tear a whole lot of geese to pieces when a little creature no bigger than a squirrel jumped up and threw a stone at my head with such force that I fell into the water and before I had time to pick myself up. The martin didn't have time to say any more. He had no audience. Smur was already a long way off in pursuit of the wild geese. In the meantime, Akka had flown southward in search of a new sleeping place. There was still a little daylight, and beside, the half-moon stood high in the heavens so that she could see a little. Luckily, she was well acquainted in these parts, because it had happened more than once that she had been wind-driven to Bleckinge when she travelled over the East Sea in the spring. She followed the river as long as she saw it, winding through the moonlit landscape like a black, shining snake. In this way she came way down to Jupifor, where the river first hides itself in an underground channel, and then clear and transparent as though it were made of glass, rushes down in a narrow cleft and breaks into bits against its bottom in glittering drops and flying foam. Below the white falls lay a few stones between which the water rushed away in a wild torrent cataract. Here Mother Acker alighted. This was another good sleeping place, especially this late in the evening, when no human beings moved about. At sunset the geese would hardly have been able to camp there, for Jupa Falls does not lie in any wilderness. On one side of the falls is a paper factory, on the other, which is steep and tree-grown, is Jupidor's Park, where people are always strolling about on the steep and slippery paths to enjoy the wild stream's rushing movement down in the ravine. It was about the same here as at the former place. None of the travellers thought the least little bit that they had come to a pretty and well-known place. They thought rather that it was ghastly and dangerous to stand and sleep on slippery wet stones in the middle of a rumbling waterfall. But they had to be content, if only they were protected from carnivorous animals. The geese fell asleep instantly, while the boy could find no rest in sleep, but sat beside them that he might watch over the goosey ander. After a while, Smur came running along the river shore. He spied the geese immediately where they stood out in the foaming whirlpools, and understood that he couldn't get at them here either. Still, he couldn't make up his mind to abandon them, but seated himself on the shore and looked at them. He felt 
very much humbled and thought that his entire reputation as a hunter was at stake. All of a sudden, he saw an otter come creeping up from the falls with a fish in his mouth. Smur approached him, but stopped within two steps of him to show him that he didn't wish to take his game from him. "'You're a remarkable one who can content yourself with catching a fish "'while the stones are covered with geese,' said Smur. "'He was so eager that he hadn't taken the time "'to arrange his words as carefully as he was wont to do. "'The otter didn't turn his head once in the direction of the river. "'He was a vagabond, like all otters, "'and had fished many times by Vom Lake, "'and probably knew Smur Fox.' "'I know very well how you act when you want to coax away a salmon trout, Smur,' said he. "'Oh, is it you, Gripe?' said Smur, and was delighted, for he knew that this particular otter was a quick and accomplished swimmer. "'I don't wonder that you do not care to look at the wild geese, since you can't manage to get out to them.' But the otter, who had swimming webs between his toes and a stiff tail, which was as good as an oar, and a skin that was waterproof, didn't wish to have it said of him that there was a waterfall that he wasn't able to manage. He turned toward the stream, and as soon as he caught sight of the wild geese, he threw the fish away and rushed down the steep shore and into the river. If it had been a little later in the spring, so that the nightingales in Jupifor had been at home, they would have sung for many a day of Gripe's struggle with the rapid, for the otter was thrust back by the waves many times and carried down river. But he fought his way steadily up again. He swam forward in still water. He crawled over stones and gradually came nearer the wild geese. It was a perilous trip, which might well have earned the right to be sung by the nightingales. Smur followed the otter's course with his eyes as well as he could. At last he saw that the otter was in the act of climbing up to the wild geese. But just then it shrieked shrill and wild. The otter tumbled backward into the water and dashed away as if he'd been a blind kitten. An instant later there was a great crackling of geese's wings. They raised themselves and flew away to find another sleeping place. The otter soon came on land. He said nothing but commenced to lick one of his forepaws. When Smur sneered at him, because he hadn't succeeded, he broke out. It was not the fault of my swimming art, Smur. I had raced all the way over to the geese and was about to climb up to them, when a tiny creature came running and jabbed me in the foot with some sharp iron. It hurt so I lost my footing, and then the current took me. He didn't have to say any more. Smur was already far away on his way to the wild geese. Once again... Akka and her flock had to take a night fly. Fortunately, the moon had not gone down, and with the aid of its light, she succeeded in finding another of those sleeping places which she knew in that neighbourhood. Again, she followed the shining river toward the south, over Jupiter's manor and over Ronneby's dark roofs and white waterfalls. She swayed forward without alighting. But a little south of the city, and not far from the sea, lies Ronneby Health Spring, with its bathhouse and spring house, with its big hotel and summer cottages for the spring's guests. All these stand empty and desolate in winter, which the birds knew perfectly well, and many are the bird companies who seek shelter on the deserted buildings, balustrades and balconies during hard storm times. Here, the wild geese lit on a balcony, and as usual, they fell asleep at once. And the boy, on the contrary, could not sleep, because he hadn't cared to creep in under the goosey gander's wing. The balcony faced south, so the boy had an outlook over the sea, and since he could not sleep, he sat there and saw how pretty it looked when sea and land meet here in Bleckinge. You see that sea and land can meet in many different ways. In many places the land comes down toward the sea, with flat, tufted meadows, and the sea meets the land with flying sand, which piles up in mounds and drifts. It appears as though they both disliked each other so much that they only wished to show the poorest they possessed. It can also happen that when the land comes towards the sea, it raises a wall of hills in front of it, as though the sea was something dangerous. 
When the land does this, the sea comes up to it with fiery wrath and beats and roars and lashes against the rocks and looks as if it would tear the land hill to pieces. But in Blekinj it is altogether different when sea and land meet. There the land breaks itself up into points and islands and islets, and the sea divides itself into fjords and bays and sounds. And it is, perhaps, this which makes it look as if they must meet in happiness and harmony. Think now, first and foremost, of the sea. Far out it lies, desolate and empty and big, and has nothing else to do but to roll its grey billows. When it comes toward the land, it happens across the first obstacle. This it immediately overpowers, tears away everything green, and makes it as grey as itself. Then it meets still another obstacle. With this it does the same thing, and still another. Yes, the same thing happens to this also. It is stripped and plundered, as if it had fallen into robbers' hands. Then the obstacles come nearer and nearer together, and then the sea must understand that the land sends toward it her littlest children in order to move it to pity. It also becomes more friendly the farther in it comes, rolls its waves less high, moderates its storms, lets the green thing stay in cracks and crevices, separates itself into small sounds and inlets, and becomes at last so harmless in the land that little boats dare venture out on it. It certainly cannot recognise itself so mild and friendly as it grown. And then think of the hillside. It lies uniform and looks the same almost everywhere. It consists of flat grain fields, with one and another birch grove between them, or else of long stretches of forest ranges. It appears as if it had thought about nothing but grain and turnips and potatoes and spruce and pine, and then comes a sea fjord that cuts far into it. It doesn't mind that, but borders it with birch and alder, just as if it was an ordinary fresh water lake. And then still another wave comes driving in, nor does the hillside bother itself about cringing to this, but it too gets the same covering as the first one. Then the fjord begins to broaden and separate. They break up fields and woods, and then the hillside cannot help but notice them. I believe it is the sea itself that is coming, says the hillside, and then it begins to adorn itself. It wreathes itself with blossoms, travels up and down in hills and throws islands into the sea. It no longer cares about pines and spruces, but casts them off like old everyday clothes, and parades later with big oaks and lindens and chestnuts, and with blossoming leafy bowers, and becomes as gorgeous as a manor park. And when it meets the sea, it is so changed that it doesn't know itself. All this one cannot see very well until summer time. But, at any rate, the boy observed how mild and friendly nature was, and he began to feel calmer than he had been before that night. And then suddenly he heard a sharp and ugly yowl from the bathhouse park, and when he stood up he saw in the white moonlight a fox standing on the pavement under the balcony. For Smur had followed the wild geese once more. But when he had found the place where they were quartered, he had understood that it was impossible to get at them in any way, when he had not been able to keep from yowling with chagrin. When the fox yowled in this manner, old Akka, the leader goose, was awakened. Although she could see nothing, she thought she recognised the voice. "'Is it you who are out tonight, Smur?' said she. "'Yes,' said Smur. "'It is I, and I want to ask what you geese think of the night that I have given you.' "'Do you mean to say that it is you who have sent the marten and the otter against us?' asked Akka. "'A good turn shouldn't be denied,' said Smur. "'You once played the goose game with me. "'Now I have begun to play the fox game with you, "'and I'm not inclined to let up on it so long as a single one of you still lives, "'even if I have to follow you the world over.' "'You, Smur, ought... "'to at least think whether it is right for you, "'who are weaponed with both teeth and claws "'to hound us in this way, "'we who are without defence, said Akka. 
Smur thought that Akka sounded scared, and he said quickly, If you, Akka, will take that thumby tot who has so often opposed me and throw him down to me, I promise to make peace with you. Then I'll never more pursue you or any of yours. I am not going to give you thumby tot, said Akka. From the youngest of us to the oldest, we would willingly give our lives for his sake. Since you are so fond of him, said Smur, I promise you that he shall be the first among you that I will wreak vengeance upon. Akka said no more, and after Smur had sent up a few more yowls, all was still. The boy lay all the while awake. Now it was Akka's words to the fox that prevented him from sleeping. Never had he dreamed that he should hear anything so great as that anyone was willing to risk life for his sake. From that moment it could no longer be said of Nils Holgersen that he did not care for anyone. Chapter 9 Karl's Krona Saturday, April 2nd it was a moonlight evening in Karlskrona, calm and beautiful, but earlier in the day there had been rain and wind, and the people must have thought that the bad weather still continued, for hardly one of them had ventured out on the streets. While the city lay there so desolate, Akka, the wild goose, and her flock came flying toward it over Vemmen and Pantahomen. They were out in the late evening to seek a sleeping place on the islands. They couldn't remain inland because they were disturbed by Smurf Fox wherever they lighted. When the boy rode along high up in the air and looked at the sea and the islands which spread themselves before him, he thought that everything appeared so strange and spook-like. The heavens were no longer blue but encased him like a globe of green glass. The sea was milk-white and as far as he could see rolled small white waves tipped with silver ripples. In the midst of all this white lay numerous little islets, absolutely coal-black. Whether they were big or little, whether they were as even as meadows or full of cliffs, they looked just as black. Even dwelling-houses and churches and windmills, which at other times were white or red, were outlined in black against the green sky. The boy thought it was as if the earth had been transformed and he was come to another world. He thought that just for this one night he wanted to be brave and not afraid when he saw something that really frightened him, which was covered with big angular blocks, and between the blocks shone specks of bright shining gold. He couldn't keep from thinking of Magglestone by Troll Lungby, which the trolls sometimes raised upon high gold pillars, and he wondered if this was something like that. But with the stones and the gold it might have gone fairly well if such a lot of horrid things had not been lying all around the island. It looked like whales and sharks and other big sea monsters, but the boy understood that it was the sea trolls who had gathered around the island and intended to crawl up on it to fight with the land trolls who lived there, and those on the land were probably afraid, for he saw how a big giant stood on the highest point of the island and raised his arms as if in despair over all the misfortune that should come to him on his island. The boy was not a little terrified when he noticed that Akka began to descend right over that particular island. No, for pity's sake, we must not lighten there, said he. But the geese continued to descend, and soon the boy was astonished that he could have seen things so awry. In the first place, the big stone blocks were nothing but houses. The whole island was a city, and the shining gold specks were street lamps and lighted window panes. The giant, who stood highest up on the island and raised his arms, was a church with two cross towers. All the sea trolls and monsters which he thought he'd seen were boats and ships of every description that lay anchored all around the island. On the side which lay toward the land were mostly rowboats and sailboats and small coast steamers. But on the side that faced the sea lay armour-clad battleships. Some were broad with very thick, slanting smokestacks. Others were long and narrow and so constructed that they could glide through the water like fishes. Now, what city might this be? That the boy could figure out, because he saw all the battleships. All his life he had loved ships, although he had had nothing to do with any, except the galleys which he had sailed in the road ditches. He knew very well that this city, where so many battleships lay, couldn't be any place but Karl's Krona. The boy's grandfather had been an old marine, and as long as he had lived he'd talked of Karl's Krona every day. 
of the great warship dock and of all the other things to be seen in that city. The boy felt perfectly at home, and he was glad that he should see all this of which he had heard so much. But he only had a glimpse of the towers and fortifications which barred the entrance to the harbour and many buildings in the shipyard before Ack came down on one of the flat church towers. This was a pretty safe place for those who wanted to get away from a fox, and the boy began to wander if he couldn't venture to crawl in under the goosey gander's wing for this one night. Yes, that he might safely do. It would do him good to get a little sleep. He should try to see a little more of the dock and the ships after it had grown light. The boy himself thought it was strange that he could keep still and wait until the next morning to see the ships. He certainly had not slept five minutes before he slipped out from under the wing and slid down the lightning rod and the water spout all the way to the ground. Soon he stood on a big square which spread itself in front of the church. It was covered with round stones and was just as difficult for him to travel over as it is for big people to walk on a tufted meadow. Those who are accustomed to live in the open or way out in the country always feel uneasy when they come into a city where the houses stand straight and forbidding and the streets are open so that everyone can see what goes there. And it happened in the same way with the boy. When he stood on the big Karlskrona Square and looked at the German church and town hall and the cathedral from which he had just descended, he couldn't do anything but wish that he was back on the tower again with the geese. It was a lucky thing that the square was entirely deserted. There wasn't a human being about, unless he counted a statue that stood high on a pedestal. The boy gazed long at the statue, which represented a big, brawny man in a three-cornered hat, long waistcoat, knee breeches, and coarse shoes, and wondered what kind of a one he was. He held a long stick in his hand, and he looked as if he would know how to make use of it too, for he had an awfully severe countenance with a big hooked nose and an ugly mouth. "'What is that long-lipped thing doing here?' said the boy at last. He had never felt so small and insignificant as he did that night. He tried to jolly himself up a bit by saying something audacious. Then he thought no more about the statue, but betook himself to a wide street which led down to the sea. But the boy hadn't gone far before he heard that someone was following him. Someone was walking behind him, who stamped on the stone pavement with heavy footsteps and pounded on the ground with a hard stick. It sounded as if the bronze man up in the square had gone out for a promenade. The boy listened after the steps while he ran down the street, and he became more and more convinced that it was the bronze man. The ground trembled and the houses shook. It couldn't be anyone but he who walked so heavily, and the boy grew panic-stricken when he thought of what he had just said to him. He did not dare to turn his head to find out if it really was he. "'Perhaps he's only out walking for recreation,' thought the boy. "'Surely he can't be offended with me for the words I spoke. They were not all badly meant.' Instead of going straight on and trying to get down to the dock, the boy turned into a side street which led east. First and foremost, he wanted to get away from the one who tramped after him. But the next instant he heard that the bronze man had switched off to the same street, and then the boy was so scared that he didn't know what he would do with himself, and how hard it was to find any hiding places in a city where all the gates are closed. Then he saw on his right an old frame church, which lay a short distance away from the street, in the centre of a large grove. Not an instant did he pause to consider but rushed on toward the church. If I could only get there, then I'll surely be shielded from all harm, thought he. As he ran forward, he suddenly caught sight of a man who stood on a gravel path and beckoned to him. There is certainly someone who will help me, thought the boy. He became intensely happy and hurried off in that direction. He was actually so frightened that the heart of him fairly thumped in his breast. But when he came up to the man who stood on the edge of the gravel path upon a low pedestal, he was absolutely thunderstruck. "'Surely it can't have been that one who beckoned to me,' thought he, for he saw that the entire man was made of wood. He stood there and stared at him. He was a thick-set man on short legs, with a broad, ruddy countenance, shiny black hair and full black beard. On his head he wore a wooden hat, on his body a brown wooden coat, around his waist a black wooden belt. On his legs he had wide wooden knee-breeches and wooden stockings, and on his feet black wooden shoes. He was newly painted and newly varnished, so that he glistened and shone in the moonlight. This undoubtedly had a good deal to do with giving him such a good-natured appearance that the boy at once placed confidence in him. 
In his left hand he held a wooden slate, and there the boy read, Most humbly, I beg of you, though voice I may lack, come drop a penny, do, but lift my hat. Oh, the man was only a poor box. The boy felt that he'd been done. He had expected that this should be something really remarkable, and now he remembered that Grandpa had also spoken of the wooden man, and said that all the children in Carl's Krona were so fond of him, and that must have been true, for he too found it hard to part with the wooden man. He had something so old-timey about him that one could well take him to be many hundred years old, and at the same time he looked so strong and bold and animated, just as one might imagine that folk looked in the olden times. The boy had so much fun looking at the wooden man that he entirely forgot the one from whom he was fleeing. But now he heard him. He turned from the street and came into the churchyard. He followed him here too. Where should this boy go? Just then he saw the wooden man bend down to him and stretch forth his big, broad hand. It was impossible to believe anything but good of him, and with one jump the boy stood in his hand. The wooden man lifted him to his hat and stuck him under it. The boy was just hidden, and the wooden man had just got his arm in its right place again when the bronze man stopped in front of him and banged the stick on the ground, so that the wooden man shook on his pedestal. Thereupon the bronze man said in a strong and resonant voice, "'Who might this one be?' The wooden man's arm went up so that it creaked in the old woodwork, and he touched his hat brim as he replied, "'Rosenbaum, by your majesty's leave, once upon a time, boat swain on the man of war, Drisketon, after completed service, sexton at the Admiral's Church, and lately carved in wood and exhibited in the churchyard as a poor box. The boy gave a start when he heard the wooden man said, Your Majesty, for now when he thought about it, he knew that the statue on the square represented the one who had founded the city. It was probably no less than one Charles the Eleventh himself whom he had encountered. He gives a good account of himself, said the bronze man. Can he also tell me if he has seen a little brat who runs around in the city tonight? He is an impudent rascal. If I get hold of him, I'll teach him manners. With that, he again pounded on the ground with his stick and looked fearfully angry. Uh, by your majesty's leave, I have seen him, said the wooden man, and the boy was so scared that he commenced to shake where he sat under the hat and looked at the bronze man through a crack in the wood. But he calmed down when the wooden man continued, "'Your Majesty is on the wrong track. "'That youngster certainly intended to run into the shipyard "'and conceal himself there.' "'Does he say so, Rosenbaum? "'Well, then, don't stand still on the pedestal any longer, "'but come with me and help me find him. Four eyes are better than two, Rosenbaum.' "'But the wooden man answered in a doleful voice, "'I would most humbly beg to be permitted to stay where I am. "'I look well and sleek because of the paint.' but I'm old and mouldy, and cannot stand moving about. The bronze man was not one of those who liked to be contradicted. What sort of notions are these? Come along, Rosenbaum. Then he raised his stick and gave the other one a resounding whack on the shoulder. Does Rosenbaum not see that he holds together? With that, they broke off and walked forward on the streets of Karlskrona, large and mighty, until they came to a high gate which led to the shipyard. Just outside and on guard walked one of the navy's jacktars, but the bronze man strutted past him and kicked the gate open, without the jacktars pretending to notice it. As soon as they got into the shipyard, they saw before them a wide, expansive harbour, separated by pile bridges. In the different harbour basins lay the warships, which looked bigger and more awe-inspiring close to, like this, than lately when the boy had seen them from up above. Then it wasn't so crazy after all to imagine that they were sea trolls, thought he. Where does Rosenbaum think it is most advisable for us to begin the search? said the bronze man. Such as one as he could most easily conceal himself in the half of models, replied the wooden man. On a narrow land strip which stretched to the right from the gate all along the harbour lay ancient structures. The bronze man walked over to a building with low walls, small windows, and a conspicuous roof. He pounded on the door with his stick until it burst open, and tramped up a pair of worn-out steps. Soon they came into a large hall, which was filled with tackled and full-rigged little ships. The boy understood without being told that these were models for the ships which had been built for the Swedish navy. 
there were ships of many different varieties. There were old men of war whose sides bristled with cannon and which had high structures fore and aft, and their masts weighed down with a network of sails and ropes. There were small island boats with rowing benches along the sides. There were undecked cannon sloops and richly gilded frigates, which were models of the ones the kings had used on their travels. And finally, there were also the heavy, broad armour-plated ships with towers and cannon on deck, such as are in use nowadays, and narrow, shining torpedo boats, which resembled long, slender fishes. When the boy was carried around among all this, he was awed. Fancy that such big, splendid ships have been built here in Sweden, he thought to himself. He had plenty of time to see all that was to be seen there, for when the bronze man saw the models, he forgot everything else. He examined them all, from the first to the last, and asked about them. And Rosenbaum, the boat swain on the Dristigetten, told as much as he knew of the ship's builders, and of those who had manned them, and of the fates they had met. He told them about Chapman and Puke and Troll, of Hoagland and Svenskund, all the way along until 1809, after that, he had not been there. Both he and the bronze man had the most to say about the fine old wooden ships. The new battleships, they didn't exactly appear to understand. "'I can hear that Rosenbaum doesn't know anything about these new fangled things,' said the bronze man. "'Therefore, let us go and look at something else, for this amuses me, Rosenbaum.' By this time, he had entirely given up his search for the boy, who felt calm and secure where he sat in the wooden hat. Thereupon both men wandered through the big establishment, sail-making shops, anchor smithy, machine and carpenter shops. They saw the mast shears in the docks, the large magazines, the arsenal, the rope bridge, and the big discarded dock which had been blasted in the rock. They went out upon the pile bridges where the naval vessels lay moored, stepped on board and examined them like two old sea dogs, wondered, disapproved, approved, and became indignant. The boy sat in safety under the wooden hat, and heard all about how they had laboured and struggled in this place to equip the navies which had gone out from here. He heard how life and blood had been risked, how the last penny had been sacrificed to build the warships, how skilled men had strained all their powers in order to perfect these ships which had been their fatherland's safeguard. A couple of times the tears came to the boy's eyes as he heard all this. And the very last, they went into an open court, where the galley models of old men of war were grouped, and a more remarkable sight the boy had never beheld, for these models had inconceivably powerful and terror-striking faces. They were big, fearless and savage, filled with the same proud spirit that had fitted out the great ships. They were from another time than his. He thought that he shriveled up before them. But when they came in here, the bronze man said to the wooden man, Take off thy hat, Rosenbaum, for those that stand here, they have all fought for the fatherland. And Rosenbaum, like the bronze man, had forgotten why they'd begun this tramp. Without thinking, he lifted the wooden hat from his head and shouted, I take off my hat to the one who chose the harbour and founded the shipyard and recreated the navy, to the monarch who has awakened all this into life. Thanks, Rosenbaum. That was well spoken. Rosenbaum is a fine man. But what is this, Rosenbaum? For there stood Nils Holgersen, right on the top of Rosenbaum's bald pate. He wasn't afraid any longer, but raised his white toboggan hood and shouted, Hurrah for you, long lip! The bronze man struck the ground hard with his stick, but the boy never learned what he'd intended to do for now. The sun ran up, and at the same time, both the bronze man and the wooden man vanished, as if they'd been made of mists. While he stood and stared after them, the wild geese flew up from the church tower and swayed back and forth over the city. Instantly, they caught sight of Nils Holgersen, and then the big white one darted down from the sky and fetched him. Chapter 10 The Trip to Oland Sunday, April 3rd the wild geese went out on a wooded island to feed. There they happened to run across a few grey geese, who were surprised to see them, since they knew very well that their kinsmen, the wild geese, usually travel over the interior of the country. They were curious and inquisitive, and wouldn't be satisfied with less than that the wild geese should tell them all about the persecution which they had to endure from Smurfox. 
When they had finished, a grey goose, who appeared to be as old and as wise as Acker herself, said, "'It is a great misfortune for you that Smurfox was declared an outlaw in his own land. He'll be sure to keep his word and follow you all the way up to Lapland. If I were in your place, I shouldn't travel north over Smoland, but would take the outside route over Oland instead, so that he'll be thrown off the track entirely. To really mislead him, you must remain for a couple of days on Oland's southern point. There you'll find lots of food and lots of company. I don't believe you'll regret it if you go over there. It was certainly very sensible advice, and the wild geese concluded to follow it. As soon as they had eaten all they could hold, they started on the trip to Oland. None of them had ever been there before, but the grey goose had given them excellent directions. They only had to travel direct south until they came to a large bird track, which extended all along the Bleckinge coast. All the birds who had winter residences by the West Sea, and who now intended to travel to Finland and Russia, flew forward there, and, in passing, they were always in the habit of stopping at Oland to rest. The wild geese would have no trouble in finding guides. That day it was perfectly still and warm, like a summer's day. The best weather in the world for a sea trip. The only grave thing about it was that it was not quite clear, for the sky was grey and veiled. Here and there were enormous mist clouds which hung way down on the sea's outer edge and obstructed the view. When the travellers had got away from the wooded island, the sea spread itself so smooth and mirror-like that the boy, as he looked down through the water, had disappeared. There was no longer any earth under him. He had nothing but mist and sky around him. He grew very dizzy and held himself tight on the gooseback, more frightened than when he sat there for the first time. It seemed as though he couldn't possibly hold on. He must fall in some direction. It was even worse when they reached the big bird track of which the grey goose had spoken. Actually, there came flock after flock flying in exactly the same direction. They seemed to follow a fixed route. There were ducks and grey geese, surf scoters and guillemots and pintail ducks and mogansers and grebes and oyster catchers and sea grouse. But now, when the boy leaned forward and looked in the direction where the sea ought to lie, he saw the whole bird procession reflected in the water. But he was so dizzy that he didn't understand how this had come about. He thought that the whole bird procession flew with their bellies upside down. Still, he didn't wonder at this so much, for he did not himself know which was up and which was down. The birds were tired out and impatient to get on. None of them shrieked or said a funny thing, and this made everything seem peculiarly unreal. I think if we have travelled away from the earth, he said to himself, I think if we are on our way up to heaven. He saw nothing but mists and birds around him, and began to look upon it as reasonable that they were travelling heavenward. He was glad, and wondered what he should see up there. The dizziness passed all at once. He was so exceedingly happy at the thought that he was on his way to heaven, and was leaving this earth. And just about then, he heard a couple of loud shouts and saw two white smoke columns ascend. There was a sudden awakening and unrest among the birds. Hunters, hunters, they cried, fly high, fly away. Then the boy saw, finally, that they were travelling all the while over the sea coast, and they certainly were not in heaven. In a long row lay small boats filled with hunters who fired shot upon shot. The nearest bird flocks hadn't noticed them in time. They had flown too low. Several dark bodies sank down towards the sea, and for every one that fell there arose cries of anguish from the living. It was strange for one who had but lately believed himself in heaven to wake up suddenly to such fear and lamentation. Acker shot toward the heights as fast as she could, and the flock followed with the greatest possible speed. The wild geese got safely out of the way, but the boy couldn't get over his amazement. To think that anyone could wish to shoot upon such as Akka and Ixie and Caxi and the Goosey Gander and the others, human beings had no conception of what they did. So it bore on again in the still air, and everything was as quiet as heretofore, with the exception that some of the tired birds called out every now and then, Are we not there soon? Are you sure we're on the right track? Hereupon those who flew in the centre answered, We are flying straight to Oland, straight to Oland.
The grey geese were tied out, and the loons flew around them. "'Don't be in such a rush!' cried the ducks. "'You'll eat up all the food before we get there.' "'Oh, there'll be enough for both you and us,' answered the loons. And before they had got so far that they saw Oland, there came a light wind against them. It brought with it something that resembled immense clouds of white smoke, just as if there was a big fire somewhere. When the birds saw the first white spiral haze, they became uneasy and increased their speed. But that which resembled smoke blew thicker and thicker, and at last it enveloped them altogether. They smelled no smoke, and the smoke was not dark and dry, but white and damp. Suddenly the boy understood that it was nothing but a mist. When the mist became so thick that one couldn't see a goose length ahead, the birds began to carry on like real lunatics. All these who before had travelled forth in such a perfect order began to play in the mist. They flew hither and thither to entice one another astray. Look at these wagtails, rang out in the mist. They're going backwards to an old dwarf sea. Have a care, wild geese, shrieked someone from another direction. If you continue like this, you'll get clear up to Rugen. There was, of course, no danger that the birds who were accustomed to travel here would permit themselves to be lured in a wrong direction, but the ones who had a hard time of it were the wild geese. The jesters observed that they were uncertain as to the way, and did all they could to confuse them. "'Where do you intend to go, good people?' called a swan. He came right up to Akka, and looked sympathetic and serious. "'We shall travel to Orland, but we have never been there before,' said Akka. She thought that this was a bird to be trusted. "'It's too bad,' said the swan. "'They have lured you in the wrong direction. You are on the road to Blekinch. Now come with me, and I'll put you right.' And so he flew off with them, and when he had taken them so far away from the track that they heard no calls, he disappeared in the mist. They flew around for a while at random. They had barely succeeded in finding the birds again when a duck approached them. "'It's best that you lie down on the water until the mist clears,' said the duck. "'It's best that you lie down on the water until the mist clears,' said the duck. "'It is evident you are not accustomed to look out for yourselves on journeys.' These rogues succeeded in making Akka's head swim. As near as the boy could make out, the wild geese flew round and round for a long time. "'Be careful, can't you see that you're flying up and down?' shouted a loon as he rushed by. The boy positively clutched the goosey gander around the neck. This was something which he had feared for a long time. No one can tell when they would have arrived if they hadn't heard a rolling and muffled sound in the distance. Then Akka craned her neck snapped hard with her wings and rushed on at full speed. Now she had something to go by. The grey goose had told her not to light on Olin's southern point because there was a cannon there which the people used to shoot the mist with. Now she knew the way, and now no one in the world should lead her astray again. Chapter 11 Olin's Southern Point April 3rd to 6th on the most southerly part of Oland lies a royal domain, which is called Ottenby. It's a rather large estate which extends from shore to shore, straight across the land, and it is remarkable because it has always been a haunt for large bird companies. In the 17th century, when the kings used to go over Oland to hunt, the entire estate was nothing but a deer park. In the 18th century, there was a stud there where blooded racehorses were bred, and a sheep farm where several hundred sheep were maintained. In our days, you'll find neither blooded horses nor sheep at Ottenby. In place of them live great herds of young horses which are to be used by the cavalry. In all the land, there is certainly no place that could be a better abode for animals. Along the extreme eastern shore lies the old sheep meadow, which is a mile and a half long, and the largest meadow in all Oland, where animals can graze and play and run about, as free as if they were in a wilderness. And there you will find the celebrated Ottenby Grove, with the hundred-year-old oaks, which give shade from the sun and shelter from the severe Oland winds. And we must not forget the long Ottenby Wall, which stretches from shore to shore and separates Ottenby from the rest of the island, so that the animals may know how far the royal domain extends and be careful about getting in on other ground when they're not so well protected. You'll find plenty of tame animals at Ottenby, but that isn't all. 
One could almost believe that the wild ones also felt that on an old crown property, both the wild and the tame ones can count upon shelter and protection, since they venture there in such great numbers. Besides, there are still a few stags of the old descent left, and burrow ducks and partridges love to live there. And it offers a resting place in the spring and late summer for thousands of migratory birds. Above all, it is the swampy eastern shore below the sheep meadow where the migratory birds alight to rest and feed. When the wild geese and the Nils Holgersen had finally found their way to Holland, they came down, like all the rest, on the shore near the sheep meadow. The mist lay thick over the island, just as it had over the sea. But still the boy was amazed at all the birds which he discerned, only on the little narrow stretch of shore which he could see. It was a low sand shore with stones and pools and a lot of cast-up seaweed. If the boy had been permitted to choose, it isn't likely that he would have thought of alighting there. But the birds probably looked upon this as a veritable paradise. Ducks and geese walked about and fed on the meadow. Nearer the water ran snipe and other coast birds. The loons lay in the sea and fished. But the life and movement was upon the long seaweed banks along the coast. There the birds stood side by side close together and picked grub worms, which must have been found there in limitless quantities, for it was very evident that there was never any complaint over lack of food. The great majority were going to travel farther and had only alighted to take a short rest, and as soon as the leader of a flock thought that his comrades had recovered themselves sufficiently, he said, If you are ready now, we may as well move on. "'No, wait, wait, we haven't had anything like enough,' said the followers. "'You surely don't believe that I intend to let you eat so much "'that you will not be able to move,' said the leader, "'and flapped his wings and started off. "'Along the outermost seaweed banks lay a flock of swans. "'They didn't bother about going on land, "'but rested themselves by lying and rocking on the water. "'Now and then they dived down with their necks "'and brought up food from the sea bottom.' When they had got hold of anything very good, they indulged in loud shouts that sounded like trumpet calls. When the boy heard that there were swans on the shoals, he hurried out to the seaweed banks. He had never before seen wild swans at close range. He had luck on his side, so that he got close up to them. The boy was not the only one who had heard the swans. Both the wild geese and the grey geese and the loons swam out between the banks, laid themselves in a ring around the swans and stared at them. The swans ruffled their feathers, raised their wings like sails, and lifted their necks high in the air. Occasionally, one and another of them swam up to a goose, or a great loon, or a diving duck, and said a few words, and then it appeared as though the one addressed hardly dared raise his bill to reply. But then there was a little loon, a tiny, mischievous baggage, who couldn't stand all this ceremony. He dived suddenly and disappeared under the water's edge. Soon after that, one of the swans let out a scream and swam off so quickly that the water foamed. Then he stopped and began to look majestic once more. But soon another one shrieked, in the same way as the first one, and then a third. The little loon wasn't able to stay underwater any longer, but appeared on the water's edge, little and black and venomous. The swans rushed towards him, but when they saw what a poor little thing it was, they turned abruptly, as if they considered themselves too good to quarrel with him. Then... The little loon dived again and pinched their feet. It certainly must have hurt, and the worst of it was that they could not maintain their dignity. At once they took a decided stand. They began to beat the air with their wings so that it thundered, came forward a bit as though they were running on the water, got wind under their wings and raised themselves. When the swans were gone, they were greatly missed, and those who had lately been amused by the little loon's antics scolded him for his thoughtlessness. The boy walked toward land again. There he stationed himself to see how the pool snipe played. They resembled small storks. Like these, they had little bodies, long legs and necks, and light, swaying movements, only they were not grey but brown. They stood in a long row on the shore where it was washed by waves. As soon as a wave rolled in, the whole row ran backward. As soon as it receded, they followed it, and they kept this up for hours. The showiest of all the birds were the burrow ducks. They were undoubtedly related to the ordinary ducks, for, like these, they too had a thick-set body, broad bill and webbed feet, but they were much more elaborately dressed. The feather dress itself was white around their necks as they wore a broad gold band. The wing mirror shone in green, red and black, and the wing edges were black, 
and the head was dark green and shimmered like satin. As soon as any of these appeared on the shore, the others said, "'Now look at these things. They know how to tug themselves out. If they were not so conspicuous, they wouldn't have to dig their nests in the earth, but could lay above ground like anyone else,' said a brown mallard duck. "'They may try as much as they please. Still, they'll never get anywhere with such noses,' said a grey goose. And this was actually true. The burrow ducks had a big knob on the base of the bill which spoiled their appearance. Closer to the shore, seagulls and sea swallows moved forward on the water and fished. "'What kind of fish are you catching?' asked a wild goose. "'It's a stickleback. It's all in stickleback. It's the best stickleback in the world,' said a gull. "'Won't you taste it?' And he flew up to the goose with his mouth full of the little fishes and wanted to give her some. "'Uh, oh, do you think I eat such filth?' said the wild goose. The next morning it was just as cloudy. The wild geese walked about on the meadow and fed, but the boy had gone to the seashore to gather mussels. And there were plenty of them, and when he thought that the next day perhaps they would be in some place where they wouldn't get any food at all, he concluded that he would try to make himself a little bag, which he could fill with mussels. He found an old sedge on the meadow, which was strong and tough, and out of this he began to braid a knapsack. He worked at this for several hours, but he was well satisfied with it when it was finished. At dinner time, all the wild geese came running and asked him if he had seen anything of the white goosey gander. No, he's not been with me, said the boy. We had him with us all along until just lately, said Akka, but now we no longer know where he's to be found. The boy jumped up and was terribly frightened. He asked if any fox or eagle had put in an appearance or if any human being had been seen in the neighbourhood but no one had noticed anything dangerous. The goosey gander had probably lost his way in the mist. But it was just a great misfortune for the boy in whatever way the white one had been lost, and he started off immediately to hunt for him. The mist shielded him so that he could run wherever he wished without being seen, but it also prevented him from seeing. He ran southward along the shore, all the way down to the lighthouse and the mist cannon on the island's extreme point, it was the same bird confusion everywhere, but no Goosey Gander. He ventured over to Ottenby Castle, and he searched every one of the old hollow oaks in Ottenby Grove, but he saw no trace of the Goosey Gander. He searched again until it began to grow dark. Then he had to turn back again to the eastern shore. He walked with heavy steps and was fearfully blue. He didn't know what would become of him if he couldn't find the Goosey Gander, there was no one whom he could spare less. But when he wandered over the sheep meadow, what was that big white thing that came towards him in the mist if it wasn't the goosey gander? He was all right and very glad that at last he'd been able to find his way back to the others. The mist had made him so dizzy, he said, that he'd wandered around on the big meadow all day long. The boy threw his arms around his neck for very joy and begged him to take care of himself and not wander away from the others and he promised positively that he would never do this again. No, never again. But the next morning, when the boy went down to the beach and hunted for mussels, the geese came running and asked if he'd seen the goosey gander. No, of course he hadn't. Well then, the goosey gander's lost again. He's gone astray in the mist, just as he'd done the day before. The boy ran off in great terror and began to search. He found one place where the Ottenby wall was so tumbled down that he could climb over it. Later he went about, first on the shore, which gradually widened and became so large that there was room for fields and meadows and farms, then up on the flat highland, which lay in the middle of the island, and where there were no buildings except windmills, and where the turf was so thin that the white cement shone under it. Meanwhile he could not find the goosey gander, and as it drew on toward evening and the boy must return to the beach, he couldn't believe anything but that his travelling companion was lost. He was so depressed. He did not know what to do with himself. He had just climbed over the wall again when he heard a stone crash down close beside him. As he turned to see what it was, he thought that he could distinguish something that moved on a stone pile which lay close to the wall. He stole nearer and saw the goosey gander come trudging wearily over the stone pile with several long fibres in his mouth. The goosey gander didn't see the boy and the boy did not call to him, but thought it advisable to find out first why the goosey gander, time and again, disappeared in this manner. And he soon learned the reason for it. Up in the stone pile lay a young grey goose who cried with joy when the goosey gander came. 
the boy crept near so that he heard what they said. Then he found out that the grey goose had been wounded in one wing so that she could not fly and that her flock had travelled away from her and left her alone. She had been near death's door with hunger when the white goosey gander had heard her call the other day and had sought her out. Ever since, he had been carrying food for her. They both hoped that she would be well before they left the island, but as yet she could neither walk nor fly. She was very much worried over this, but he comforted her with the thought that he shouldn't travel for a long time. At last he bade her good night and promised to come the next day. The boy let the goosey gander go, and as soon as he was gone, he stole, in turn, up to the stone heap. He was angry because he'd been deceived, and now he wanted to say to that grey goose that the goosey gander was his property. He was going to take the boy up to Lapland, and there would be no talk of his staying here on her account. Now, when he saw the young grey goose close to, he understood not only why the goosey gander had gone and carried food to her for two days, but also why he had not wished to mention that he had helped her. She had the prettiest little head. Her feather dress was like soft satin, and the eyes were mild and pleading. When she saw the boy, she wanted to run away, but the left wing was out of joint and dragged on the ground, so that it interfered with her movements. "'You mustn't be afraid of me,' said the boy, and didn't look nearly so angry as he had intended to appear. "'I'm Thumbietot, Morton Goosey Gander's comrade,' he continued." Then he stood there and didn't know what he wanted to say. Occasionally one finds something among animals which makes one wonder what sort of creatures they really are. One is almost afraid that they may be transformed human beings. It was something like this with the grey goose. As soon as Thumbietot said who he was, she lowered her neck and head very charmingly before him and said in a voice that was so pretty that he couldn't believe it was a goose who spoke. I am very glad that you have come here to help me. The wild goosey gander has told me that no one is as wise and as good as you. She said this with such dignity that the boy grew really embarrassed. This surely can't be any bird, thought he. It is certainly some bewitched princess. He was filled with a desire to help her and ran his hand under the feathers and felt along the wing bone. The bone was not broken, but there was something wrong with the joint. He got his finger down into the empty cavity. "'Be careful now,' he said, and got a firm grip on the bone pipe and fitted it into the place where it ought to be. He did it very quickly and well, considering it was the first time that he had attempted anything of this sort. But it must have hurt very much, for the poor young goose uttered a single shrill cry and then sank down among the stones without showing a sign of life. The boy was terribly frightened. He had only wished to help her, and now she was dead. He made a big jump from a stone pile and ran away. He thought it was as though he had murdered a human being. The next morning it was clear and free from mist, and Acker said that they now should continue their travels. All the others were willing to go, but the white goosey gander made excuses. The boy understood well enough that he didn't care to leave the grey goose. Acker did not listen to him, but started off. The boy jumped up on the goosey gander's back, and the white one followed the flock albeit slowly and unwillingly. The boy was mighty glad that they could fly away from the island. He was conscience-stricken on account of the grey goose, and had not cared to tell the goosey gander how it had turned out when he had tried to cure her. It would probably be best if Morton Goosey Gander never found out about this, he thought, though he wondered at the same time how the white one had the heart to leave the grey goose. But suddenly the goosey gander turned, the thought of the young grey goose had overpowered him. It could go as it would with the Lapland trip, but he couldn't go with the others when he knew that she lay alone and ill, and would starve to death. With a few wing strokes he was over the stone pile, but then there lay no young grey goose between the stones. Darnfin, Darnfin, where art thou? called the goosey gander. The fox has probably been here and taken her, thought the boy. But at that moment he heard a pretty voice answer the goosey gander. Here I am, Goosey Gander, here am I. I have only been taking a morning bath. And up from the water came the little grey goose, fresh and in good trim, and told how Thumbietot had pulled her wing into place, and that she was entirely well and ready to follow them on the journey. The drops of water lay like pearl dew on her shimmery, satin-like feathers, and Thumbietot thought once again that she was a real little princess.
Chapter 12 The Big Butterfly Wednesday, April 6th The geese travelled alongside the coast of the Long Island, which lay distinctly visible under them. The boy felt happy and light of heart during the trip. He was just as pleased and well satisfied as he had been glum and depressed the day before when he roamed around down on the island and hunted for the goosey gander. He saw now that the interior of the island consisted of a barren high plain with a wreath of fertile land along the coast, and he began to comprehend the meaning of something which he had heard the other evening. He had just seated himself to rest a bit by one of the many windmills on the highland when a couple of shepherds came along with the dogs beside them and a large herd of sheep in their train. The boy had not been afraid because he was well concealed under the windmill stairs, but as it turned out the shepherds came and seated themselves on the same stairway, and then there was nothing for him to do but keep perfectly still. One of the shepherds was young, and looked about as folk do mostly, the other was an old queer one, his body was large and knotty, but the head was small and the face had sensitive and delicate features. It appeared as though the body and head didn't want to fit together at all. One moment he sat silent and gazed into the mist with an unutterably weary expression. Then he began to talk to his companion. Then the other one took out some bread and cheese from his knapsack to eat his evening meal. He answered scarcely anything but listened very patiently, just as if he were thinking, I might as well give you the pleasure of letting you chatter a while. Now I shall tell you something, Eric, said the old shepherd. I have figured out that in former days, when both human beings and animals were much larger than they are now, that the butterflies too must have been uncommonly large. And once there was a butterfly that was many miles long and had wings as wide as seas. Those wings were blue and shone like silver and so gorgeous that when the butterfly was out flying, all the other animals stood still and stared at it. It had this drawback, however, that it was too large. The wings had hard work to carry it, but probably all would have gone very well if the butterfly had been wise enough to remain on the hillside. But it wasn't. It ventured out over the East Sea, and it hadn't got very far before the storm came along and began to tear at its wings. Well, it's easy to understand, Eric, how things would go when the East Sea Storm commenced to wrestle with frail butterfly wings. It wasn't long before they were torn away and scattered, and then, of course, the poor butterfly fell into the sea. At first it was tossed backward and forward on the billows, and then it was stranded upon a few cliff foundations outside of Smoland, and there it lay, as large and long as it was, Now I think, Eric, that if the butterfly had dropped on land, it would soon have rotted and fallen apart. But since it fell into the sea, it was soaked through and through with lime and became as hard as stone. You know, of course, that we have found stones on the shore, which were nothing but petrified worms. Now I believe that it went the same way with the big butterfly body. I believe that it turned where it lay into a long, narrow mountain out in the East Sea. Don't you? He paused for reply, and the other one nodded to him. "Uh, Go on, so I may hear what you're driving at, said he. And mark you, Eric, and that this very oland upon which you and I live is nothing else than the old butterfly body. If one only thinks about it, one can observe that the island is a butterfly. Toward the north, the slender forebody and round head can be seen, and toward the south, one sees the back body, which first broadens out and then narrows to a sharp point. Here he paused once more and looked at his companion rather anxiously to see how he would take this assertion, but the young man kept on eating with the utmost calm and nodded to him to continue. As soon as the butterfly had been changed into limestone rock, Many different kinds of seeds and herbs and trees came travelling with the winds and wanted to take root on it. It was a long time before anything but sedge could grow there. Then came sheep sorrel and the rock rose and thornbush. But even today there's not so much growth on Alvaret that the mountain is well covered, but it shines through here and there. 
No one can think of ploughing and sowing up here, where the earth crust is so thin. Uh, but if you will admit that Alvaret and the strongholds around it are made of the butterfly body, uh, then you may, well, have the right to question where that land which lies beneath the strongholds came from. Yes, it is just that, said he who was eating. That I should indeed like to know. Well, you must remember that Oland has lain in the sea for a good many years, and in the course of time all the things which tumble around with the waves, seaweed and sand and clams, have gathered round it and remain laying there, and then stone and gravel have fallen down from both the eastern and western strongholds. In this way the island has acquired broad shores where grain and flowers and trees can grow. Up here, on the hard butterfly back, only sheep and cows and little horses go about. Only lapwings and plover live here, and there are no buildings except windmills and a few stone huts, where we shepherds crawl in. But down on the coast lie big villages and churches and parishes and fishing hamlets and a whole city. He looked questioningly at the other one. This one had finished his meal and was tying the food sack together. I wonder where you will end with all this, said he. It is only this that I want to know, said the shepherd, lowering his voice, so that he almost whispered the words and looked into the mist with his small eyes, which appeared to be worn out from spying after all that which does not exist. Only this I want to know. If the peasants who live on the built-up farms beneath the strongholds, or the fishermen who take the small herring from the sea, or the merchants in Borkholm, or, or the bathing guests who come here every summer, or the tourists who, who wander around in Borkholm's old castle ruin, or, or the sportsmen who come here in the fall to hunt partridges, or, or, or the painters who sit here on Alvaret and paint the sheep and, and windmills, I, I should like to know if any of them understand that this island has been a butterfly which flew about with great shimmery wings. Ah, said the young shepherd suddenly, it should have occurred to some of them as they sat on the edge of the stronghold of an evening and heard the nightingales trill in the groves below them and looked over Kalmar Sound that this island could not have come into existence in the same way as the others. I want to ask, said the old one, if no one has the desire to give wings to windmills, so large that they could reach to heaven, so large that they could lift the whole island out of the sea and let it fly like a butterfly among butterflies. It may be possible that there is something in what you say, said the young one, for on summer nights when the heavens widen and open over the island, I have sometimes thought that it was as if it wanted to raise itself from the sea and fly away. But when the old one had finally got the young one to talk, he didn't listen to him very much. I would like to know, the old one said in a low tone, if anyone can explain why one feels such a longing up here on Alvaret. I have felt it every day of my life, and I think it preys upon each and every one who must go about here. I want to know if no one else has understood that all this wistfulness is caused by the fact that the whole island is a butterfly that longs for its wings. Chapter 13 Little Carl's Island Part 1 The Storm Friday, April 8th The wild geese had spent the night on Oland's northern point and were now on their way to the continent. A strong south wind blew over Kalmar Sound and they had been thrown northward. Still, they worked their way toward land with good speed. But when they were nearing the first islands, a powerful rumbling was heard, as if a lot of strong-winged birds had come flying, and the water under them all at once became perfectly black. Akka drew in her wings so suddenly that she almost stood still in the air. Thereupon she lowered herself to light on the edge of the sea. But before the geese had reached the water, the west storm caught up with them. Already it drove before it fogs, salt scum and small birds. It also snatched with it the wild geese, threw them on end and cast them towards the sea. It was a rough storm. The wild geese tried to turn back time, but they couldn't do it and were driven out toward the East Sea. 
The storm had already blown them past Oland, and the sea lay before them, empty and desolate. There was nothing for them to do but to keep out of the water. When Acker observed that they were unable to turn back, she thought that it was needless to let the storm drive them over the entire East Sea. Therefore she sank down to the water. Now the sea was raging and increased in violence with every second. The sea-green billows rolled forward with seething foam on their crests. Each one surged higher than the other. It was as though they raced with each other to see which could foam the wildest. But the wild geese were not afraid of the swells. On the contrary, this seemed to afford them much pleasure. They did not strain themselves with swimming, but lay and let themselves be washed up with the wave crests and down in the water dales, and had just as much fun as children on a swing. Their only anxiety was that the flock should be separated. The few land birds who drove by up in the storm cried with envy, "'There's no danger for you who can swim!' But the wild geese were certainly not out of all danger. In the first place, the rocking made them helplessly sleepy. They wished continually to turn their heads backward, poke their bills under their wings and go to sleep. Nothing can be more dangerous than to fall asleep in this way. And Akka called out all the while, Don't go to sleep, wild geese. He that falls asleep will get away from the flock. He that gets away from the flock is lost. Despite all attempts at resistance, one after another fell asleep, and Akka herself came pretty near dozing off when she suddenly saw something round and dark rise on top of a wave. "'Seals! Seals! Seals!' cried Akka in a high, shrill voice, and raised herself up in the air with resounding wingstrokes. It was just at the crucial moment. Before the last wild goose had time to come up from the water, the seals were so close to her that they made a grab for her feet. Then the wild geese were once more up in the storm, which drove them before it out to sea. No rest did it allow either itself or the wild geese, and no land did they see, only desolate sea. They lit on the water again as soon as they dared venture, but when they had rocked upon the waves for a while, they became sleepy again, and when they fell asleep, the seals came swimming. If old Akka had not been so wakeful, not one of them would have escaped." All day the storm raged, and it caused fearful havoc among the crowds of little birds, which at this time of year were migrating. Some were driven from their course to foreign lands, where they died of starvation. Others became so exhausted that they sank down in the sea and were drowned. Many were crushed against the cliff walls, and many became a prey for the seals. The storm continued all day, and at last Akka began to wonder if she and her flock would perish. They were now dead tired, and nowhere did they see any place where they might rest. Toward evening she no longer dared to lie down on the sea, because it now filled up all of a sudden with large ice cakes which struck against each other, and she feared they should be crushed between these. A couple of times the wild geese tried to stand on the ice crust, but one time the wild storm swept them into the water, another time the merciless seals came creeping up on the ice. At sundown, the wild geese were once more up in the air. They flew on, fearful for the night. The darkness seemed to come upon them too quickly this night, which was so full of dangers. It was terrible that they, as yet, saw no land. How would it go with them if they were forced to stay out on the sea all night? They would either be crushed between the ice cakes or devoured by seals, or separated by the storm. The heavens were cloud-bedecked, the moon hid itself, and the darkness came quickly. At the same time, all nature was filled with horror, which caused the most courageous hearts to quail. Distressed bird travellers' cries had sounded over the sea all day long, without anyone having paid the slightest attention to them. But now, when one no longer saw who it was that uttered them, they seemed mournful and terrifying. Down on the sea, the ice drifts crashed against each other with a loud, rumbling noise. The seals tuned up their wild hunting songs. It was as though heaven and earth were about to clash. Part 2. The Sheep The boy sat for a moment and looked down into the sea. Suddenly he thought that it began to roar louder than ever. He looked up. Right in front of him, only a couple of metres away, stood a rugged and bare mountain wall. 
At its base, the waves dashed into a foaming spray. The wild geese flew straight toward the cliff, and the boy did not see how they could avoid being dashed to pieces against it. Hardly had he wondered that Akka hadn't seen the danger in time when they were over by the mountain. Then he also noticed that in front of them was the half-round entrance to a grotto. Into this the geese steered, and the next moment they were safe. The first thing the wild geese thought of, before they gave themselves time to rejoice over their safety, was to see if all their comrades were also harboured. Yes, they were. Akka, Ixi, Kalmi, Nelja, Visi, Knusi, all the six goslings, the goosey gander, Dunfin, and Thumbitot. But Kaxi from Nualja, the first left-hand goose, was missing, and no one knew anything about her fate. When the wild geese discovered that no one but Kaxi had been separated from the flock, they took the matter lightly. Kaxi was old and wise. She knew all their byways and their habits, and she, of course, would know how to find her way back to them. Then the wild geese began to look around in the cave. Enough daylight came in through the opening so that they could see the grotto was both deep and wide. They were delighted to think they'd found such a fine night harbour, when one of them caught sight of some shining green dots which glittered in a dark corner. "'Those are eyes!' cried Akka. "'There are big animals in here!' They rushed toward the opening, but Thumbitot called to them. "'There's nothing to run away from. It's only a few sheep who are lying alongside the grotto wall!' When the wild geese had accustomed themselves to the dim daylight in the grotto, they saw the sheep very distinctly. The grown-up ones might be about as many as there were geese, but beside those there were a few little lambs. An old ram with long twisted horns appeared to be the most lordly one of the flock. The wild geese went up to him with much bowing and scraping. "'Well met in the wilderness!' they greeted. But the big ram lay still and did not speak a word of welcome. Then the wild geese thought that the sheep were displeased because they had taken shelter in their grotto. "'It is perhaps not permissible that we have come in here,' said Akka. "'But we cannot help it, for we are wind-driven. "'We have wandered about in the storm all day, "'and it would be very good to be allowed to stop here tonight.' "'After that, a long time passed before any of the sheep answered with words. "'But, on the other hand, it could be heard distinctly "'that a pair of them heaved deep sighs. "'Akka knew, to be sure, that sheep are always shy and peculiar.' but these seemed to have no idea of how they should conduct themselves. Finally, an old ewe, who had a long and pathetic face and a doleful voice, said, "'There isn't one among us that refuses to let you stay, but this is a house of mourning. We cannot receive guests as we did in former days.' "'You needn't worry about anything of that sort,' said Akka. "'If you knew what we have endured this day, "'you would surely understand that we are satisfied "'if we only get a safe spot to sleep on.' "'When Akka said this, the old ewe raised herself. "'I believe that it would be better for you "'to fly about in the worst storm than to stop here. "'But at least you shall not go from here "'before we have had the privilege "'of offering you the best hospitality "'which the house affords.' "'She conducted them to a hollow in the ground, "'which was filled with water.' Beside it lay a pile of bait and husks and chaff, and she bade them to make the most of these. "'We have had a severe snow winter this year on the island,' she said. "'The peasants who own us come out to us with hay and oat and straw so we shouldn't starve to death, and this trash is all there is left of the good cheer.' The geese rushed to the food instantly. They thought that they had fared well and were in their best humour, they must have observed, of course, that the sheep were anxious, but they knew how easily scared sheep generally are, and didn't believe there was any actual danger on foot. As soon as they had eaten, they intended to stand up to sleep, as usual, but then the big ram got up and walked over to them. The geese thought that they had never seen a sheep with such big and coarse horns. In other respects also he was noticeable. He had a high rolling forehead, intelligent eyes, and a good bearing, as though he were a proud and courageous animal. "'I cannot assume the responsibility of letting you geese remain without telling you that it is unsafe here,' said he. "'We cannot receive night guests just now. 
At last, Acker began to comprehend that this was serious. "'We shall go away, since you really wish it,' said she. "'But won't you tell us first what it is that troubles you? "'We know nothing about it. "'We do not even know where we are.' "'This is little Carl's Island,' said the ram. "'It lies outside of Gotland, and only sheep and seabirds live here.' "'Perhaps you are wild sheep,' said Akka. "'We're not far removed from it,' replied the ram. "'We have nothing to do with human beings. "'It's an old agreement between us and some peasants on a farm in Gotland "'that they shall supply us with fodder in case we have a snow winter, "'and as a recompense they are permitted to take away those of us who become superfluous. "'The island is small. It cannot feed very many of us.' "'but otherwise we take care of ourselves all the year round, "'and we do not live in houses with doors and locks, "'but we reside in grottoes like these. And "'Do you stay out here in the winter as well?' asked Akka, surprised. "'We do,' answered the ram. "'We have good fodder up here in the mountain all year round.' "'I think it sounds as if you might have it better than other sheep,' said Akka. "'But what is the misfortune that has befallen you?' It was bitter cold last winter. The sea froze, and then three foxes came over here on the ice, and here they have been ever since. Otherwise, there are no dangerous animals here on the island. Oh, oh, oh do foxes dare to attack such as you? Oh, no, not during the day. Then I can protect myself and mine, said the ram, shaking his horns. But they sneak up on us at night when we sleep in the grottoes. We try to keep awake, but one must sleep some of the time, and then they come upon us. They have already killed every sheep in the other grottoes, and there were herds that were just as large as mine. It isn't pleasant to tell you that we are so helpless, said the old ewe. We cannot help ourselves any better than if we were tame sheep. Do you think that they will come here tonight? asked Akka. There is nothing else in store for us, answered the old ewe. They were here last night and stole a lamb from us. They'll be sure to come again as long as there are any of us alive. This is what they have done in the other places. But if they are allowed to keep this up, you'll become entirely exterminated, said Akka. Oh, it won't be long before it's all over with the sheep on little Carl's Island, said the ewe. Akka stood there hesitatingly. It was not pleasant by any means to venture out in the storm again, and it wasn't good to remain in a house where such guests were expected. When she had pondered a while, she turned to Thumbietot. "'I wonder if you will help us, as you have done so many times before,' said she. "'Yes, that he would like to do,' he replied. "'It is a pity for you not to get any sleep,' said the wild goose. "'But I wonder if you are able to keep awake until the foxes come, "'and then to awaken us so we may fly away.' "'The boy was so very glad of this, for anything was better than to go out in the storm again, "'so he promised to keep awake. "'He went down to the grotto opening, crawled in behind a stone "'that he might be shielded from the storm, and sat down to watch. "'When the boy had been sitting there a while, the storm seemed to abate. "'The sky grew clear.' and the moonlight began to play on the waves. The boy stepped to the opening to look out. The grotto was rather high up on the mountain. A narrow path led to it. It was probably here he must await the foxes. As yet he saw no foxes, but, on the other hand, there was something which, for the moment, terrified him much more. On the land strip below the mountain stood some giants, or other stone trolls, or perhaps they were actual human beings. At first he thought that he was dreaming, but now he was positive that he had not fallen asleep. He saw the big men so distinctly that it couldn't be an illusion. Some of them stood on the land strip, and others right on the mountain, just as if they intended to climb it. Some had big, thick heads. Others had no heads at all. Some were one-armed, and some had humps, both before and behind. He had never seen anything so extraordinary. The boy stood and worked himself into a state of panic because of those trolls, so that he almost forgot to keep his eye peeled for the foxes. But now he heard a claw scrape against a stone. He saw three foxes coming up the steep, and as soon as he knew that he had something real to deal with, he was calm again, and not the least bit scared. It struck him 
that it was a pity to awaken only the geese and to leave the sheep to their fate. He thought he would like to arrange things some other way. He ran quickly to the other end of the grotto, shook the big ram's horns until he awoke, and at the same time swung himself upon his back. "'Get up, sheep, and we'll try to frighten the foxes a bit,' said the boy. He had tried to be as quiet as possible, but the foxes must have heard some noise, for when they came to the mouth of the grotto, they stopped and deliberated. "'It was certainly someone in there that moved,' said one. "'I wonder if they're awake.' "'Oh, go ahead, you,' said another. "'At all events, they can't do anything to us.' And when they came farther in, into the grotto, they stopped and sniffed. "'Who shall we take tonight?' whispered the one who went first. "'Tonight we will take the big ram,' said the last. "'After that we'll have easy work with the rest.' The boy sat on the old ram's back and saw how they sneaked along. "'Now, but straight forward,' whispered the boy. The ram butted, and the first fox was thrust top over tail back to the opening. Now, butt to the left, said the boy, and turned the big ram's head in that direction. The ram measured a terrific assault that caught the second fox in the side. He rolled around several times before he got to his feet again and made his escape. The boy had wished that the third one too might have gotten a bump, but this one had already gone. Now, I think they've had enough for tonight, said the boy. "'I think so, too,' said the big ram. "'Now lie on my back and creep into the wall. "'You deserve to have it warm and comfortable "'after all the wind and storm that you have been out in.'" Part 3. Hell's Hole The next day the big ram went around with the boy on his back and showed him the island. It consisted of a single massive mountain. It was like a large house with perpendicular walls and a flat roof. First, the ram walked up on the mountain roof and showed the boy the good grazing lands there, and he had to admit that the island seemed to be especially created for sheep. There wasn't much else than sheep sorrel and such little spicy growths as sheep are fond of that grew on the mountain. But indeed, there was something besides sheep fodder to look at, for one who had got well up on the steep. To begin with, the largest part of the sea, which now lay blue and sunlit and rolled forward in glittering swells, was visible. Only upon one and another point did the foam spray up. To the east lay Gotland, with even and long-stretched coast, and to the southwest lay Great Carl's Island, which was built on the same plan as the little island. When the ram walked to the very edge of the mountain roof, so the boy could look down on the mountain walls, he noticed that they were simply filled with birds' nests, and in the blue sea beneath them lay scurf scoters and eider ducks and kittiwakes and guillemots and razorbills, so pretty and peaceful, busying themselves with fishing for small herring. "'This is really favoured land,' said the boy. "'You live in a pretty place, you sheep.' "'Oh, yes, it's pretty enough here.' said the big ram. It was as if he wished to add something, but he did not, only sighed. If you go about here alone, you must look out for the crevices which run all around the mountain, he continued after a little. And this was a good warning, for there were deep and broad crevices in several places. The largest of them was called Hell's Hole. That crevice was many fathoms deep and nearly one fathom wide. If anyone fell down there, "'It would certainly be the last of him,' said the big ram. "'The boy thought it sounded as if he had a special meaning in what he said. "'Then he conducted the boy down to the narrow strip of shore. "'Now he could see those giants which had frightened him the night before at close range. "'They were nothing but tall rock pillars. "'The big ram called them cliffs. "'The boy couldn't see enough of them. "'He thought that if there had ever been any trolls who had turned into stone, "'they ought to look down just like that. Although it was pretty down on the shore, the boy liked it still better on the mountain height. It was ghastly down here, for everywhere they came across dead sheep. It was here that the foxes had held their orgies. He saw skeletons whose flesh had been eaten, and bodies that were half eaten, and others which they had scarcely tasted, but had allowed to lie untouched. It was heartrending to see how the wild beasts had thrown themselves upon the sheep just for sport, just to hunt them and tear them to death. The big ram did not pause in front of the dead, but walked by them in silence. But the boy, meanwhile, could not help seeing all the horror. Then the big ram 
went up on the mountain height again. But when he was there, he stopped and said, "'If someone who is capable and wise could see all the misery which prevails here, he surely would not be able to rest until these foxes had been punished.' "'The foxes must live too,' said the boy. "'Yes,' said the big ram. "'Those who do not tear in pieces more animals than they need for their sustenance, they may as well live, but these are felons.' "'The peasants who own the island ought to come here and help you,' insisted the boy. "'They have rode over a number of times,' replied the ram. "'But the foxes always hid themselves in the grottoes and crevices "'so they could not get near them to shoot them. "'You surely cannot mean, father, that a poor little creature like me "'should be able to get at them "'when neither you nor the peasants have succeeded in getting the better of them. "'He that is little and spry can put many things to rights,' said the big ram. They talked no more about this, and the boy went over and seated himself among the wild geese who fed on the highland. Although he had not cared to show his feelings before the ram, he was very sad on the sheep's account, and he would have been glad to help them. I can at least talk with Akka and Morton Goosey Gander about the matter, thought he. Perhaps they can help me with a good suggestion. A little later, the white Goosey Gander took the boy on his back and went over the mountain plain and in the direction of Hell's Hole at that. He wandered carefree on the open mountain roof, apparently unconscious of how large and white he was. He didn't seek protection behind tufts or any other protuberances, but went straight ahead. It was strange that he was not more careful, for it was apparent that he had fared badly in yesterday's storm. He limped on his right leg and the left wing hung and dragged as if it might be broken. He acted as if there were no danger, pecked at a grass blade here and there, and did not look about him in any direction. The boy lay stretched out full length on the gooseback and looked up towards the blue sky. He was so accustomed to riding now that he could both stand and lie down on the gooseback. When the goosey gander and the boy were so carefree, they did not observe, of course, that the three foxes had come up on the mountain plain. And the foxes, who knew that it was well-nigh impossible to take the life of a goose on an open plain, thought at first that they wouldn't chase after the goosey gander. But as they had nothing else to do, they finally sneaked down on one of the long passes and tried to steal up to him. They went about it so cautiously that the goosey gander couldn't see a shadow of them. They were not far off when the goosey gander made an attempt to raise himself into the air. He spread his wings, but he did not succeed in lifting himself. When the foxes seemed to grasp the fact that he couldn't fly, they hurried forward with greater eagerness than before. They no longer concealed themselves in the cleft, but came up on the highland. They hurried as fast as they could behind tufts and hollows, and came nearer and nearer the goosey gander, without his seeming to notice that he was being hunted. At last, the foxes were so near that they could make the final leap. Simultaneously, all three threw themselves with one long jump at the goosey gander. But still, at the last moment, he must have noticed something, for he ran out of the way, so the foxes missed him. This, at any rate, didn't mean very much, for the goosey gander only had a couple of metres headway, and in the bargain he limped. Anyway, the poor thing ran ahead as fast as he could. The boy sat upon the gooseback, backward, and shrieked and called to the foxes, "'You have eaten yourselves too fat on mutton, foxes. You can't catch up with a goose even!' He teased them so that they became crazed with rage and thought only of rushing forward. The white one ran right straight to the big cleft. When he was there, he made one stroke with his wings and got over. Just then the foxes were almost upon him. The goosey gander hurried on with the same haste as before, even after he'd got across Hell's Hole, but he'd hardly been running two metres before the boy patted him on the neck and said, "'Now you can stop, goosey gander!' At that instant they heard a number of wild howls behind them, and a scraping of claws and heavy falls, but of the foxes they saw nothing more. The next morning the lighthouse keeper on Great Carl's Island found a bit of bark poked under the entrance door and on it had been cut in slanting angular letters. The foxes on the little island have fallen down into Hell's Hole. Take care of them. And this the lighthouse keeper did, too.
Chapter 14 Two Cities Part 1 The City at the Bottom of the Sea Saturday, April 9th It was a calm and clear night, and the wild geese did not trouble themselves to seek shelter in any of the grottoes, but stood and slept upon the mountain top, and the boy had lain down in the short, dry grass beside the geese. It was bright moonlight that night, so bright, that it was difficult for the boy to go to sleep. He lay there and thought about just how long he had been away from home, and he figured out that it was three weeks since he'd started on the trip. At the same time, he remembered that this was Easter Eve. It is tonight that all the witches come home from Blackula, thought he, and laughed to himself, for he was just a little afraid of both the sea nymph and the elf, but he didn't believe in witches the least little bit. If there had been any witches out that night, he should have seen them, to be sure. It was so light in the heavens that not the tiniest black speck could move in the air without his seeing it. While the boy lay there with his nose in the air and thought about this, his eye rested on something lovely. The moon's disc was whole and round and rather high, and over it a big bird came flying. He did not fly past the moon, but he moved just as though he might have flown out from it. The bird looked black against the light background, and the wings extended from one rim of the disc to the other. He flew on evenly in the same direction, and the boy thought that he was painted on the moon's disc. The body was small, the neck long and slender, the legs hung down long and thin. It couldn't be anything but a stork. A couple of seconds later, Herr Ermenric the stork lit beside the boy. He bent down and poked him with his bill to awaken him. Instantly, the boy sat up. "'I'm not asleep here, Ermenric, he said. "'How does it happen that you are out in the middle of the night, "'and how is everything at Glimminge Castle? "'Do you want to speak with Mother Acker?' "'It's too l- l- light to sleep tonight,' answered Herr Ermenric. Uh, "'Therefore, I, I concluded to-, to travel over here to Carl's Island "'and, and hunt you up, f- f- friend Th- Thumbytot. "'I learned from the, the sea mew that, that you were spending the, the-, the night here.' I have not as yet moved over to Glimminge Castle, but I am still living at Pommer. The boy was simply overjoyed to think that Herr Ermenric had sought him out. They chatted about all sorts of things, like old friends. At last, the stork said to the boy if he wouldn't like to go riding for a while on this beautiful night. Oh yes, that the boy wanted to do. If the stork would manage it so that he got back to the wild geese before sunrise, this he promised, so off they went. Again, Herr Ermenric flew straight toward the moon. They rose and rose, and the sea sank deep down. But the flight went so light and easy that it seemed almost as if the boy lay still in the air. When Herr Ermenric began to descend, the boy thought that the flight had lasted an unreasonably short time. They landed on a desolate bit of seashore, which was covered with fine, even sand. All along the coast ran a row of flying sand drifts, with lime grass on their tops. They were not very high, but they prevented the boy from seeing any of the island. Herr Ermenric stood on a sand hill, drew up one leg, and bent his head backward so he could stick his bill under the wing. "'You can roam around on the shore for a while,' he said to Thumbytot, "'while I rest myself.' But, 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 but don't go, go so f- far away that you can't f- f- find your way back to me g- again. To start with, the boy intended to climb a sand hill and see how the land behind it looked, but when he had walked a couple of paces, he stubbed the toe of his wooden shoe against something hard. He stooped down and saw that a small copper coin lay on the sand and was so worn with verdigris that it was almost transparent. It was so poor that he didn't even bother to pick it up, but only kicked it out of the way. But when he straightened himself up once more, he was perfectly astounded, for two paces away from him stood a high, dark wall with a big turreted gate. The moment before, when the boy bent down, the sea lay there, shimmering and smooth, while now it was hidden by a long wall with towers and battlements. Directly in front of him, where before there had been only a few seaweed banks, the big gate of the wall opened. The boy probably understood that it was a spectre play of some sort, but this was nothing to be afraid of, thought he. It wasn't any dangerous trolls or any other evil, such as he always dreaded to encounter at night. Both the wall and the gate were so beautifully constructed that he only desired to see what there might be back of them. 
I must find out what this can be, thought he, and went in through the gate. In the deep archway there were guards, dressed in brocaded and purred suits, with long-handled spears beside them, who sat and threw dice. They thought only of the game, and took no notice of the boy who hurried past them quickly. Just within the gate he found an open space paved with large, even stone blocks. All around this were high and magnificent buildings, and between these opened long, narrow streets. On the square facing the gate it fairly swarmed with human beings. The men wore long, fur-trimmed capes over satin suits, plume-bedecked hats sat obliquely on their heads, on their chests hung superb chains. They were all so regally dressed that the whole lot of them might have been kings. The women went about in high headdresses and long robes with tight-fitting sleeves. They too were beautifully dressed, but their splendour was not to be compared with that of the men. This was exactly like the old storybook which Mother took from the chest only once and showed to him. The boy simply couldn't believe his eyes. But that which was even more wonderful to look upon than either the men or the women was the city itself. Every house was built in such a way that a gable faced the street, and the gables were so highly ornamented that one could believe they wished to compete with each other as to which one could show the most beautiful decorations. When one suddenly sees so much that is new, he cannot manage to treasure it all in his memory, but at least the boy could recall that he had seen the stairway gables on the various landings which bore images of the Christ and his apostles, gables where there were images in niche after niche all along the wall, gables that were inlaid with multicoloured bits of glass, and gables that were striped and checked with white and black marble. As the boy admired all this, a sudden sense of haste came over him. Anything like this my eyes have never seen before. Anything like this they would never see again, he said to himself, and he began to run in toward the city, up one street and down another. The streets were straight and narrow, but not empty and gloomy. As they were in the cities with which he was familiar, there were people everywhere. Old women sat by their open doors and spun without a spinning wheel, only with the help of a shuttle. The merchants' shops were like market stalls opening on the street. All the handworkers did their work out of doors. In one place they were boiling crude oil, in another tanning hides, in a third there was a long rope walk. If only the boy had had time enough he could have learnt how to make all sorts of things. Here he saw how armed the thin breastplates, how turners tended their irons, how the shoemakers sold soft red shoes, how the gold wire drawers twisted gold thread and how weavers inserted silver and gold into their weaving. But the boy did not have the time to stay. He just rushed on so that he could manage to see as much as possible before it would all vanish again. The high wall ran all around the city and shut it in as a hedge shuts in a field. He saw it at the end of every street, cable ornamented and crenellated. On the top of the wall walked warriors in shiny armour, and when he had run from one end of the city to the other, he came to still another gate in the wall. Outside of this lay the sea and harbour. The boy saw olden-time ships with rowing benches straight across and high structures fore and aft. Some lay and took on cargo, others were just casting anchor. Carriers and merchants hurried around each other. All over it was life and bustle. But not even here did he seem to have the time to linger. He rushed into the city again, and now he came up to the big square. There stood the cathedral with its three high towers and deep vaulted arches filled with images. The walls had been so highly decorated by sculptors that there was not a stone without its own special ornamentation. And what a magnificent display of gilded crosses and gold-trimmed altars and priests in golden vestments shimmered through the open gate. Directly opposite the church there was a house with a notched roof and a single slender sky-high tower. That was probably the courthouse, and between the courthouse and the cathedral all around the square stood the beautiful gabled houses with their multiplicity of adornments. The boy had run himself both warm and tired. He thought that now he had seen the most remarkable things, and therefore he began to walk more leisurely. The street which he had turned into now was surely the one where the inhabitants purchased their fine clothing. 
He saw crowds of people standing before the little stalls where the merchants spread brocades, stiff satins, heavy gold cloth, shimmery velvet, delicate failing, and laces as sheer as a spider's web. Before, when the boy ran so fast, no one had paid any attention to him. The people must have thought that it was only a little grey rat that darted by them. But now, when he walked down the street very slowly, one of the salesmen caught sight of him and began to beckon to him. At first, the boy was uneasy and wanted to hurry out of the way. But the salesman only beckoned and smiled and spread out on the counter a lovely piece of satin damask, as if he wanted to tempt him. The boy shook his head. "'I will never be so rich that I can buy even a metre of that cloth,' thought he. But now they had caught sight of him in every stall all along the street. Wherever he looked stood a salesman and beckoned to him. They left their costly wares and thought only of him. He saw how they hurried into the most hidden corner of the stall to fetch the best that they had to sell, and how their hands trembled with eagerness and haste as they laid it upon the counter. When the boy continued to go on, one of the merchants jumped over the counter, caught a hold of him, and spread before him silver cloth and woven tapestries which shone with brilliant colours. The boy couldn't do anything but laugh at him. The salesman certainly must understand that a poor little creature like him couldn't buy such things. He stood still and held out his two empty hands so they would understand that he had nothing, and let him go in peace. But the merchant raised a finger and nodded and pushed the whole pile of beautiful things over to him. "'Can he mean that he will sell all this for a gold piece?' wondered the boy. The merchant brought out a tiny worn and poor coin, the smallest that one could see, and showed it to him, and he was so eager to sell that he increased his pile with a pair of large, heavy silver goblets. Then the boy began to dig down in his pockets. He knew, of course, that he didn't possess a single coin, but he couldn't help feeling for it. All the other merchants stood still and tried to see how the sale would come off, and when they observed that the boy began to search in his pockets, they flung themselves over the counters, filled their hands full of gold and silver ornaments, and offered them to him, and they all showed him that what they asked in payment was just one little penny. But the boy turned both vest and breeches pockets inside out, so they should see that he owned nothing. Then tears filled the eyes of all these regal merchants who were so much richer than he. At last he was moved because they looked so distressed, and he pondered if he could not in some way help them. And then he happened to think of the rusty coin which he had but lately seen on the strand. He started to run down the street, and luck was with him, so that he came to the self-same gate which he had happened upon first. He dashed through it, and commenced to search for the little green copper penny which lay on the strand a while ago. He found it too, very promptly, but when he had picked it up and wanted to run back to the city with it, he saw only the sea before him. No city wall, no gate, no sentinels, no streets, no houses could now be seen, only the sea. The boy couldn't help that the tears came to his eyes. He had believed in the beginning that that which he saw was nothing but an hallucination. But this he had already forgotten. He only thought about how pretty everything was. He felt a genuine deep sorrow because the city had vanished. That moment Herr Ermenrich awoke and came up to him. But he didn't hear him and the stork had to poke the boy with his bill to attract attention to himself. I believe that you stand here and sleep just as I do, said Herr Ermenrich. Oh, Herr Ermenrich, said the boy, what was that city which stood here just now? Have you seen a city? said the stork. You have slept and dreamed, I say. No, I've not dreamt, said Thumbietot, and he told the stork all that he had experienced. Then Herr Ermenrich said, for, for my part, Th Thumbietot, I believe that you fell asleep here on the strand and, and, and dreamed all this. B but I will not conceal from you that Batterkey, the raven who is the most learned of all the birds, once told me that in former times there was a, a city on this shore called Vinetta. It was so rich and so fortunate that no city has ever been more glorious. But, but its inhabitants unluckily gave themselves up to arrogance and, and, and love of display. Uh, as a punishment for this, says Bataki, that the city of Vinetta was overtaken by a flood and sank 
into the sea. But, but, but its inhabitants cannot die, neither is their city d destroyed. And one night in e every hundred years it rises in all its splendour up from the sea and remains on the surface for just one hour. Yes, it must be so, said Thumbietot. For this I have seen. But, 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 but when the hour is up, it, it, it sinks again into the sea. If during that time no merchant in Veneta has sold anything to a single living creature. If you, Thumbi Tot, only had an ever so tiny coin to pay the merchants, Veneta might have remained up here on the shore and its people could have lived and died like other human beings. Herr Ermenrich, said the boy. Now I understand why you came and fetched me in the middle of the night. It was because you believed that I should be able to save the old city. I am so sorry it didn't turn out as you wished, Herr Ermenrig. He covered his face with his hands and wept. It wasn't easy to say which one looked the more disconsolate, the boy or Herr Ermenrig. Part 2. The Living City Monday, April 11th on the afternoon of Easter Monday, the wild geese and Thumbietot were on the wing. They travelled over Gotland. The large island lay smooth and even beneath them. The ground was checked just as it was in Skane, and there were many churches and farms. But there was this difference, however, that there were more leafy meadows between the fields here, and then the farms were not built up with small houses, and there were no large manors with ancient tower-ornamented castles. The wild geese had taken the route over Gotland on account of Thumbietot. He had been altogether unlike himself for two days and hadn't spoken a cheerful word. This was because he had thought of nothing but that city which had appeared to him in such a strange way. He had never seen anything so magnificent and royal and he could not be reconciled with himself for having failed to save it. Usually he was not chicken-hearted, but now he actually grieved for the beautiful buildings and the stately people. Both Akka and the Goosey Gander tried to convince Thumbietot that he'd been the victim of a dream or an hallucination, but the boy wouldn't listen to anything of that sort. He was so positive that he had really seen what he'd seen, that no one could move him from this conviction. He went about so disconsolate that his travelling companions became uneasy for him. Just as the boy was the most depressed, old Caxi came back to the flock. She had been blown toward Gotland and had been compelled to travel over the whole island before she had learned through some crows that her comrades were on Little Carl's Island. When Caxi found out what was wrong with Thumbietot, she said impulsively, If Thumbietot is grieving over an old city, we shall soon be able to comfort him. Just come along and I'll take you to a place that I saw yesterday. You will not be distressed very long. Thereupon the geese had taken farewell of the sheep and were on their way to the place which Caxi wished to show Thumbietot. As blue as he was, he couldn't keep from looking at the land over which he travelled as usual. He thought it looked as though the whole island had, in the beginning, been just such a high, steep cliff as Carl's Island, though much bigger, of course. But afterward it had in some way been flattened out. Someone had taken a big rolling pin and rolled over it, as if it had been a lump of dough. Not that the island had become altogether flat and even like a bread cake, for it wasn't like that. Uh, while he travelled along the coast, he had seen white lime walls with grottoes and crags in several directions, but in most of the places they were levelled and sank inconspicuously down toward the sea. In Gotland they had a pleasant and peaceful holiday afternoon. It turned out to be mild spring weather. The trees had large buds. Spring blossoms dressed the ground in the leafy meadows. The poplars' long, thin pendants swayed, and in the little gardens which one finds around every cottage, the gooseberry bushes were green. The warmth and the spring budding had tempted the people out into the gardens and roads, and wherever a number of them were gathered together, they were playing. It was not the children alone who played, but the grown-ups also. They were throwing stones at a given point, and they threw balls in the air with such exact aim that they almost touched the wild geese. It looked cheerful and pleasant to see big folk at play, and the boy certainly would have enjoyed it if he'd been able to forget his grief because he had failed to save the city. Anyway, he had to admit that this was a lovely trip. There was so much singing and sound in the air. Little children played ring games and sang as they played, 
the Salvation Army was out. He saw a lot of people dressed in black and red, sitting upon a wooded hill, playing on guitars and brass instruments. On one road came a great crowd of people. They were good Templars who had been on a pleasure trip. He recognised them by the big banners with the gold inscriptions which waved above them. They sang song after song, as long as he could hear them. After that, the boy could never think of Gotland without thinking of the games and songs at the same time. He'd been sitting and looking down for a long while, but now he happened to raise his eyes, and no one can describe his amazement. Before he was aware of it, the wild geese had left the interior of the island and gone westward toward the sea coast. Now the wide blue sea lay before him. However, it was not the sea that was remarkable, but a city which appeared on the seashore. The boy came from the east, and the sun had just begun to go down in the west. When he came nearer to the city, its walls and towers and high gabled houses and churches stood there perfectly black against the light evening sky. He couldn't see, therefore, what it really looked like, and for a couple of moments he believed that this city was just as beautiful as the one he'd seen on Easter night. When he got right up to it, he saw that it was both like and unlike that city from the bottom of the sea. There was the same contrast between them as there is between a man whom one sees arrayed in purple and jewels one day, and on another day one sees him dressed in rags. Yes, this city had probably, once upon a time, been like the one which he sat and thought about. This one also was enclosed by a wall with towers and gates. But the towers in this city, which had been allowed to remain on land, were roofless, hollow, and empty. The gates were without doors. Sentinels and warriors had disappeared. All the glittering splendour was gone. There was nothing left but the naked grey stone skeleton. When the boy came farther into the city, he saw that the larger part of it was made up of small low houses. But here and there were still a few high gabled houses and a few cathedrals, which were from the olden time. The walls of the gabled houses were whitewashed and entirely without ornamentation, but because the boy had so lately seen the buried city, he seemed to understand how they had been decorated, some with statues and others with black and white marble. And it was the same with the old cathedrals. The majority of them were roofless with bare interiors. The window openings were empty, and the floors were grass-grown, and ivy clambered along the walls. But now, he knew how they had looked at one time, that they had been covered with images and paintings, that the chancel had had trimmed altars and gilded crosses, and that moved about arrayed in gold vestments. The boy saw also the narrow streets, which were almost deserted on holiday afternoons. He knew, he did, what a stream of stately people had once upon a time sauntered about on them. He knew that they had been like large workshops filled with all sorts of workmen. But that which Nils Holgersen did not see was that the city, even today, was both beautiful and remarkable. He saw neither the cheery cottages on the side streets, with their black walls and white bows and red pelargoniums behind the shining window panes, nor the many pretty gardens and avenues, nor the beauty in the weed-clad ruins. His eyes were so filled with the preceding glory that he could not see anything good in the present. The wild geese flew back and forth over the city a couple of times so that Thimbitod might see everything. Finally, they sank down on the grass-grown floor of a cathedral ruin to spend the night. When they had arranged themselves for sleep, Thimbitod was still awake and looked up through the open arches to the pale pink evening sky. When he had been sitting there for a while, he thought he didn't want to grieve any more because he couldn't save the buried city. No. That he didn't want to do, now that he'd seen this one. If that city, which he'd seen, had not sunk into the sea again, then it would perhaps become as dilapidated as this one in a little while. Perhaps it could not have withstood time and decay, but would have stood there with roofless churches and bare houses and desolate, empty streets just like this one. Then it was better that it should remain in all its glory down in the deep. It was best that it happened as it happened, thought he. If I had the power to save the city, I don't believe that I should care to do it. Then he no longer grieved over that matter. 
And there are probably many among the young who think in the same way. But when people are old and have become accustomed to being satisfied with little, then they are more happy over the visby that exists than over a magnificent vinetta at the bottom of the sea. Chapter 15 The Legend of Smallland Tuesday, April 12th The wild geese had made a good trip over the sea and had lighted in Just Township, in northern Smallland. That township didn't seem able to make up its mind whether it wanted to be land or sea. Fjords ran in everywhere and cut the land up into islands and peninsulas and points and capes. The sea was so forceful that the only things which could hold themselves above it were hills and mountains. All the lowlands were hidden away under the water exterior. It was evening when the wild geese came in from the sea, and the land with the little hills lay prettily between the shimmering fjords. Here and there, on the islands, the boy saw cabins and cottages, and the farther inland he came, the bigger and better became the dwelling houses. Finally, they grew into large white manors. Along the shores there was generally a border of trees, and within this lay field plots, and on the tops of the little hills there were trees again. He could not help but think of Bleckinge. Here, again, was a place where land and sea met, in such a pretty and peaceful sort of way, just as if they tried to show each other the best and loveliest which they possessed. The wild geese alighted upon a limestone island a good way in on Goosefjord. With the first glance at the shore, they observed that spring had made rapid strides while they'd been away on the islands. The big, fine trees were not as yet leaf-clad, but the ground under them was brocaded with white anemones, gagea, and blue anemones. When the wild geese saw the flower carpet, they feared that they had lingered too long in the southern part of the country. Acker said instantly that there was no time in which to hunt up any of the stopping places in Smallland. By the next morning they must travel northward over Ustergotland. The boy should then see nothing of Smallland, and this grieved him. He had heard more about Smallland than he had about any other province, and he longed to see it with his own eyes. The summer before, when he had served as goose boy with a farmer in the neighbourhood of Jordberger, he had met a pair of Smallland children almost every day, who also tended geese. These children had irritated him terribly with their Smallland. It wasn't fair to say that Osa, the goose girl, had annoyed him. She was much too wise for that but the one who could be aggravated with a vengeance was her brother, Little Mats. "'Have you heard, Nils Goose Boy, how it went when Smolland and Skane were created?' he would ask, and if Nils Holgerson said no, he began immediately to relate the old joke legend. "'Well, it was at that time when our Lord was creating the world. While he was doing his best work, St Peter came walking by. He stopped and looked on, and then he asked if it was hard to do.' "'Well, it isn't exactly easy,' said our Lord. "'St. Peter stood there a little longer, "'and when he noticed how easy it was "'to lay out one landscape after another, "'he too wanted to try his hand at it. "'Perhaps you need to rest yourself a little,' said St. Peter. "'I could attend to the work in the meantime for you. "'But this our Lord did not wish. "'I do not know if you are so much at home in this art "'that I can trust you to take hold where I leave off,' he answered. "'Then St. Peter was angry and said that he believed "'he could create just as fine countries as our Lord himself. "'It happened that our Lord was just then creating Smallland. Uh, "'It wasn't even half ready, but it looked as though "'it would be an indescribably pretty and fertile land. "'It was difficult for our Lord to say no to St. Peter, "'and aside from this he thought very likely "'that a thing so well begun no one could spoil.' Uh, therefore he said, if you like, we will prove which one of us two understands this sort of work the better. Uh, you who are only novice shall go on with this which I've begun, and I will create a new land. To this St. Peter agreed at once, and so they went to work, each one in his place. Our Lord moved southward a bit, and there he undertook to create Skane. It wasn't long before he was through with it, and soon he asked if St. Peter was finished, and would come and look at his work. "'I had mine ready long ago,' said St. Peter, "'and from the sound of his voice it could be heard "'how pleased he was from what he'd accomplished. And "'Then St. Peter saw Skane. "'He had to acknowledge that there was nothing but good "'to be said of that land. "'It was a fertile land and easy to cultivate, "'with wide plains wherever one looked, "'and hardly a sign of hills. 
It was evident that our Lord had really contemplated making it such that people should feel at home there. Yes, this is a good country, said St. Peter. But I think that mine is wetter. Then we'll take a look at it, said our Lord. The land was already finished in the north and east when St. Peter began the work, but the southern and western parts and the whole interior he created all by himself. Now, when our Lord came up there, where St. Peter had been at work, he was so horrified that he stopped short and exclaimed, What on earth have you been doing with this land, St. Peter? St. Peter, too, stood and looked around, perfectly astonished. He had had the idea that nothing could be so good for a land as a great deal of warmth. Therefore he'd gathered together an enormous mass of stones and mountains, and erected a highland, and this he'd done so that it should be near the sun, and receive much help from the sun's heat. Over the stone heaps he'd spread a thin layer of soil, and then he had thought that everything was well arranged. But while he was down in Skane, a couple of heavy showers had come up, and more was not needed to show what his work amounted to. When our Lord came to inspect the land, all the soil had been washed away, and the naked mountain foundation shone forth all over. Where it was about the vest lay clay and heavy gravel over the rocks, but it looked so poor that it was easy to understand that hardly anything except spruce and juniper and moss and heather could grow there. But what there was was plenty of water. It had filled up all the clefts in the mountain and lakes and rivers and brooks. These one saw everywhere, to say nothing of swamps and morasses, uh, which spread over large tracts. And the most exasperating thing of all was that while some tracts had too much water, it was so scarce in others that whole fields lay like dry moors, where sand and earth whirled up in clouds with the least little breeze. "'What can have been your meaning in creating such a land as this?' said our Lord. St. Peter made excuses and declared he'd wished to build up a land so high that it should have plenty of warmth from the sun. "'But then you will also get much of the night chill,' said our Lord, "'for that too comes from heaven. I am very much afraid the little that can grow here will freeze.' And "'This, to be sure, St. Peter hadn't thought about.' "'Yes, here it will be a poor and frost-bound land,' said our Lord. "'It can't be helped.' When little Matt had got this far in his story, oh, sir, the goose girl protested, "'I cannot bear, little Matt, to hear you say that it's so miserable in Smallland,' said she. "'You forget entirely how much good soil there is there. "'Only think of Mur district by Calmer Sound. "'I wonder where you'll find a richer grain region. "'There are fields upon fields, just like here in Skane. "'The soil's so good, I cannot imagine anything that—' couldn't grow there i can't help that said little mats i'm only relating what others have said before and i have heard many say there's not more beautiful coastland than just think of the bays and islets and the manors and the groves said osa yes that's true enough little mats admitted and don't you remember continued osa the school teacher said that such a lively and picturesque district as that bit of Smolland, which lies south of Lake Vettern, is not to be found in all Sweden. Think of the beautiful sea and the yellow coast mountains, and of Grenna and Jan Coping with its smash factory. And think of Husqvarna and all the big establishments there. Uh, yes, that's true enough said little Max once again. And think of Visingso, little Max, with the ruins and the oak forests and the legends. Think of the valley through which the Emmon flows with all the villages and flour mills and sawmills and the carpenter shops. Oh, yes, that is true enough, said little Max, and looked troubled. All of a sudden he looked up. Now, we are pretty stupid, said he. All this, of course, lies in our Lord Smallland, in that part of the land which was already finished when St. Peter undertook the job. It's only natural that it should be pretty and fine there, uh, but in St. Peter's Smallland it looks as it says in the legend, and it wasn't surprising that our Lord was distressed when he saw it, continued little Max, as he took up the thread of his story again. St. Peter didn't lose his courage at all events, but tried to comfort our Lord. Don't be so grieved over this, said he. "'Only wait until I've created people who can till the swamps "'and break up fields from the stone hills.' Uh, "'That was the end of our Lord's patience, and he said, "'No, you can go down to Skane and make the Skaneinge, "'but the Smallunder I will create myself.' Uh, "'And so our Lord created the Smallunder "'and made him quick-witted and contented and happy "'and thrifty and enterprising and capable uh, "'that he might be able to get his livelihood in his poor country.' "'Then little Max was silent.' And if Niels Holgersen had also kept still, all would have gone well. 
but he couldn't possibly refrain from asking how St. Peter had succeeded in creating the Scanninge. "'Well, what do you think yourself?' said little Mats, and looked so scornful that Nils Holgersen threw himself upon him to thrash him. But Mats was only a little tot, and also the goose girl, who was a year older than he, ran forward instantly to help him. Good-natured though she was, she sprang like a lion as soon as anyone touched her brother. And Nils Holgersen did not care to fight a girl, but turned his back and didn't look at those small and children for the rest of the day. Chapter 16 The Crows Part 1 The Earthen Croc In the southwest corner of Smoland lies a township called Sonobo. It is a rather smooth and even country, and one who sees it in winter, when it is covered with snow, cannot imagine that there is anything under the snow but garden plots, rye fields and clover meadows, as is generally the case in flat countries. But in the beginning of April, when the snow finally melts away in Sonobo, it is apparent that that which lies hidden under it is only dry, sandy heaths, bare rocks and big, marshy swamps. There are fields here and there, to be sure, but they are so small that they're scarcely worth mentioning, and one also finds a few little red or grey farmhouses hidden away in some beech coppice, almost as if they were afraid to show themselves. Where Sonobo Township touches the boundaries of Halland, there's a sandy heath which is so far-reaching that he who stands upon one edge of it cannot look across to the other. Nothing except heather grows on the heath, and it wouldn't be easy either to coax other growths to thrive there. To start with, one would have to uproot the heather, for it is thus with heather, although it has only a little shrunken root, small shrunken branches and dry shrunken leaves, it fancies that it is a tree, and therefore it acts just like real trees, spreads itself out in forest fashion over wide areas, holds together faithfully, and causes all foreign growths that wish to crowd in upon its territory to die out. The only place on the heath where the heather is not all powerful is a low stony ridge which passes over it. There you'll find juniper bushes, mountain ash, and a few large, fine oaks. At the time when Nils Holgersen travelled around with the wild geese, a little cabin stood there with a bit of cleared ground around it. But the people who had lived there at one time had, for some reason or other, moved away. The little cabin was empty, and the ground lay unused. When the tenants left the cabin, they closed the damper, fastened the window hooks and locked the door. But no one had thought of the broken window pane which was only stuffed with a rag. After the showers of a couple of summers, the rag had moulded and shrunk, and finally a crow had succeeded in poking it out. The ridge on the heather heath was really not as desolate as one might think, for it was inhabited by a large crow folk. Naturally, the crows did not live there all the year round. They moved to foreign lands in the winter. In the autumn, they travelled from one grain field to another all over Gotterland and picked grain. And during the summer, they spread themselves over the farms in Sonobo Township and lived upon eggs and berries and birdlings. But every spring, when nesting time came, they came back to the heather heath. The one who had poked the rag from the window was a crowcock named Garm Whitefeather, but he was never called anything but Fumley or Drumley or out-and-out out Fumley Drumley, because he always acted awkwardly and stupidly and wasn't good for anything except to make fun of. Fumley Drumley was bigger and stronger than any of the other crows, but that didn't help him in the least. He was and remained a butt for ridicule, and it didn't profit him either that he came from very good stock. If everything had gone smoothly, he should have been leader for the whole flock, because this honour had, from time immemorial, belonged to the oldest white feather. But long before Fumley Drumley was born, the power had gone from his family and was now wielded by a cruel wild crow named Windrush. This transference of power was due to the fact that the crows on Crow Ridge desired to change their manner of living. Possibly, there are many who think that everything in the shape of crow lives in the same way, but this is not so. There are entire crow folk who lead honourable lives, that is to say, they only eat grain, worms, caterpillars and dead animals, and there are others who lead regular bandits' life, 
who throw themselves upon baby hares and small birds and plunder every single bird's nest they set eyes on. The ancient white feathers had been strict and temperate, and as long as they had led the flock, the crows had been compelled to conduct themselves in such a way that other birds could speak no ill of them. But the crows were numerous, and poverty was great among them. and They didn't care to go the whole length of living a strictly moral life, so they rebelled against the white feathers and gave the power to Windrush, who was the worst nest plunderer and robber that could be imagined if his wife, Windair, wasn't worse still. Under their government, the crows had begun to lead such a life that now they were more feared than pigeon hawks and leech owls. Naturally, Fumley Drumley had nothing to say in the flock. The crows were all of the opinion that he did not in the least take after his forefathers and that he wouldn't suit as a leader. No one would have mentioned him if he hadn't constantly committed fresh blunders. A few sometimes said, perhaps, it was lucky for Fumley Drumley that he was such a bungling idiot, otherwise Windrush and Windair would hardly have allowed him, who was of the old chieftain stock, to remain with the flock. Now, on the other hand, they were rather friendly toward him and willingly took him along with them on their hunting expeditions. There all could observe how much more skilful and daring they were than he. None of the crows knew that it was Fumley Drumley who had pecked the rag out of the window, and had they known of this, they would have been very much astonished. Such a thing as daring to approach a human being's dwelling, they had never believed of him. He kept the thing to himself very carefully, and he had his own good reasons for it. Windrush always treated him well in the daytime, and when others were around, but one very dark night, when the comrade sat on the night branch, he was attacked by a couple of crows and nearly murdered. After that, he moved every night, after dark, from pin quarters into the empty cabin. Now, one afternoon, when the crows had put their nests in order on Crow Ridge, they happened upon a remarkable find. Windrush, Family Drumley and a couple of others had flown down into a big hollow in one corner of the heath. The hollow was nothing but a gravel pit, but the crows could not be satisfied with such a simple explanation. They flew down in it continually and turned every single sand grain to get at the reason why human beings had dug it. While the crows were pottering around down there, a mass of gravel fell from one side. They rushed up to it and had the good fortune to find amongst the fallen stones and stubble a large earthen crock, which was locked with a wooden clasp. Naturally, they wanted to know if there was anything in it, and they tried both to peck holes in the crock and to bend up the clasp, but they had no success. They stood perfectly helpless and examined the crock. When they heard someone say, "'Shall I come down and assist you, crows?' They glanced up quickly. On the edge of the hollow sat a fox, and blinked down at them. He was one of the prettiest foxes, both in colour and form, that they had ever seen. The only fault with him was that he had lost an ear. Brrr, "'If you desire to do us a service,' said Windrush, Brrr, "'we shall not say nay.' At the same time, both he and the others flew up from the hollow. Then the fox jumped down in their place, bit at the jar, and pulled at the lock, but he couldn't open it either. "'When you make out what there is in it,' said Windrush. The fox rolled the jar back and forth and listened attentively. "'It must be silver money,' said he. This was more than the crows had expected. "'Do you think it can be silver?' said they, and their eyes were ready to pop out of their heads with greed, for, remarkable as it may sound, there is nothing in the world which crows love as much as silver money. "'Hear how it rattles!' said the fox, and rolled the crock around once more. "'Only I can't understand how we shall get at it.' "'That will surely be impossible,' said the crows. The fox stood, and rubbed his head against his left leg, and pondered. Now, perhaps he might succeed, with the help of the crows, in becoming master of that little imp who always eluded him. "'Oh, I know someone who could open the crock for you,' said the fox. Brr, "'Tell us, brr, tell us!' cried the crows, and they were so excited that they tumbled down into the pit. "'That I will do, if you'll first promise me that you will agree to my terms,' said he. 
Then the fox told the crows about Thumbietot, and said that if they could bring him to the heath, he would open the crock for them. But in payment for this counsel, he demanded that they should deliver Thumbietot to him as soon as he had got the silver money for them. The crows had no reason to spare Thumbietot, so agreed to the compact at once. It was easy enough to agree to this, but it was harder to find out where Thumbietot and the wild geese were stopping. Windrush himself travelled away with fifty crows and said that he would soon return. But one day after another passed, without the crows on Crow Ridge seeing a shadow of him. Part 2 Kidnapped by Crows Wednesday, April 13th The wild geese were up at daybreak, so they should have time to get themselves a bite of food before starting out on the journey towards Ostergutland. The island in Gussifjord where they had slept was small and barren, but in the water all around it were growths which they could eat their fill upon. It was worse for the boy, however. He couldn't manage to find anything eatable. As he stood there, hungry and drowsy, and looked around in all directions, his glance fell upon a pair of squirrels who played upon the wooded point, directly opposite the rock island. He wondered if the squirrels still had any of their winter supplies left, and asked the white goosey gander to take him over to the point that he might beg them for a couple of hazelnuts. Instantly the white one swam across the sound with him. But, as luck would have it, the squirrels had so much fun chasing each other from tree to tree that they didn't bother about listening to the boy. They drew farther into the grove. He hurried after them, and was soon out of the goosey gander's sight, who stayed behind and waited on the shore. The boy waded forward between some white and anemone stems, which were so high they reached to his chin. When he felt that someone caught hold of him from behind, and tried to lift him up, he turned round and saw that a crow had grabbed him by the shirt-band. He tried to break loose, but before this was possible, another crow ran up, gripped him by the stocking, and knocked him over. If Nils Holgersen had immediately cried for help, the white goosey gander certainly would have been able to save him, but the boy probably thought that he could protect himself, unaided, against a couple of crows. He kicked and struck out, but the crows didn't let go their hold, and they soon succeeded into the air with him. To make matters worse, they flew so recklessly that his head struck against a branch. He received a hard knock over the head. It grew black before his eyes, and he lost consciousness. When he opened his eyes once more, he found himself high above the ground. He regained his senses slowly. At first he knew neither where he was nor what he saw. When he glanced down, he saw that under him was spread a tremendously big woolly carpet, which was woven in greens and reds and in large irregular patterns. The carpet was very thick and fine, but he thought it was a pity that it had been so badly used. It was actually ragged, long tears ran through it, in some places large pieces were torn away, and the strangest of all was it appeared to be spread over a mirror floor, for under the holes and tears in the carpet shone bright and glittering glass. The next thing that the boy observed was that the sun unrolled itself in the heavens. Instantly the mirror glass under the holes and tears in the carpet began to shimmer in red and gold. It looked very gorgeous, and the boy was delighted with the pretty colour scheme, although he didn't exactly understand what it was that he saw. But now the crows descended, and he saw at once that the big carpet under him was the earth which was dressed in green and brown cone trees and naked leaf trees, and that the holes and tears were shining fjords and little lakes. He remembered that the first time he had travelled up in the air, he had thought that the earth in Skane looked like a piece of checked cloth, but this country, which resembled a torn carpet, what might this be? He began to ask himself a lot of questions. Why wasn't he sitting on the goosey gander's back? Why did a great swarm of crows fly around him? And why was he being pulled and knocked hither and thither so that he was about to break to pieces? Then, all at once, the whole thing dawned on him. He had been kidnapped by a couple of crows. The white goosey gander was still on the shore, waiting, and today the wild geese were going to travel to Ustergotland. He was being carried southwest. This he understood because the sun's disk was behind him. The big forest carpet which lay beneath him was surely Smolland. 
"'What will become of the goosey gander now "'when I cannot look after him?' thought the boy, "'and began to call the crows to take him back to the wild geese instantly. "'He wasn't at all uneasy on his own account. "'He believed that they were carrying him off "'simply in a spirit of mischief. "'The crows didn't pay the slightest attention to his exhortations, "'but flew on as fast as they could. "'After a bit, one of them flapped his wings in a manner which meant, "'Look out, danger!' Soon thereafter they came down in the spruce forest, pushed their way between prickly branches to the ground, and put the boy down under a thick spruce, where he was so well concealed that not even a falcon could have sighted him. Fifty crows surrounded him, with bills pointed toward him to guard him. "'Now perhaps I may hear crows what your purpose is in carrying me off,' said he. But he was hardly permitted to finish the sentence before a big crow hissed at him, "'Reap still, or I'll bore your eyes out!' It was evident that the crow meant what she said, and there was nothing for the boy to do but obey. So he sat there and stared at the crows, and the crows stared at him. The longer he looked at them, the less he liked them. It was dreadful how dusty and unkempt their feather dresses were, as though they knew neither baths nor oiling. And their toes and claws were grimy with dried-in mud, and the corners of their mouths were covered with food drippings. These were very different from the wild geese, that he observed. He thought they had a cruel, sneaky, watchful and bold appearance, just like cutthroats and vagabonds. It is certainly a real robber band that I've fallen in with, thought he. Just then he heard the wild geese's call above him, "'Where are you? Here am I! Where are you? Here am I!' He understood that Acker and the others had gone out to search for him, but before he could answer them, the big crow, who appeared to be the leader of the band, hissed in his ear, "'Drink of your eyes!' And there was nothing else for him to do but to keep still. The wild geese may not have known that he was so near them, but had just happened incidentally to travel over this forest. He heard their call a couple of times more, then it died away. "'Well, now, you'll have to get along by yourself, Nils Hoggerson,' he said to himself. "'Now you must prove whether you have learned anything during these weeks in the open.' A moment later the crows gave the signal to break up, and since it was still their intention, apparently, to carry him along in such a way that one held on to his shirt-band and one to a stocking, the boy said, "'Is there not one among you so strong that he can carry me on his back? "'You've already travelled so badly with me that I feel as if I were in pieces. "'Only let me ride. I'll not jump from the crow's back. "'That I promise you. "'You needn't think that we care about how you have it,' said the leader. "'But now the largest of the crows, a dishevelled and uncouth one "'who had a white feather in his wing, came forward and said, it would certainly be best for all of us, Windrush, if Brumbytot got there whole rather than Brumbarf, and therefore I shall carry him on my back. If you can do it, family Brumley, I have no objection, said Windrush, but don't lose him. With this, much was already gained, and the boy actually felt pleased again. There's nothing to be gained by losing my grit, because I've been kidnapped by the crows, thought he. I'll surely be able to manage these poor little things. The crows continued to fly southwest over Smolland. It was a glorious morning, sunny and calm, and the birds down on the earth were singing their best love songs. In a high, dark forest sat the thrush himself, with drooping wings and swelling throat, and struck up tune after tune. "'How pretty you are! How pretty you are! How pretty you are!' sang he. "'No one is so pretty! No one is so pretty! No one is so pretty!' As soon as he had finished this song, he began it all over again. But just then the boy rode over the forest, and when he'd heard the song a couple of times and marked that the thrush knew no other, he put both hands up to his mouth as a speaking trumpet and called down, "'We've heard all this before! We've heard all this before!' "'Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Who makes fun of me?' asked the thrush, and tried to catch a glimpse of the one who called. "'It is kidnapped by crows who makes fun of your song,' answered the boy. At that the crow chief turned his head and said, "'Be careful of your eyes, Prumbytot. But the boy thought, "'Oh, I don't care about that. I want to show you that I'm not afraid of you.' Farther and farther inland they travelled, and there were woods and lakes everywhere. In a birch grove sat the wood dove on a naked branch, and before him stood the lady dove, 
He blew up his feathers, cocked his head, raised and lowered his body until the breast feathers rattled against the branch. All the while he cooed, Thou, thou, thou art the loveliest in all the forest. No one in the forest is so lovely as thou, thou, thou. But up in the air the boy rode past, and when he heard Mr. Dove he couldn't keep still. Don't you believe him, don't you believe him, cried he. Pooh, who, who is it that lies about me? cooed Mr. Duff, and tried to get a sight of the one who shrieked at him. It is caught by crows that lies about you, replied the boy. Again, Windrush turned his head, but Fumley Drumley, who was carrying him, said, Let him chatter, then all the little birds will think that we crows have become quick witted and funny birds. They're not such fools either, said Windrush, but he liked the idea just the same for after that he let the boy call out as much as he liked. They flew mostly over forests and woodlands, but there were churches and parishes and little cabins in the outskirts of the forest. In one place they saw a pretty old manor. It lay with the forest back of it, and the sea in front of it had red walls and a turreted roof, great sycamores about the grounds and big, thick gooseberry bushes in the orchard. On the top of the weathercock sat the starling, and sang so loud that every note was heard by the wife, who sat on an egg in the heart of a pear tree. "'We have four pretty little eggs,' sang the starling. "'We have four pretty little round eggs. We have the whole nest filled with fine eggs.' When the starling sang the song for the thousandth time, the boy rode over the place. He put his hands up to his mouth as a pipe and called, "'The magpie will get them. The magpie will get them. "'Who is this who wants to frighten me?' asked the starling, and flapped his wings uneasily. "'It is captured by crows that frightens you,' said the boy. This time the crow chief didn't attempt to hush him up. Instead, both he and his flock were having so much fun that they cawed with satisfaction. The farther inland they came, the larger were the lakes, and the more plentiful were the islands and points. And on a lake shore stood a drake, and kowtowed before the duck. "'I'll be true to you all the days of my life. "'I'll be true to you all the days of my life,' said the drake. "'It won't last till the summer's end,' shrieked the boy. "'Who are you?' called the drake. "'My name's stolen by crows,' shrieked the boy. "'At dinner-time the crows lighted in a food grove. "'They walked about and procured food for themselves, "'but none of them thought about giving the boy anything. "'Then Fumley Drumley came riding up to the chief "'with a dog-rose branch, with a few dried buds on it. There is something for you, Brinrush, said he. This is pretty food and suitable for you. Windrush sniffed contemptuously. Do you think that I want to eat old dry buds, said he. And I, who thought you would be pleased with them, said Family Drumley, and threw away the dog rose branches, if in despair. But it fell right in front of the boy, and he wasn't slow about grabbing it and eating until he was satisfied. When the crows had eaten, they began to chatter. "'What are you thinking about, Brindrush? You're so bright today,' said one of them to the leader. "'I'm thinking that in this district there lived once upon a time a hen who was very fond of her mistress, and in order to really please her she went and made a nest full of eggs, which she hid under the storehouse floor. The mistress of the house wondered, of course, where the hen was bleeping herself such a long time. She perched for her, but did not blind her. Can you bless Longbill who it was that browned her in the eggs?' But I think I can guess it, Brinbrush, but when you've told about this, I will tell you something like it. Do you remember the big black cat in Hinnity's parish house? She was dissatisfied because they always took the newborn Britons from her and browned them. Just once did she succeed in briefing and concealed, and that was when she had laid him in a haystack outdoors. She was pretty well breezed with those young kittens, but I believe that I got more pleasure out of them than she did. Now they became so excited that they all talked at once. What kind of an accomplishment is that to steal little Britons? said one. I once chased a young hare who was almost full grown. Brat meant to follow him from covert to covert. He got no further before another took the words from him. It may be fun, perhaps, to annoy hens and cats, but I find it still more remarkable that a blow can worry a human being. I once stole a silver spoon. But now the boy thought he was too good to sit and listen to such gabble. Now listen to me, you crows, said he. I think you ought to be ashamed of yourselves to talk about all your wickedness. 
I have lived amongst wild geese for three weeks, and of them I have never heard or seen anything but good. You must have a bad chief, since he permits you to rob and murder in this way. You ought to begin to lead new lives, for I can tell you that human beings have grown so tired of your wickedness that they're trying with all their might to reach you out, and then there will soon be an end of you. When Windrush and the crows heard this, they were so furious they intended to throw themselves upon him and tear him in pieces. But Family Drumley laughed and cawed and stood in front of him. Oh, no, no, said he, and seemed absolutely terrified. What think you that Brinne will say if you tear Thumbitot in pieces before he's got that silver brunny for us? It has to be you, Family Drumley, that's afraid of women folk said Rush, but at any rate both he and the others left Thumbietot in peace. Shortly after that the crows went further. Until now the boy thought that Smolland wasn't such a poor country as he had heard. Of course it was woody and full of mountain ridges, but alongside the islands and lakes lay cultivated grounds and any real desolation he hadn't come upon. But the farther inland they came, the fewer were the villages and cottages. Toward the last he thought that he was riding over a veritable wilderness where he saw nothing but swamps and heaths and juniper hills. The sun had gone down, but it was still perfect daylight when the crows reached the large heather heath. Windrush sent a crow on ahead to say that he met with success, and when it was known, Windair, with several hundred crows from Crow Ridge, flew to meet the arrivals. In the midst of the deafening cawing which the crows emitted, Family Drumley said to the boy, "'You have been so bromical and so brolly during the trip that I'm really fond of you. Therefore I want to give you some good advice. As soon as we light, you'll be requested to brew a bit of work, which may seem very easy to you, but beware of doing it.' Soon thereafter, Family Drumley put Nils Hoggerson down in the bottom of a sandpit. The boy flung himself down, rolled over, and lay there as though he was simply done with fatigue. Such a lot of crows fluttered about him that the air rustled like a windstorm, but he didn't look up. Brummy top, said Windrush, right up now. You shall help us with a bratter which will be very easy for you. The boy didn't move, but pretended to be asleep. Then Windrush took him by the arm and dragged him over the sands to an earthen crock of old-time make that was standing in the pit. Bret up, Thumbietot, said he, and open this crock. Why can't you let me sleep? said the boy. I'm too tired to do anything tonight. Wait until tomorrow. Open the crock, said Windrush, shaking him. How shall a poor little child be able to open such a crock? Why, it's quite as large as I am myself. Open it, commanded Windrush once more. Oh, it will be a sorry thing for you. The boy got up, tottered over to the crock, fumbled the clasp, and let his arms fall. I'm not usually so weak, said he. If you will only let me sleep until morning, I think that I'll be able to manage with that clasp. But Windrush was impatient, and he rushed forward and pinched the boy in the leg. That sort of treatment the boy didn't care to suffer from a crow. He jerked himself loose quickly, ran a couple of paces backward, drew his knife from the sheath, and held it extended in front of him. "'You'd better be careful,' he cried to Windrush. This one, too, was so enraged that he didn't dodge the danger. He rushed at the boy, just as though he'd been blind, and ran so straight into the knife that it entered through his eye into the head. The boy drew the knife back quickly, but Windrush only struck out with his wings. Then he fell down, dead. Brinrush is dead! The strangers killed our chieftain, Brinrush! cried the nearest crows, and then there was a terrible uproar. Some wailed, others cried for vengeance. They all ran or fluttered up to the boy, with Family Drumley in the lead. But he acted badly as usual. He only fluttered and spread his wings over the boy, and prevented the others from coming forward and running their bills into him. The boy thought that things looked very bad for him now. He couldn't run away from the crows, and there was no place where he could hide. Then he happened to think of the earthen crock. He took a firm hold on the clasp and pulled it off. Then he hopped into the crock to hide in it. But the crock was a poor hiding place, for it was nearly filled to the brim with little, thin, silver coins. The boy couldn't get far enough down, so he stooped and began to throw out the coins. Until now. The crows had fluttered around him in a thick swarm and pecked at him, but when he threw out the coins, they immediately forgot their thirst for vengeance and hurried to gather the money.
The boy threw out handfuls of it, and all the crows, yes, even Windair herself, picked them up, and everyone who succeeded in picking up a coin ran off to the nest with the utmost speed to conceal it. When the boy had thrown out all the silver pennies from the crock, he glanced up. Not more than a single crow was left in the sandpit. That was Fumley Drumley, with the white feather in his wing, he who had carried Thumby Tot. "'You have rendered me a greater service than you understand,' said the crow, with a very different voice and a different intonation than the one he'd used heretofore. "'But I want to save your life. Sit down on my back, and I will take you to a hiding place where you can be secure for tonight. Tomorrow I'll arrange it so that you will get back to the wild geese.' Part 3 the Cabin. Thursday, April 14th. The following morning, when the boy awoke, he lay in a bed. When he saw that he was in a house with four walls around him and a roof over him, he thought he was at home. I wonder if mother will come soon with some coffee, he muttered to himself, where he lay awake. And then he remembered that he was in a deserted cabin on the Crow Ridge, and that Fumley Drumley, with the white feather, had borne him there the night before. The boy was sore all over after the journey he'd made the day before, and he thought it was lovely to lie still while he waited for Fumley Drumley, who had promised to come and fetch him. Curtains of checked cotton hung before the bed, and he drew them aside to look out into the cabin. It dawned upon him instantly that he'd never seen the mate to a cabin like this. The walls consisted of nothing but a couple of rows of logs, and then the roof began. There was no interior ceiling, so he could look clear up to the roof tree. The cabin was so small that it appeared to have been built rather for such as he than for real people. However, the fireplace and chimney were so large he thought that he had never seen larger. The entrance door was in a gable wall at the side of the fireplace, and was so narrow that it was more like a wicket than a door. In the other gable wall he saw a low and broad window with many panes. There was scarcely any movable furniture in the cabin. The bench on one side and the table under the window were also stationary, also the big bed where he lay and the many-coloured cupboard. The boy could not help wondering who owned the cabin and why it was deserted. It certainly looked as though the people who had lived there expected to return. The coffee urn and the gruel pot stood on the hearth, and there was some wood in the fireplace. The oven rake and baker's peel stood in a corner. The spinning wheel was raised on a bench. On the shelf over the window lay oakum and flax, a couple of skeins of yarn, a candle and a bunch of matches. Yes, it surely looked as if those who had lived there had intended to come back. There were bedclothes on the bed, and on the walls there still hung long strips of cloth, upon which three riders named Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar were painted. The same horses and riders were pictured many times. They rode around the whole cabin and continued their ride, even up toward the joists. But in the roof the boy saw something which brought him to his senses in a jiffy. It was a couple of loaves of big bread cakes that hung there upon a spit. They looked old and mouldy, but it was bread all the same. He gave them a knock with the oven rake, and one piece fell to the floor. He ate and stuffed his bag full. It was incredible how good the bread was anyway. He looked around the cabin once more to try and discover if there was anything else which he might find useful to take along. I may as well take what I need, since no one else cares about it, thought he, but most of the things were too big and heavy. The only thing that he could carry might be a few matches, perhaps. He clambered up on the table and swung, with the help of the curtains, up to the window shelf. While he stood there and stuffed the matches in his bag, the crow and the white feather came in through the window. "'Well, here I am at last,' said Family Drumley, as he lit upon the table. Oh, "'I couldn't get here any sooner, but because we crows had elected a new chieftain in Windrush's place.' "'Oh, whom have you chosen?' said the boy. "'Well, we have chosen one who will not permit robbery and injustice. We have elected Garm Brightfeather, lately called Family Drumley,' answered he, drawing himself up until he looked absolutely regal. "'That was a good choice,' said the boy, and congratulated him. "'You well may wish me luck,' said Garm. Then he told the boy about the time they had had with Rindrush and Windair. During this recital the boy heard a voice outside the window which he thought sounded familiar. "'Is he here?' inquired the fox. "'Yes, he's hidden in there,' answered a crow voice. 
"'Be careful, Thumbietot,' cried Garm. "'Rinder stands without with that fox who wants to eat you.' More he didn't have time to say, for Smur dashed against the window. The old rotten window frame gave way, and the next second Smur stood upon the window table. Garm Whitefeather, who didn't have time to fly away, he killed instantly. Thereupon he jumped down to the floor and looked around for the boy. He tried to hide behind a big oakum spiral, but Smur had already spied him and was crouched for the final spring. The cabin was so small and so low, the boy understood that the fox could reach him without the least difficulty. But just at that moment the boy was not without weapons of defence. He struck a match quickly, touched the curtains, and when they were in flames he threw them down upon Smurf Fox. When the fire enveloped the fox he was seized with a mad terror. He thought no more about the boy, but rushed wildly out of the cabin. But it looked as if the boy had escaped one danger to throw himself into a greater one. From the tuft of oakum which he had flung at Smur, the fire had spread to the bed hangings. He jumped down and tried to smother it, but it blazed too quickly now. The cabin soon filled with smoke, and Smur Fox, who had remained just outside the window, began to grasp the state of affairs within. "'Well, Thumbietot, he called out, "'which do you choose now, to be broiled alive in there?' or to come out here to me. Of course, I should prefer to have the pleasure of eating you, but in whichever way death meets you, it will be dear to me. The boy could not think but what the fox was right, for the fire was making rapid headway. The whole bed was now in a blaze, and smoke rose from the floor, and along the painted wall strips the fire crept from rider to rider. The boy jumped up in the fireplace and tried to open the oven door, when he heard a key which turned around slowly in the lock. It must be human beings coming, and in the dire extremity in which he found himself, he was not afraid, but only glad. He was already on the threshold when the door opened. He saw a couple of children facing him, but how they looked when they saw the cabin in flames. He took no time to find out, but rushed past them out into the open. He didn't dare run far. He knew, of course, that Spur Fox lay in wait for him, and he understood that he must remain near the children. He turned round to see what sort of folk they were, but he hadn't looked at them a second before he ran up to them and cried, "'Oh, good day! Oh, goose girl! Oh, good day, little mats!' For when the boy saw these children, he forgot entirely where he was. Crows and bony cabin and talking animals had vanished from his memory. He was walking on a stubble field in West Vemminghog, tending a goose flock, and beside him on the field walked those same Smolens children with their geese. But when the children saw such a little creature coming up to them with outstretched hands, they grabbed hold of each other, took a couple of steps backward and looked scared to death. When the boy noticed their terror, he woke up and remembered who he was, and then it seemed to him that nothing worse could happen to him than that those children should see how he had been bewitched. Shame and grief, because he was no longer a human being, overpowered him. He turned and fled. He knew not whither. But a glad meeting awaited the boy when he came down to the heath, for there, in the hide, something white, and toward him came the white goosey gander, accompanied by Dunfin. When the white one saw the boy running with such speed, he thought that dreadful fiends were pursuing him. He flung him in all haste upon his back, and flew off with him. Chapter 17 The Old Peasant Woman Thursday, April 14th Three tired wanderers were out in the late evening in search of a night harbour. They travelled over a poor and desolate portion of northern Smolland, but the sort of resting place which they wanted they should have been able to find, for they were no weaklings who asked for soft beds or comfortable rooms. If one of these long mountain ridges had a peak so high and steep that a fox couldn't in any way climb up to it, then we should have a good sleeping place, said one of them. If a single one of the big swamps was thawed out and was so marshy and wet that a fox wouldn't dare venture out on it, this too would be a right good night harbour, said the second. If the ice on one of the large lakes we travelled past were loose, so that a fox could not come out on it, then we should have found just what we are seeking, said the third. The worst of it was that when the sun had gone down, two of the travellers became so sleepy that every second they were ready to fall to the ground. The third one, who could keep himself awake, grew more and more uneasy as night approached. 
Then it was a misfortune that we came to a land where lakes and swamps are frozen, so that a fox can get around everywhere. In other places the ice is melted away, but now we're well up in the very coldest Smallland, where spring has not as yet arrived. I don't know how I shall ever manage to find a good sleeping place. Unless I find some spot that is well protected, Smurf Fox will be upon us before morning. He gazed in all directions, but he saw no shelter where he could lodge. It was a dark and chilly night, with wind and drizzle. It grew more terrible and disagreeable around him every second. This may sound strange, perhaps, but the travellers didn't seem to have the least desire to ask for house room on any farm. They had already passed many parishes without knocking at a single door, little hillside cabins on the outskirts of the forests, which all poor wanderers are glad to run across. They took no notice of either. One might almost be tempted to say they deserved to have a hard time of it, since they did not seek help where it was to be had for the asking. But finally, when it was so dark that there was scarcely a glimmer of light left under the skies, and the two who needed sleep journeyed on in a kind of half-sleep, they happened into a farmyard, which was a long way off from all neighbours. And not only did it lie there desolate, but it appeared to be uninhabited as well. No smoke rose from the chimney, no light shone through the windows, no human being moved on the place. When the one among the three who could keep awake saw the place, he thought, Now, come on, May, we must try to get in here. Anything better we're not likely to find. Soon after that, all three stood in the house yard. Two of them fell asleep the instant they stood still, but the third looked about him eagerly to find where they could get under cover. It was not a small farm. Beside the dwelling-house and stable and smoke-house, there were long ranges with granaries and storehouses and cattle-sheds, but it all looked awfully poor and dilapidated. The houses had grey, moss-grown leaning walls which seemed ready to topple over. In the roofs were yawning holes, and the doors hung aslant on broken hinges. It was apparent that no one had taken the trouble to drive a nail into a wall on this place for a long time. Meanwhile, he who was awake had figured out which house was the cowshed. He roused his travelling companions from their sleep and conducted them to the cowshed door. Luckily, this was not fastened with anything but a hook, which he could easily push up with a rod. He heaved a sigh of relief at the thought that they should soon be in safety. But when the cowshed door swung open with a sharp creaking, he heard a cow begin to bellow. "'Are you coming at last, mistress?' said she. I thought you didn't propose to give me any supper tonight. The one who was awake stopped in the doorway, absolutely terrified when he discovered that the cowshed was not empty. But he soon saw that there was not more than one cow and three or four chickens, and then he took courage again. We are three poor travellers who want to come in somewhere where no fox can assail us and no human being capture us, said he. We wonder if this can be a good place for us. I cannot believe but what it is, answered the cow. To be sure, the walls are poor, but the fox does not walk through them as yet, and no one lives here except an old peasant woman, who isn't at all likely to make a captive of anyone. Who are you? She continued, as she twisted in her stall, to get a sight of the newcomers. "'I am Nils Holgerson from Vemminghog, who has been transformed into an elf,' replied the first of the incomers. "'And I have with me a tame goose, whom I generally ride, and a grey goose. "'Such rare guests have never been within my four walls,' said the cow. "'And you shall be welcome, although I would have preferred that it had been my mistress come to give me my supper.' The boy led the geese into the cowshed, which was rather large, and placed them in an empty manger, where they fell asleep instantly. For himself he made a little bed of straw, and expected that he too should go to sleep at once. But this was impossible, for the poor cow, who hadn't had her supper, wasn't still an instant. She shook her flanks, moved around in the stall, and complained of how hungry she was. The boy couldn't get a wink of sleep, but lay there and lived over all the things that had happened to him during these last days. 
He thought of Osa, the goose girl, and little Mats, whom he had encountered so unexpectedly, and he fancied that the little cabin which he had set on fire must have been their old home in Smorland. Now he recalled that he had heard them speak of just such a cabin, and of the big heather heath which lay below it. Now Osa and Mats had wandered back to see their old home again, and then, when they'd reached it, it was in flames. It was indeed a great sorrow which he had brought upon them, and it hurt him very much. If he ever again became a human being, he would try to compensate them for the damage and miscalculation. Then his thoughts wandered to the crows, and when he thought of Family Drumley, who had saved his life, and had met his own death so soon after he'd been elected chieftain, he was so distressed that tears filled his eyes. He had had a pretty rough time of it these last few days, but anyway... It was a rare stroke of luck that the Goosey Gander and Dunfin had found him. The Goosey Gander had said that, as soon as the geese discovered that Thumby Tot had disappeared, they had asked all the small animals in the forest about him. They soon learned that a flock of small and crows had carried him off. But the crows were already out of sight, and whither they had directed their course, no one had been able to say. That they might find the boy as soon as possible, Acker had commanded the wild geese to start out two and two, in different directions to search for him. But after a two days hunt, whether or not they had found him, they were to meet in northwest Smoland on a high mountain top, which resembled an abrupt chopped off tower, and was called Taburg. After Acker had given them the best directions and described carefully how they should find Taburg, they had separated. The white goosey gander had chosen Dunfin as travelling companion, and they had flown about hither and thither with the greatest anxiety for Thumbietot. During this ramble, they had heard a thrush who sat in a treetop cry and wail that someone who called himself kidnapped by crows had made fun of him. They had talked with the thrush, and he had shown them in which direction that kidnapped by crows had travelled. Afterward, they had met a dovecock, a starling, and a drake. They had all wailed about a little culprit who had disturbed their song, and was named Caught by Crows, Captured by Crows, and Stolen by Crows. In this way, they were enabled to trace Thumbietot all the way to the heather heath in Sonobo Township. As soon as the Goosey Gander and Dunvin had found Thumbietot, they had started toward the north in order to reach Taburg, but it had been a long road to travel, and the darkness was upon them before they'd sighted the mountain top. If we only get there by tomorrow, surely all our troubles will be over, thought the boy, and dug down into the straw to have it warmer. All the while the cow fussed and fumed in the stall, then, all of a sudden, she began to talk to the boy. "'Everything is wrong with me,' said the cow. "'I am neither milked nor tended. "'I have no night fodder in my manger, "'and no bed has been made under me. "'My mistress came here at dusk "'to put things in order for me, "'but she felt so ill that she had to go in soon again, and she has not returned. It's distressing that I should be little and powerless, said the boy. I, I don't believe that I'm able to help you. You can't make me believe that you are powerless because you are little, said the cow. All the elves I've ever heard of were so strong that they could pull a whole load of hay and strike a cow dead with one fist. The boy couldn't help laughing at the cow. They were a very different kind of elf from me, said he, but I'll loosen your halter and open the door for you so that you can go out and drink in one of the pools on the place, and then I'll try to climb up to the hayloft and throw down some hay in your manger. Yes, that would be some help, said the cow. The boy did as he had said, and when the cow stood with a full manger in front of her, he thought that at last he should get some sleep. But he had hardly crept down in the bed before she began anew to talk to him. You'll be clean put out with me if I ask you for one thing more, said the cow. Oh, no, I won't, if it's only something that I'm able to do, said the boy. Then I will ask you to go into the cabin directly opposite and find out how my mistress is getting along. I fear some misfortune has come to her. No, I can't do that, said the boy. 
I dare not show myself before human beings. Surely you're not afraid of an old and sick woman, said the cow. But you do not need to go into the cabin. Just stand outside the door and peep in through the crack. Oh, is that all you ask of me? I'll do it, of course, said the boy. With that, he opened the cowshed door and went out into the yard. It was a fearful night. Neither moon nor stars shone. The wind blew a gale, and the rain came down in torrents. And the worst of all was that seven great owls sat in a row on the eaves of the cabin. It was awful just to hear them where they sat and grumbled at the weather. But it was even worse to think what would happen to him if one of them should set eyes on him. That would be the last of him. "'Pity him who is little,' said the boy, as he ventured out in the yard. And he had a right to say this, for he was blown down twice before he got to the house. Once the wind pulled, which was so deep that he came near drowning, but he got there nevertheless. He clambered up a pair of steps, scrambled over a threshold, and came into the hallway. The cabin door was closed, but down in one corner a large piece had been cut away, that the cat might go in and out. It was no difficulty whatever for the boy to see how things were in the cabin. He had hardly cast a glance in there before he staggered back and turned his head away. An old, grey-haired woman lay stretched out on the floor within. She neither moved nor moaned, and her face shone strangely white. It was as if an invisible moon had thrown a feeble light over it. The boy remembered that when his grandfather had died his face had also become so strangely white-like, and he understood that the old woman who lay on the cabin floor must be dead. Death had probably come to her so suddenly that she didn't even have time to lie down on her bed. As he thought of being alone with the dead in the middle of the dark night, he was terribly afraid. He threw himself headlong down the steps and rushed back to the cowshed. When he told the cow what he'd seen in the cabin, she stopped eating. So my mistress is dead, said she. Then it will soon be over for me as well. There will always be someone to look out for you, said the boy comfortingly. Oh, you don't know, said the cow, that I am already twice as old as a cow usually is before she is laid upon a slaughter bench. But then I do not care to live any longer since she in there can come no more to care for me. She said nothing more for a while, but the boy observed, no doubt, that she neither slept nor ate. It was not long before she began to speak again. Is she lying on the bare floor? she asked. She is, said the boy. She had a habit of coming out to the cow shed she continued, and talking about everything that troubled her. I understood what she said, although I could not answer her. These last few days she talked of how afraid she was, lest there would be no one with her when she died. She was anxious for fear no one should close her eyes and fold her hands across her breast after she was dead. Perhaps you'll go in and do this. The boy hesitated. He remembered that when his grandfather had died, mother had been very careful about putting everything to rights. He knew this was something which had to be done, but on the other hand he felt that he didn't care go to the dead in the ghastly night. He didn't say no. Neither did he take a step toward the cowshed door. For a couple of seconds, the old cow was silent, just as if she had expected an answer. But when the boy said nothing, she did not repeat her request. Instead, she began to talk with him of her mistress. There was much to tell, first and foremost about all the children which she had brought up, they had been in the cowshed every day, and in the summer they had taken the cattle to pasture on the swamp and in the groves, so the old cow knew all about them. They had been splendid, all of them, and happy and industrious. A cow knew well enough what her caretakers were good for. 
there was also much to be said about the farm. It had not always been as poor as it was now. It was very large, although the greater part of it consisted of swamps and stony groves. There was not much room for fields, but there was plenty of good fodder everywhere. At one time there had been a cow for every stall in the cowshed, and the oakshed, which was now empty, had at one time been filled with oxen. And then there was life and gaiety, both in the cabin and the cowhouse. When the mistress opened the cowshed door, she would hum and sing, and all the cows lowed with gladness when they heard her coming. But the good man had died when the children were so small that they could not be of any assistance, and the mistress had to take charge of the farm, and all the work and responsibility. She had been as strong as a man, and had both ploughed and reaped. In the evenings, when she came into the cowshed to milk, sometimes she was so tired that she wept. Then she dashed away her tears and was cheerful again. Oh, it doesn't matter. Good times are coming again for me too. If only my children grow up. Yes, if they only grow up. But as soon as the children were grown, a strange longing came over them. They didn't want to stay at home, but went away to a strange country. Their mother never got any help from them. A couple of her children were married before they went away, and they had left their children behind in the old home, and now these children followed the mistress in the cowshed, just as her own had done. They tended the cows and were fine, good folk, and in the evenings, when the mistress was so tired out that she could fall asleep in the middle of the milking, she would rouse herself again to renewed courage by thinking of them. "'Good times are coming for me, too,' said she, and shook off sleep. Oh, "'When once they are grown!' But when these children grew up, they went away to their parents in the strange land. No one came back. No one stayed at home. The old mistress was left alone on the farm. Probably she'd never asked them to remain with her. Thank you, Rodolina, that I would ask them to stay here with me, and when they can go out in the world and have things comfortable, she would say, as she stood in the stall with the old cow. Here in Smallland they have only poverty to look forward to. But when the last grandchild was gone, it was all up with the mistress. All at once she became bent and grey, and tottered as she walked, as if she no longer had the strength to move about. She stopped working. She did not care to look after the farm, but let everything go to rack and ruin. She didn't repair the houses, and she sold both the cows and the oxen. The only one that she kept was the old cow, who now talked with Thumbietot. Her she let live, because all the children had tended her. She could have taken maids and farmhands into her service, who would have helped her with the work, but she couldn't bear to see strangers around her, since her own had deserted her. Perhaps she was better satisfied to let the farm go to ruin, since none of her children were coming back to take it after she was gone. She did not mind that she herself became poor, because she didn't value that which was only hers, but she was troubled lest the children should find out how hard she had it. If only the children do not hear of this, if only the children do not hear of this, she sighed as she tottered through the cowhouse. The children wrote constantly and begged her to come out to them, but this she did not wish. She didn't want to see the land that had taken them from her. She was angry with it. It's foolish of me, perhaps, that I do not like that land which has been so good for them, she said, but I don't want to see it. She never thought of anything but the children, and of this, that they must needs have gone. When summer came, she led the cow out to graze in the big swamp. All day she would sit on the edge of the swamp, her hands in her lap, and on the way home she would say, You see, Rodlina, if there had been large, rich fields here, in place of these barren swamps, then there would have been no need for them to leave. She could become furious with the swamp, which spread out so big and did no good. She could sit and talk about how it was the swamp's fault that the children had left her. This last evening she had been more trembly and feeble than ever before. She could not even do the milking. She had leaned against the manger and talked about two strangers who had been to see her and had asked if they might buy the swamp. They wanted to drain it and sow and raise grain on it. This had made her both anxious and glad. Do you hear, Rodlina? she had said. Do you hear? They said that grain can grow on the swamp. Now I shall write to the children to come home. 
Now they'll not have to stay away any longer, for now they can get their bread here at home. It was this that she'd gone into the cabin to do. The boy heard no more of what the old cow said. He had opened the cowhouse door and gone across the yard and in to the dead, whom he had but lately been so afraid of. It was not so poor in the cabin as he had expected. It was well supplied with the sort of things one generally finds among those who have relatives in America. In a corner there was an American rocking chair. On the table before the window lay a brocaded plush cover. There was a pretty spread on the bed. On the walls, in carved wood frames, hung the photographs of children and grandchildren who had gone away. On the bureau stood high vases and a couple of candlesticks with thick spiral candles in them. The boy searched for a matchbox and lighted these candles, not because he needed more light than he already had, but because he thought that was one way to honour the dead. Then he went up to her, closed her eyes, folded her hands across her breast, and stroked back the thin grey hair from her face. He thought no more about being afraid of her. He was so deeply grieved because she had been forced to live out her old age in loneliness and longing. He at least, would watch over her dead body this night. He hunted up the psalm book and seated himself to read a couple of psalms in an undertone, but in the middle of the reading he paused because he had begun to think about his mother and father. Think that parents can long so for their children. This he had never known. Think that life can be as though it was over for them when the children are away. Think if those at home longed for him in the same way that this old peasant woman had longed. This thought made him happy, but he dared not believe in it. He had not been such a one that anybody could long for him. But what he had not been, perhaps, he could become. Round about him he saw the portraits of those who were away. They were big, strong men and women with earnest faces. There were brides in long veils and gentlemen in fine clothes, and there were children with wavy hair and pretty white dresses. And he thought that they all stared blindly into vacancy and did not want to see. Poor you, said the boy to the portrait. Your mother is dead. You cannot make reparation now because you went away from her. But my mother is living. Here... He paused and nodded and smiled to himself. My mother is living, said he. Both father and mother are living. Chapter 18 From Taburg to Husqvarna Friday, April 15th the boy sat awake nearly all night, but toward morning he fell asleep, and then he dreamed of his father and mother. He could hardly recognise them. They had both grown grey and had old and wrinkled faces. He asked how this had come about, and they answered that they had aged so because they had longed for him. He was both touched and astonished, for he had never believed but what they were glad to be rid of him. When the boy awoke, the morning was come, with fine, clear weather. First, he himself ate a bit of bread, which he found in the cabin. Then he gave morning feed to both geese and cow, and opened the cowhouse door so that the cow could go over to the nearest farm. When the cow came along all by herself, the neighbours would no doubt understand that something was wrong with her mistress. They would hurry over to the desolate farm to see how the old woman was getting along, and then they would find her dead body and bury it. The boy and the geese had barely raised themselves into the air when they caught a glimpse of a high mountain with almost perpendicular walls and an abrupt broken off top, and they understood that this must be Taburg. On the summit stood Akka with Ixi and Kaxi, Colmi and Nailja, Visi and Knussi and all six goslings, and waited for them. There was a rejoicing and a cackling and a fluttering and a calling which no one can describe. When they saw that the Goosey Gander and Dunfin had succeeded in finding Thumbietot. The woods grew pretty high up on Taburg's sides, but her highest peak was barren, and from there one could look out in all directions. 
If one gazed toward the east or south or west, then there was hardly anything to be seen but a poor highland with dark spruce trees, brown morasses, ice-clad lakes and bluish mountain ridges. The boy couldn't keep from thinking it was true that the one who had created this hadn't taken very great pains with his work, but had thrown it together in a hurry. But if one glanced to the north, it was altogether different. Here, it looked as if it had been worked out with the utmost care and affection. In this direction one saw only beautiful mountains, soft valleys and winding rivers, all the way to the big lake Vetern, which lay ice-free and transparently clear, and shone as if it wasn't filled with water, but with blue light. It was Vetern that made it so pretty to look toward the north, because it looked as though a blue stream had risen up from the lake and spread itself over land also. Groves and hills and roofs, and the spires of John Coping City, which shimmered along Vetton's shores, lay enveloped in pale blue which caressed the eye. If there were countries in heaven, they too must be blue like this, thought the boy, and imagined that he had got a faint idea of how it must look in paradise. Later in the day, when the geese continued their journey, they flew up toward the Blue Valley. They were in holiday humour shrieked and made such a racket that no one who had ears could help hearing them. This happened to be the first really fine spring day they had had in this section. Until now, the spring had done its work under rain and bluster, and now, when it had all of a sudden become fine weather, the people were filled with such a longing after summer warmth and green woods that they could hardly perform their tasks. And when the wild geese rode by, high above the ground, cheerful and free, there wasn't one who did not drop what he had in hand and glance at them. The first ones who saw the wild geese that day were miners on Taburg, who were digging ore at the mouth of the mine. When they heard them cackle, they paused in their drilling for ore, and one of them called to the birds, "'Where are you going? Where are you going?' The geese didn't understand what he said, but the boy leaned forward over the gooseback and answered for them, "'Where there is neither pig nor hammer, when the miners heard the words, they thought it was their own longing that made the goose cackle sound like human speech. "'Take us with you! Take us with you!' they cried. "'Not this year!' shrieked the boy. "'Not this year!' The wild geese followed Tabog River down toward Monk Lake, and all the while they made the same racket. Here, on the narrow land strip between Monk and Vetton Lakes, lay John Coping with its great factories. The wild geese rode first over Monkso paper mills. The noon rest hour was just over, and the big workmen were streaming down to the mill gate. When they heard the wild geese, they stopped a moment to listen to them. "'Where are you going? Where are you going?' called the workmen. The wild geese understood nothing of what they said, but the boy answered for them. "'There, where there are neither machines nor steam boxes!' When the workmen heard the answer, they believed it was their own longing that made the goose cackle sound like human speech. "'Take us along with you!' "'Not this year,' answered the boy. "'Not this year!' Next, the geese rode over the well-known match factory, which lies on the shores of Vetten, large as a fortress, and lifts its high chimneys towards the sky. Not a soul moved out in the yards, but in a large hall young working women sat and filled matchboxes. They had opened a window on account of the beautiful weather, and through it came the wild geese's call. The one who sat nearest the window leaned out with a matchbox in her hand and cried, "'Where are you going? Where are you going?' "'To that land where there is no need of either light or matches,' said the boy. The girl thought that what she had heard was only goose cackle. But since she thought she had distinguished a couple of words, she called out in answer, "'Take me along with you.' "'Not this year,' replied the boy. "'Not this year.' East of the factories rises John Coping on the most glorious spot that any city can occupy. The narrow Vetten has high, steep sand shores both on the eastern and western sides, but straight south the sand walls are broken down just as if to make room for a large gate through which one reaches the lake. And in the middle of the gate, with mountains to the left and mountains to the right, with Monk Lake behind it and Vetten in front of it, lies John Coping. The wild geese travelled forward over the long, narrow city and behaved themselves here just as they had done in the country. But in the city there was no one who answered them. 
It was not to be expected that city folk should stop out in the streets and call to the wild geese. The trip extended further along Vetton's shores, and after a little they came to Sana Sanitarium. Some of the patients had gone out on the veranda to enjoy the spring air, and in this way they heard the goose cackle. "'Where are you going?' asked one of them with such a feeble voice that he was scarcely heard. "'To that land where there's neither sorrow nor sickness,' answered the boy. "'Take us along with you,' said the sick ones. "'Not this year,' answered the boy. "'Not this year.' When they had travelled still farther on, they came to Husqvarna. It lay in a valley. The mountains around it were steep and beautifully formed. A river gushed along the heights in long and narrow falls. Big workshops and factories lay below the mountain walls, and scattered over the valley bottom were the working men's homes, encircled by little gardens. And in the centre of the valley lay the schoolhouse. Just as the wild geese came along, a bell rang and a crowd of schoolchildren marched out in line. They were so numerous that the whole schoolyard was filled with them. "'Where are you going? Where are you going?' the children shouted when they heard the wild geese. "'Where there are neither books nor lessons to be found,' answered the boy. Oh, "'Take us along!' shrieked the children. "'Not this year, but next!' cried the boy. N "'Not this year, but next!' Chapter 19 The Big Bird Lake Part 1 Jarrow the Wild Duck On the eastern shore of Vetten lies Mount Omberg. East of Omberg lies Dagmos. East of Dagmos lies Lake Tacern. Around the whole of Tacern spreads the big, even Ostagota plain. Tacern is a pretty large lake, and in olden times it must have been still larger. But then the people thought it covered entirely too much of the fertile plain, so they attempted to drain the water from it, that they might sow and reap on the lake bottom. But they did not succeed in laying waste the entire lake, which had evidently been their intention, and therefore it still hides a lot of land. Since the draining, the lake has become so shallow that hardly at any point is it more than a couple of metres deep and the shores have become marshy and muddy, and out in the lake little mud islets stick up above the water's surface. Now, there is one who loves to stand with his feet in the water, if he can just keep his body and head in the air, and that is the reed. And it cannot find a better place to grow upon than the long, shallow tack and shores and around the little mud islets. It thrives so well that it grows taller than a man's height, and so thick that it is almost impossible to push a boat through it. It forms a broad green enclosure around the whole lake, so that it is only accessible in a few places where the people have taken away the reeds. But if the reeds shut the people out, they give, in return, shelter and protection to many other things. In the reeds there are a lot of little dams and canals with green, still water, where duckweed and pondweed run to seed, and where gnat eggs and blackfish and worms are hatched out in uncountable masses. And all along the shores of these little dams and canals there are many well-concealed places where seabirds hatch their eggs and bring up their young without being disturbed either by enemies or food worries. An incredible number of birds live in the Tacken reeds, and more and more gather there every year, as it becomes known what a splendid abode it is. The first who settled there were the wild ducks, and they still live there by the thousands, but they no longer own the entire lake, for they have been obliged to share it with swans, grebes, coots, loons, fen ducks, and a lot of others. Tacken is certainly the largest and choicest bird lake in the whole country, and the birds may count themselves lucky as long as they own such a retreat. But it is uncertain just how long they will be in control of reeds and mud banks, for human beings cannot forget that the lake extends over a considerable portion of good and fertile soil, and every now and then the proposition to drain it comes up among them. And if these propositions were carried out, the many thousands of water birds would be forced to move from this quarter. At the time when Nils Holgersen travelled around with the wild geese, there lived at Tacken a wild duck named Jarrow. He was a young bird who had only lived one summer, one fall and a winter. Now it was his first spring. 
He had just returned from South Africa and had reached Tacken in such good season that the ice was still on the lake. One evening, when he and the other young wild ducks played at racing backward and forward over the lake, a hunter fired a couple of shots at them, and Jarrow was wounded in the breast. He thought he should die, but in order that the one who had shot him shouldn't get him into his power, he continued to fly as long as he possibly could. He didn't think whither he was directing his course, but only struggled to get far away. When his strength failed him so that he could not fly any farther, he was no longer on the lake. He had flown a bit inland, and now he sank down before the entrance to one of the big farms which lie along the shores of Tacker. A moment later, a young farmhand happened along. He saw Jarrow and came and lifted him up. But Jarrow, who asked for nothing but to be let die in peace, gathered his last powers and nipped the farmhand in the finger so he should let go of him. Jarrow didn't succeed in freeing himself. The encounter had this good in it at any rate. The farmhand noticed that the bird was alive. He carried him very gently into the cottage and showed him to the mistress of the house, a young woman with a kindly face. At once she took Jarrow from the farmhand, stroked him on the back and wiped away the blood which trickled down through the neck feathers. She looked him over very carefully, and when she saw how pretty he was with his dark green shining head, his white neck band, his brownish red back and his blue wing mirror, she must have thought that it was a pity for him to die. She promptly put a basket in order and tucked the bird into it. All the while, Jarrow fluttered and struggled to get loose, but when he understood that the people didn't intend to kill him, he settled down in the basket with a sense of pleasure. Now, it was evident how exhausted he was from pain and loss of blood. The mistress carried the basket across the floor to place it in the corner by the fireplace, but before she put it down, Jarrow was already fast asleep. In a little while, Jarrow was awakened by someone who nudged him gently. When he opened his eyes, he experienced such an awful shock that he almost lost his senses. And now he was lost, for there stood the one who was more dangerous than either human beings or birds of prey. It was no less a thing than Caesar himself, the long-haired dog who knows around him inquisitively. How pitifully scared had he not been last summer when he was still a little yellow-down duckling every time it had sounded over the reed stems. Caesar is coming! Caesar is coming! When he had seen the brown and white spotted dog with the teeth-filled jowls come wading through the reeds, he had believed that he beheld death itself. He had always hoped that he would never have to live through that moment when he should meet Caesar face to face. But... To his sorrow, he must have fallen down in the very yard where Caesar lived, for there he stood right over him. Who, who are you? he growled. How did you get into the house? Don't you belong down among the reed banks? It was with great difficulty that he gained the courage to answer. Don't be angry with me, Caesar, because I came into the house, said he. It isn't my fault. I have been wounded by the gunshot. It was the people themselves who laid me in the basket. Oh, so it's the folks themselves <laughs> that have placed you here, said Caesar. Uh, then it is surely their intention to cure you, although for my part I, I think it would be wiser for them to eat you up, uh, since you are in their power. But at any rate, uh, you are tabooed in the house. Uh, you needn't look so scared. Now, we're not down on Tacker. With that, Caesar laid himself to sleep in front of the blazing log fire. As soon as Jarrow understood that this terrible danger was past, extreme lassitude came over him, and he fell asleep anew. The next time Jarrow awoke, he saw that a dish with grain and water stood before him. He was still quite ill, but he felt hungry nevertheless, and began to eat. When the mistress saw that he ate, she came up and petted him, and looked pleased. After that, Jarrow fell asleep again. For several days he did nothing but eat and sleep. One morning Jarrow felt so well that he stepped from the basket and wandered along the floor, but he hadn't gone very far before he keeled over and lay there. And then came Caesar, opened his big jaws and grabbed him. Jarrow believed, of course, that the dog was going to bite him to death, but Caesar carried him back to the basket without harming him. Because of this, Jarrow acquired such a confidence in the dog Caesar that on his next walk in the cottage he went over to the dog and lay down beside him. Thereafter 
Caesar and he became good friends, and every day, for several hours, Jarrow lay and slept between Caesar's paws. But an even greater affection than he felt for Caesar did Jarrow feel toward his mistress. Of her he had not the least fear, but rubbed his head against her hand when she came and fed him. Whenever she went out of the cottage, he sighed with regret, and when she came back, he cried welcome to her in his own language. Jarrow forgot entirely how afraid he had been of both dogs and humans in other days. He thought now that they were gentle and kind, and he loved them. He wished that he were well so he could fly down to Tacken and tell the wild ducks that their enemies were not dangerous and that they need not fear them. He had observed that the human beings, as well as Caesar, had calm eyes, which it did one good to look into. The only one in the cottage whose glance he did not care to meet was Chlorina, the house cat. She did him no harm either, but he couldn't place any confidence in her. Then, too, she quarrelled with him constantly because he loved human beings. You think they protect you because they're fond of you, said Chlorina. You just wait till you are fat enough, and then they'll wring the neck off you. I know them, I do. Jarrow, like all birds, had a tender and affectionate heart, and he was unutterably distressed when he heard this. He couldn't imagine that his mistress would wish to wring his neck off him, nor could he believe any such thing of her son, the little boy who sat for hours beside his basket and babbled and chatted. He seemed to think that both of them had the same love for him that he had for them. One day, when Jarrow and Caesar lay on the usual spot before the fire, Chlorina sat on the hearth and began to tease the wild duck. I wonder, Jarrow, what you wild ducks will do next year when Tacan is drained and turned into grain fields, said Chlorina. What's that you say, Chlorina? cried Jarrow and jumped up, scared through and through. I always forget, Jarrow, that you do not understand human speech, like Caesar and myself, answered the cat. Or else you surely would have heard how the men who were here in the cottage yesterday said that all the water was going to be drained from Tacan, and that next year the lake bottom would be as dry as a house floor. And now I wonder where you wild ducks will go. When Jarrow heard this talk, he was so furious that he hissed like a snake. "'You are just as mean as a common coat!' he screamed at Chlorina. "'You only want to incite me against human beings. "'I don't believe they want to do anything of the sort. "'They must know that Tacken is the wild duck's property. "'Why should they make so many birds homeless and unhappy? "'You certainly hit upon all this to scare me. "'I hope that you may be torn in pieces by Gorgo the eagle. "'I hope that my mistress will chop off your whiskers.' But Jarrow couldn't shut Chlorina up with this outburst. So you think I'm lying, said she. Ask Caesar then. He was also in the house last night. Caesar never lies. Caesar, said Jarrow, you understand human speech much better than Chlorina. Say she hasn't heard right. Think how it would be if the people drained tack and, and changed the lake bottom into fields. Then there would be no more pondweed or duck food for the grown wild ducks, and no blackfish or worms or lat eggs for the ducklings. Then the reed banks would disappear, where now the ducklings can steal themselves until they're able to fly. All ducks will be compelled to move away from here and seek another home. Uh, but where shall they find a retreat like Tacken? Caesar, say that Chlorine has not heard all right. It was extraordinary to watch Caesar's behaviour during this conversation. He had been wide awake the whole time before, but now... When Jarrow turned to him, he panted, laid his long nose on his forepaws, and was sound asleep within the wink of an eyelid. The cat looked down at Caesar with a knowing smile. "'I believe that Caesar doesn't care to answer you,' she said to Jarrow. "'It is with him as with all dogs. They will never acknowledge that humans can do any wrong. But you can rely upon my word at any rate. I shall tell you why they wish to train the lake just now. As long as you wild ducks still had the power on Tacan, they did not wish to train it, for at least they got some good out of you. But now greeps and coots and other birds who are no good as food have infested it nearly all the reed banks, and people don't think they need let the lake remain on their account. Jarrow didn't trouble himself to answer Chlorina, but raised his head and shouted in Caesar's ear, Caesar, you know that on the tuck and there's still so many ducks left they fill the air like clouds. Say it isn't true that human beings intend to make all of these homeless. Then Caesar sprang up with such a sudden outburst at Chlorina 
that she had to save herself by jumping up on a shelf. I'll teach you to keep quiet when I want to sleep, bawled Caesar. Of course, I know that there's some talk about draining the lake this year, but there's been talk of this many times before, without anything coming of it. And that draining business is a matter in which I take no stock, whatever. For how would it go with the game if tack and were laid waste? You're a donkey to gloat over a thing like that. What would you and I have to amuse ourselves with when there are no more birds on Tacan? <laughs> Part 2. The Decoy Duck Sunday, April 17th A couple of days later, Jarrow was so well that he could fly all about the house. Then he was petted a good deal by the mistress, and the little boy ran out in the yard and plucked the first grass blades for him, which had sprung up. When the mistress caressed him, Jarrow thought that, although he was now so strong that he could fly down to Takan at any time, he shouldn't care to be separated from the human beings. He had no objection to remaining with them all his life. But early one morning, the mistress placed a halter or noose over Jarrow, which prevented him from using his wings, and then she turned him over to the farmhand who had found him in the yard. The farmhand poked him under his arm and went down to Takan with him. The ice had melted away while Jarrow had been ill. The old, dry fall leaves still stood along the shores and islets, but all the water growths had begun to take root down in the deep, and the green stems had already reached the surface. And now nearly all the migratory birds were at home. The curlews, hooked bills, peeped out from the reeds. The grebes glided about with new feather collars around the neck, and the jacksnipes were gathering straws for their nests. The farmhand got into a scow, laid Jarrow in the bottom of the boat, and began to pole himself out on the lake. And Jarrow, who had now accustomed himself to expect only good of human beings, said to Caesar, who was also in the party, that he was very grateful toward the farmhand for taking him out on the lake. But there was no need to keep him so closely guarded, for he did not intend to fly away. To this Caesar made no reply. He was very close-mouthed that morning. The only thing which struck Jarrow as being a bit peculiar was that the farmhand had taken his gun along. He couldn't believe that any of the good folk in the cottage would want to shoot birds. And beside, Caesar had told him that the people didn't hunt at this time of year. It is prohibited time, he had said, although this doesn't concern me, of course. The farmhand went over to one of the little reed-enclosed mud islets, and there he stepped from the boat, gathered some old reeds into a pile, and lay down behind it. And Jarrow was permitted to wander around on the ground, with the halter over his wings, and tethered to the boat with a long string. Suddenly Jarrow caught sight of some young ducks and drakes, in whose company he'd formerly raced backward and forward over the lake. They were a long way off, but Jarrow called to them with a couple of loud shouts, and they responded, and a large and beautiful flock approached. Before they got there, Jarrow began to tell them about his marvellous rescue and of the kindness of human beings. Just then, two shots sounded behind him. Three ducks sank down in the reeds, lifeless, and Caesar bounced out and captured them. Then Jarrow understood. The human beings had only saved him that they might use him as a decoy duck, and they had also succeeded. Three ducks had died on his account. He thought he should die of shame. He thought that even his friend Caesar looked contemptuously at him, and when they came home to the cottage, he didn't dare lie down and sleep beside the dog. The next morning, Jarrow was again taken out on the shallows. This time, too, he saw some ducks, but when he observed that they flew toward him, he called to them, Sway! Sway! Be careful! Fly in another direction! There's a hunter hidden behind the reed pile! I'm only a decoy bird! and he actually succeeded in preventing them from coming within shooting distance. Jarrow had scarcely had time to taste of a grass blade. So busy was he in keeping watch, he called out his warning as soon as a bird drew nigh. He even warned the grebes, although he detested them because they crowded the ducks out of their best hiding places. But he did not wish that any bird should meet with misfortune on his account, and thanks to Jarrow's vigilance, the farmhand had to go home without firing off a single shot. Despite this fact, Caesar looked less displeased than on the previous day, and when evening came he took Jarrow in his mouth, carried him over to the fireplace, 
and let him sleep between his forepaws. Nevertheless, Jarrow was no longer contented in the cottage, but was grievously unhappy. His heart suffered at the thought that humans never had loved him. And when the mistress or the little boy came forward to caress him, he stuck his bill under his wing and pretended that he slept. For several days, Jarrow continued his distressful watch service, and already he was known all over Tacken. Then it happened. One morning, while he called as usual, "'Have you here, birds? Don't come near me, I'm only a decoy duck!' that a grebe nest came floating toward the shallows where he was tied. This was nothing especially remarkable. It was a nest from the year before, and since grebe nests are built in such a way that they can move on water like boats, it often happens that they drift out toward the lake. Still, Jarrow stood there and stared at the nest, because it came so straight toward the islet that it looked as though someone had steered its course over the water. As the nest came nearer, Jarrow saw that a little human being, the tiniest he'd ever seen, sat in the nest and rowed it forward with a pair of sticks. And this little human called to him, "'Go as near the water as you can, Jarrow, and be ready to fly. You shall soon be freed.' A few seconds later, the grebe nest lay near land, but the little oarsman did not leave it, but he huddled up between branches and straw. Jarrow, too, held himself almost immovable. He was actually paralysed with fear lest the rescuer should be discovered. The next thing which occurred was that a flock of wild geese came along. Then Jarrow woke up to business and warned them with loud shrieks, but in spite of this they flew backward and forward over the shallows several times. They held themselves so high that they were beyond shooting distance. Still, the farmhand let himself be tempted to fire a couple of shots at them. These shots were hardly fired before the little creature ran up on land, drew a tiny knife from its sheath, and, with a couple of quick strokes, cut loose Jarrow's halter. "'Now fly away, Jarrow, before the man has time to load again!' cried he, while he himself ran down to the grebe nest and pulled away from the shore. The hunter had his gaze fixed upon the geese, and hadn't observed that Jarrow had been freed. But Caesar had followed more carefully that which happened, and just as Jarrow raised his wings, he dashed forward and grabbed him by the neck. Jarrow cried pitifully, and the boy who had freed him said quietly to Caesar, If you are just as honourable as you look, surely you cannot wish to force a good bird to sit here and entice others into trouble. When Caesar heard these words, he grinned viciously with his upper lip, but the next second he dropped Jarrow. Fly, Jarrow, said he. You are certainly too good to be a decoy duck. It wasn't for this that I wanted to keep you here, but because it will be lonely in the cottage without you. Part 3. The Lowering of the Lake Wednesday, April 20th It was indeed very lonely in the cottage without Jarrow. The dog and the cat found the time long when they didn't have him to wrangle over, and the housewife missed the glad quacking which he had indulged in every time she entered the house. But the one who longed most for Jarrow was the little boy, Per Ola. He was but three years old and the only child, and in all his life he had never had a playmate like Jarrow. When he heard that Jarrow had gone back to Tacon and the wild ducks, he couldn't be satisfied with this, but thought constantly of how he should get him back again. Per Ola had talked a good deal with Jarrow while he lay still in his basket, and he was certain that the duck understood him. He begged his mother to take him down to the lake that he might find Jarrow and persuade him to come back to them. Mother wouldn't listen to this, but the little wad didn't give up his plan on that account. The day after Jarrow had disappeared, Per Ola was running about in the yard. He played by himself as usual, but Caesar lay on the stoop, and when mother let the boy out, she said, Take care of Paola, Caesar. Now, if all had been as usual, Caesar would also have obeyed the command, and the boy would have been so well guarded that he couldn't have run the least risk. But Caesar was not like himself these days. He knew that the farmers who lived along Tacon had held frequent conferences about the lowering of the lake, and that they had almost settled the matter. The ducks must leave, and Caesar should never more behold a glorious chase. He was so preoccupied with thoughts of this misfortune that he did not remember to watch over Perola. 
and the little one has scarcely been alone in the yard a minute before he realised that now the right moment was come to go down to Tacon and talk with Jarrow. He opened a gate and wandered down towards the lake, on the narrow path which ran along the banks. As long as he could be seen from the house, he walked slowly, but afterward he increased his pace. He was very much afraid that Mother or someone else should call to him and that he couldn't go. He didn't wish to do anything naughty, only to persuade Jarrow to come home, but he felt that those at home would not have approved of the undertaking. When Per Ola came down to the lake shore, he called Jarrow several times, and thereupon he stood for a long time and waited, but no Jarrow appeared. He saw several birds that resembled the wild duck, but they flew by without noticing him, and he could understand that none among them was the right one. When Jarrow didn't come to him, the little boy thought that it would be easier to find him if he went out on the lake. There were several good craft lying along the shore, but they were tied. The only one that lay loose and at liberty was an old leaky scow, which was so unfit that no one thought of using it. But Per Ola scrambled up in it, without caring that the whole bottom was filled with water. He had not strength enough to use the oars, but instead he seated himself to swing and rock in the scow. Certainly no grown person would have succeeded in moving a scow out on Tacon in that manner. But when the tide is high and ill luck to the fore, little children have a marvellous faculty for getting out to sea. Per Ola was soon riding around on Tacon and calling for Jarrow. When the old scow was rocked like this, out to sea, its cracks opened wider and wider, and the water actually streamed into it. Paola didn't pay the slightest attention to this. He sat upon the little bench in front, and called to every bird he saw, and wondered why Jarrow didn't appear. At last Jarrow caught sight of Paola. He heard that someone called him by the name which he had been born among human beings, and he understood that the boy had gone out on Takan to search for him. Jarrow was unspeakably happy to find that one of the humans really loved him. He shot down toward Paola like an arrow, seated himself beside him and let him caress him. They were both very happy to see each other again. But suddenly Jarrow noticed the condition of the scow. It was half filled with water and was almost ready to sink. Jarrow tried to tell Paola that he, who could neither fly nor swim, must try to get upon land, but Paola didn't understand him. Then Jarrow did not waste an instant, but hurried away to get help. Jarrow came back in a little while, and he carried on his back a tiny thing, who was much smaller than Paola himself. If he hadn't been able to talk and move, the boy would have believed that it was a doll. Instantly, the little one ordered Paola to pick up a long, slender pole that lay in the bottom of the scow and try to pole it toward one of the reed islands. Paola obeyed him and he and the tiny creature together steered the scow. With a couple of strokes, they were on a little reed-encircled island, and now Paola was told that he must step on land. And just the very moment that Paola set foot on land, the scow was filled with water and sank to the bottom. When Paola saw this, he was sure that father and mother would be very angry with him. He would have started to cry if he hadn't found something else to think about soon, namely a flock of big grey birds who lighted on the island. The little midget took him up to them and told him their names and what they said, and this was so funny that Per Ola forgot everything else. Meanwhile, the folk on the farm had discovered that the boy had disappeared and had started to search for him. They searched the outhouses, looked in the well, hunted through the cellar. Then they went out into the highways and bypaths, wandered to the neighbouring farm to find out if he'd strayed over there, and searched for him also down by Tacon. But no matter how much they sought, they did not find him. Caesar the dog understood very well that the farmer folk were looking for Paola, but he did nothing to lead them on the right track. Instead, he lay still as though the matter didn't concern him. Later in the day, Paola's footprints were discovered down by the boat landing, and then came the thought that the old leaky scow was no longer on the strand. Then one began to understand how the whole affair had come about. The farmer and his helpers immediately took out the boats and went in search of the boy. They rowed around on Tacken until way late in the evening, without seeing the least shadow of him. They couldn't help believing that the old scow had gone down and that the little one lay dead 
on the lake bottom. In the evening, Paola's mother hunted around on the strand. Everyone else was convinced that the boy was drowned, but she could not bring herself to believe this. She searched all the while. She searched between reeds and bulrushes, tramped and tramped on the muddy shore, never thinking of how deep her foot sank and how wet she'd become. She was unspeakably desperate. Her heart ached in her breast. She did not weep, but wrung her hands and called for her child in loud, piercing tones. Round about her she had swans and ducks and curlews, shrieks. She thought that they followed her and moaned and wailed, they too. Surely they too must be in trouble since they moan so, thought she. Then she remembered these were only birds that she heard complain. They surely had no worries. It was strange that they did not quiet down after sunset, but she heard all these uncountable bird throngs which lived along Tacken sending forth cry upon cry. Several of them followed her wherever she went. Others came rustling past on light wings. All the air was filled with moans and lamentations. But the anguish which she herself was suffering opened her heart. She thought that she was not as far removed from all other living creatures as people usually think. She understood much better than ever before how birds fared. They had their constant worries for home and children. They as she there was surely not such a great difference between them and her, as she had heretofore believed. Then she happened to think that it was as good as settled that these thousands of swans and ducks and loons would lose their homes here by Tacken. It will be very hard for them, she thought. Where shall they bring up their children now? She stood still and mused on this. It appeared to be an excellent and agreeable accomplishment to change a lake into fields and meadows, but let it be some other lake than Tacon, some other lake which was not the home of so many thousand creatures. She remembered how, on the following day, the proposition to lower the lake was to be decided, and she wondered if this was why her little son had been lost just today. Was it God's meaning that sorrow should come and open her heart just today, before it was too late to avert the cruel act? She walked rapidly up to the house and began to talk with her husband about this. She spoke of the lake and of the birds, and said that she believed it was God's judgment on them both, and she soon found that he was of the same opinion. They already owned a large place, but if the lake draining was carried into effect, such a goodly portion of the lake bottom would fall to their share that their property would be nearly doubled. For this reason, they had been more eager for the undertaking than any of the other shore owners. The others had been worried about expenses, and anxious lest the draining should not prove any more successful this time than it was the last. Paola's father knew in his heart that it was he who had influenced them to undertake the work. He had exercised all his eloquence so that he might leave to his son a farm as large again as his father had left to him. He stood and pondered if God's hand was back of the fact that Tacken had taken his son from him on the day before he was to draw up the contract to lay it waste. The wife didn't have to say many words to him before he answered, it may be that God does not want us to interfere with his order. I'll talk with the others about this tomorrow, and I think we'll conclude that all may remain as it is. While the farmer folk were talking this over, Caesar lay before the fire. He raised his head and listened very attentively. When he thought that he was sure of the outcome, he walked up to the mistress, took her by the skirt, and led her to the door. But Caesar said she, and wanted to break loose. "'Do you know where Paola is?' she exclaimed. Caesar barked joyfully and threw himself against the door. She opened it, and Caesar dashed down toward Tacken. The mistress was so positive he knew where Paola was that she rushed after him, and no sooner had they reached the shore than they heard a child's cry out on the lake. Paola had had the best day of his life in company with Thumbitot and the birds, but now he had begun to cry because he was hungry and afraid of the darkness, and he was glad when father and mother and Caesar came for him. 
Chapter 20 Ulvasa Lady The Prophecy Friday, April 22nd One night, when the boy lay and slept on an island in Tekern, he was awakened by oarstrokes. He'd hardly got his eyes open before there fell such a dazzling light on them that he began to blink. At first he couldn't make out what it was that shone so brightly out here on the lake, but he soon saw that a scow with a big burning torch stuck up on a spike aft lay near the edge of the reeds. The red flame from the torch was clearly reflected in the night-dark lake, and the brilliant light must have lured the fish, for round about the flame, in the deep, a mass of dark specks were seen that moved continually and changed places. There were two old men in the scow, one sat at the oars, and the other stood on a bench in the stern, and held in his hand a short spear, which was coarsely barbed. The one who rowed was apparently a poor fisherman. He was small, dried up, and weather-beaten, and wore a thin, threadbare coat. One could see that he was so used to being out in all sorts of weather that he didn't mind the cold. The other was well-fed and well-dressed, and looked like a prosperous and self-complacent farmer. "'Now stop,' said the farmer, when they were opposite the island where the boy lay. At the same time, he plunged the spear into the water. When he drew it out again, a long fine eel came with it. "'Look at that,' said he, as he released the eel from the spear. "'That was one who was worth while. Now I think we have so many that we can turn back.' His comrade did not lift the oars, but sat and looked around. "'It's lovely out here on the lake tonight,' said he. And so it was. It was absolutely still, so that the entire water surface lay in undisturbed rest, with the exception of the streak where the boat had gone forward. This lay like a path of gold, and shimmered in the firelight. The sky was clear and dark blue, and thickly studded with stars. The shores were hidden by the reed islands except towards the west, and there Mount Omberg loomed up high and dark, and much more impressive than usual and cut away a big three-cornered piece of the vaulted heavens. The other one turned his head to get the light out of his eyes and looked about him. "'Yes, it is lovely here in Ostergillen, said he. "'Still, the best thing about the province is not its beauty.' "'Then what is it that's best?' asked the oarsman. "'That it has always been a respected and honoured province. "'That may be true enough. "'And then this, that, no one knows it will always continue to be so.' "'But how in the world can anyone know this?' said the one who sat at the oars. The farmer straightened up where he stood and braced himself with the spear. "'There's an old story which has been handed down from father to son in my family, and in it one learns what will happen in Ostergotland. "'Then you may as well tell it to me,' said the oarsman. "'We do not tell it to anyone and everyone, but I do not wish to keep it a secret from an old comrade.' "'At Ulvasa, here in Ostergotland,' he continued, and one could tell by the tone of his voice that he talked to something which he had heard from others and knew by heart. "'Many, many years ago there lived a lady who had the gift of looking into the future and telling people what was going to happen to them, just as certainly and accurately as though it had already occurred. For this she became widely noted, and it is easy to understand that people would come to her, both from far and near, to find out what they were going to pass through, of good or evil. One day, when Ulvasa Lady sat in her hall and spun, as was customary in former days, a poor peasant came into the room and seated himself on the bench near the door. "'I wonder what you're sitting and thinking about, dear lady,' said the peasant, after a while." "'I am sitting and thinking about high and holy things,' answered she. "'Then it is not fitting, perhaps, that I ask you about something which weighs on my heart,' said the peasant. "'It is probably nothing else that weighs on your heart than that you may reap grain on your field, but I am accustomed to receive communications from the Emperor about how it will go with his crown, and from the Pope about how it will go with his keys. Such things cannot be easy to answer,' said the peasant. "'I have also heard that no one seems to go from here "'without being dissatisfied with what he has heard.' "'When the peasant said this, he saw that Ulvasa lady bit her lip "'and moved higher up on the bench. "'So this is what you have heard about me,' said she. "'Then you may as well tempt fortune by asking me about the thing you wish to know, "'and you shall see if I can answer so that you will be satisfied.' 
After this, the peasant did not hesitate to state his errand. He said that he had come to ask how it would go with Ostergotland in the future. There was nothing which was so dear to him as his native province, and he felt that he should be happy until his dying day if he could get a satisfactory reply to his query. "'Oh, is that all you wish to know?' said the wise lady. "'Then I think that you will be content, for here where I now sit, I can tell you that it will be like this with Ostergotland. It will always have something to boast of ahead of other provinces.' "'Yes, that was a good answer, dear lady,' said the peasant. "'And now I would be entirely at peace if I could only comprehend how such a thing should be possible.' "'Why should it not be possible?' said Ulvasa lady. "'Don't you know that Ostergotland is already renowned? "'Or think you there is any place in Sweden that can boast of owning, "'at the same time, two cloisters as the ones in Alvestra and Ritter, "'and such a beautiful cathedral as the one in Linkoping?' "'That may be so,' said the peasant. "'But I'm an old man, and I know that people's minds are changeable. "'I fear there will come a time when they won't want to give us any glory, "'either for Alvestra or Ritter, or for the cathedral.' Uh, "'Herein you may be right,' said Ulvasa lady. "'But you need not doubt prophecy on that account. "'I shall now build up a new cloister on Vadstena, "'and that will become the most celebrated in the north.' Thither both the high and the lowly shall make pilgrimages, and all shall sing the praises of the province because it has such a holy place within its confines. Uh, the peasant replied that he was right glad to know this, but he also knew, of course, that everything was perishable, and he wondered much what would give distinction to the province if Vadstena Cloister should once fall into disrepute. "'You are not easy to satisfy,' said Ulvasa lady. "'But surely I can see so far ahead that I can tell you "'before that Stina cloister shall have lost its splendour. "'There will be a castle erected close by "'which will be the most magnificent of its period. "'Kings and dukes will be guests there, "'and it shall be accounted an honour to the whole province "'that it owns such an ornament.' "'This I am glad to hear,' said the peasant. "'But I'm an old man, and I know how it generally turns out with this world's glories. "'And if the castle goes to ruin, I wonder much what there will be "'that can attract the people's attention to this province. "'It's not a little that you want to know,' said Ulvasa lady. "'But certainly I can look far enough into the future "'to see that there will be life and movement in the forests around Finspang. "'I see how cabins and smithies arise there, "'and I believe that the whole province shall be renowned "'because iron will be moulded within its confines.' "'The peasant didn't deny that he was delighted to hear this, "'but... If it should go so badly that even Finspang's foundry went down in importance, then it would hardly be possible that any new thing could arise of which Ostergotland might boast. "'You are not easy to please,' said Ulvasa lady. "'But I can see so far into the future that I mark how along the lake shores great manors, large as castles, are built by gentlemen who have carried on wars in foreign lands. I believe that the manors will bring the province just as much honour as anything else I've mentioned. Uh, but if there comes a time when no one lords the great manners, insisted the peasant, you need not be uneasy at all events, said Ulvasa lady. I see how well springs bubble on Medivi meadows. By Vata's shores, I believe that the wells at Medevi will bring the land as much praise as you desire. "'That is a mighty good thing to know,' said the peasant. "'But if there comes a time when people will seek their health at other springs, "'you must not give yourself any anxiety on that account,' answered Ulvasa lady. "'I see how people dig and labour from Matala to Mem. "'They dig a canal right through the country, "'and then Ostergotland's praise is again on everyone's lips.' "'But nevertheless, the peasant looks distraught.' "'I see that the rapids in Motala stream begin to draw wheels,' said Ulvasa lady, "'and now two bright red spots came to her cheeks, for she began to be impatient. "'I hear hammers resound in Motala, and looms clatter in nor coping.' "'Yes, that's good to know,' said the peasant. "'But everything is perishable, and I'm afraid that even this can be forgotten and go into oblivion.' When the peasant was not satisfied even now, there was an end to the lady's patience. 
"'You say that everything is perishable,' said she. "'But now I shall still name something which will always be like itself, "'and that is that such arrogant and pig-headed peasants as you "'will always be found in this province until the end of time.' "'Hardly had all that lady said this before the peasant rose, happy and satisfied, "'and thanked her for a good answer. "'Now at least he was satisfied,' he said. "'Verily, I understand now how you look at it.' Then said Uvasa lady, uh, Well, I look at it in this way, dear lady, said the peasant, uh, that everything which kings and priests and noblemen and merchants build and accomplish can only endure for a few years. Uh, but when you tell me that in Ostergotland there will always be peasants who are honour-loving and persevering, then I know also that it will be able to keep its ancient glory. For it is only those who go bent under the eternal labour with the soil who can hold this land in good repute and honour from one time to another.'